Prologue of Walking Stick Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. Prologue on Carrying a Cane some people without doubt are born with a deep instinct for carrying a cane some consciously acquire the habit of carrying a cane and some find themselves in a position where the matter of carrying a cane is thrust upon them canes are carried in all parts of the world and have been carried or that which was the forefather of them has been carried since human history began indeed a very fair account of mankind might be made by writing the story of its canes and nothing that would readily occur to mind would more eloquently express a civilization than its evident attitude toward canes perhaps nothing can more subtly convey the psychology of a man than his feeling about a cane the prehistoric ape we are justified in assuming struggled upright upon a cane the cane so to speak with which primitive man wooed his bride defended his life liberty and pursuit of happiness and brought down his food was like all canes which are in good taste admirably chosen for the occasion the spear the stave the pilgrim staff the sword the sceptre always has the cane-carrying animal borne something in his hand and down the long vista of the past the cane in its various manifestations has ever been the mark of strength and so of dignity thus as a man originally became a gentleman or a king by force of valor the cane in its evolution has ever been the symbol of a superior caste a man cannot do manual labor carrying a cane and it would be a moral impossibility for one of servile state a butler for instance or a ticket chopper to present himself in the role of his occupation ornamented with a cane one held in custody would not be permitted to appear before the magistrate flaunting a cane until the stigma which attaches to his position may be erased he would be shorn of his mark of nobility the cane canes are now carried mostly by the very youthful and the very aged the powerful the distinguished the patrician the self-important and those who fancy to exalt themselves some to whom this privilege is denied during the week by their fear of adverse public opinion carry canes only on sundays and holidays by this it is shown that on these days they are their own masters custom as to carrying canes varies widely in different parts of the world but it may be taken as a general maxim that the farther west you go the less you see of canes the instinct for carrying a cane is more natural in old civilizations where the tradition is of ancient growth than in newer ones where frequently a cane is regarded as the sign of an effete character as we have been saying canes we all feel have an affinity with the idea of an aristocracy if you do not admit that the idea of an aristocracy is a good one then doubtless you are down on canes it is interesting to observe that canes have flourished at all especially chivalrous periods and in all especially chivalrous communities no illustrator would portray a young planter of the old south without his cane and that fragrant old-school figure a southern colonel without his cane is inconceivable canes connote more or less leisure they convey a subtle insinuation of some degree of culture they always are a familiar article of a gentleman's dress in warm climates the cane quite strictly speaking in fact has its origin in warm countries for properly speaking the word cane should be restricted in its application to a peculiar class of palms known as rattans including under the closely allied genera calamus and demongerops of which there are a large number of species these plants the encyclopedia tells us are found widely extended throughout the islands of the indian archipelago the malay peninsula china india and ceylon and examples have also been found in australia and africa 
the learned rumphius describes them under the name of palmajunci as inhabitants of dense forests into which the rays of the sun scarce can penetrate where they form spiny bushes obstructing the passage through the jungle they rise to the top of the tallest trees and fall again so as to resemble a great length of cable adorned however with the most beautiful leaves pinnated or terminating in graceful tendrils the plants creep or trail along to an enormous length sometimes it is said reaching five hundred feet two examples of calamus verus measuring respectively two hundred and seventy feet and two hundred and thirty feet were exhibited in the paris exhibition of eighteen fifty five the well-known malacca canes are obtained from calamus scipionum the stems of which are much stouter than is the case with the average species of calamus doubtless to the vulgar a malacca cane is merely a malacca cane there are however in this interesting world choice spirits who make a cult of malacca canes just as some dog fanciers are devotees of the airedale terrier such as these know that inferior malacca canes are as the term in the cane trade is shaved that is not being of the circumference most coveted but too thick they have been whittled down in bulk a prime malacca cane is of course a natural stem and it is a nice point to have a slight irregularity in its symmetry as evidence of this the delicious spotting of a malacca cane is due to the action of the sun upon it in drying as the stems are dried in sheaves those most richly splotched are the ones that have been at the outside of the bundle what new strength to meet life's troubles what electric expansion of soul come to the initiated upon the feel of the vertebra of his malacca cane the name of cane is also applied to many plants besides the calamus which are possessed of long slender reed-like stalks or stems as for instance the sugar cane or the reed cane from the use as walking sticks to which many of these plants have been applied the name cane has been given generally to sticks irrespective of the source from which they are derived our distinguished grandfathers carried canes frequently handsome gold-headed ones especially if they were ministers bishops or presiding elders when in those mellow times it was the custom for a congregation to present its minister with a gold-headed cane duly inscribed our fathers of some consequence carried canes of a gentlemanly pattern often ones with ivory handles though in the days when those of us now sometime grown were small one had to have arrived at the dignity of at least middle age before it was seemly for one to carry a cane in england however and particularly at eton it has long been a common practice for small aristocrats to affect canes the dandies fops exquisites and beaux of picturesque and courtly ages were of course very partial to canes and sometimes wore them attached to the wrist by a thong it has been the custom of the surgeon of the king of england to carry a gold-headed cane this cane has been handed down to the various incumbents of this office since the days of dr john radcliffe who was the first holder of the cane it has been used for two hundred years or more by the greatest physicians and surgeons in the world who succeed to it the gold-headed cane was adorned by a crossbar at the top instead of a knob the fact is explained by monk in that radcliffe the first owner was a rule unto himself and possibly preferred this device as a mark of distinction beyond the knob used by physicians in general men of genius now and then have found in their choice of cane an opportunity for the play of their eccentricity such a celebrated cane being the tall wand of whistler among the relics of great men preserved in museums for the inspiration of the people canes generally are to be found we have all looked upon the cane of george washington at mount vernon and the walking stick of carlisle at cheney walk and is each not eloquent of the man who cherished it freak canes are displayed here and there by persons of a pleasantly bizarre turn of mind canes encased in the hide of an elephant's tail canes that have been intricately carven by some robinson crusoe or canes of various other such species of curiosity 
there is a veteran new york journalist who will be glad to show any student of canes one which he prizes highly that was made from the limb of a tree upon which a friend of his was hanged in our age of handy inventions a type of cane is manufactured in combination with an umbrella canes are among the useful properties of the theatre he would be a decidedly incomplete villain who did not carry a cane imaginative literature is rich in canes who ever heard of a fairy godmother without a cane who with any feeling for terror has not been startled by the tap tap of the cane of old pew in treasure island there is an awe and a pathos in canes too for they are the light to blind men and the romance of canes is further illustrated in this they with rags and the wallet have been among the traditional accoutrements of beggars the insignia of the dignity springing from the very depth of desolation as to be naked is to be so much nearer to the being a man than to go in livery j m barry was so fond of an anecdote of a cane that he employed it several times in his earlier fiction this was the story of a young man who had a cane with a loose knob which in society he would slyly shake so that it tumbled off when he would exclaim yes that cane is like myself it always loses its head in the presence of ladies canes have figured prominently in humour the irishman's shillelagh was for years a conspicuous feature of the comic press and there will instantly come to every one's mind that immortal passage in tristram shandy trim is discoursing upon life and death are we not here now continued the corporal striking the end of his stick perpendicularly upon the floor so as to give an idea of health and stability and are we not dropping his hat upon the ground gone in a moment twas infinitely striking susanna burst into a flood of tears canes are not absent from poetry into your ears already has come the refrain of the last leaf and totters o'er the ground with his cane and doubtless floods of instances of canes that the world will not willingly let die will occur to one upon a moment's reflection canes are inseparable from art all artists carry them and the poorer the artist the more attached he is to his cane canes are indispensable to the simple vanity of the bohemian one of the most memorable drawings of steinlen depicts the quaint soul of a child of the latin quarter an elderly bohemian very much frayed advances wreathed in the sunshine of his boutonniere and cane canes are invariably an accompaniment of learning sylvester bonard would of course not be without his cane nor would any other true bookworm as may be seen any day in the reading-room of the british museum and of the new york public library it is indeed indisputable that canes more than any other article of dress are peculiarly related to the mind there is an old bookseller on fourth avenue whose clothes when he dies like the boots of michelangelo probably will require to be pried loose from him so incessantly has he worn them within the memory of man none has ever looked upon him in the open air without his cane and is not that emblem of omniscience and authority the schoolmaster's ferrule directly of the cane family so large has the cane loomed in the matter of chastisement that the word cane has become a verb to cane there was in the days before the war a military man friend of mine a military man of the old school in whom could be seen shining like a flame a man's great love of a cane he had lived a portion of his life in south america and he used to promenade every pleasant afternoon up and down the avenue swinging a sharply pointed steel ferruled swagger stick what's the use of carrying that ridiculous thing around town someone said to him one day that he rumbled in reply he was one of the roarers among men why that's to stab scorpions with they buried him i heard in flanders on his breast i hope his cane 
when a red cross platoon says a news dispatch of the other day was advancing to the aid of scores of wounded men surgeon william j mccracken of the british medical corps ordered all to take cover and himself advanced through the enemy's fire bearing a red cross flag on his walking stick indeed the great war is one of the most thrilling momentous and colorful chapters in the history of canes the officers picked up their canes says the newspaper and so forth and so forth captain a radcliffe dugmore in a spirited drawing of the battle of the somme shows an officer leading a charge waving a light cane as an emblem of rank the cane among our allies has apparently supplanted the sword something of the dapper cocky look of our brothers-in-arms on our streets undoubtedly is due to their canes one never sees a british french or italian officer in the rotogravure sections without his cane we should be as startled to see general haig or the prince of wales without a cane as without a leg with our own soldiers the cane does not seem to be so much the thing at least over here i have a friend however who went away a private with a rifle over his shoulder the other day came news from him that he had become a sergeant and perhaps as proof of this a photograph of him wearing a tin hat and with a cane in his hand it is also to be observed now and then that a lady in uniformed service appears to regard it as an added military touch to swing a cane women as well as men play their part in the colorful history of the cane the shepherdess's crook might be regarded as the precursor of canes for ladies in merry england in the age when the maypole flourished it was fashionable we know from pictures for comely misses and grand dames to sport tall canes mounted with silver or gold and knotted with a bow of ribbon the dowager duchess of romantic story has always appeared leaning upon her cane do not we so see the rich aunt of hodden crawley and mr walpole's duchess of rex certainly was supported in her domination of the old order of things by a cane the historic old crones of our own early days smoked a clay or corncob pipe and went bent upon a cane in england to-day it is swagger for women to carry sticks in the country and here the thoughtful spectator of the human scene notes a nice point it is not etiquette according to english manners for a woman to carry a cane in town some american ladies who admire and would emulate english customs have not been made acquainted with this delicate nuance of taste and so are very unfashionable when they would be ultra fashionable anybody returning from the alps should bring back an alpine stock with him every one who has visited ireland upon his return has presented some close friend with a blackthorn stick nobody has made a walking tour of england without an ash stick in london all adult males above the rank of costers carry sticks in new york sticks are customary with many who would be ashamed to assume them did they live in the middle west where the infrequent sticks to be seen upon the city streets are in many cases the sign of transient mummers and yet it is a curious fact that in communities where the stick is conspicuously absent from the streets it is commonly displayed in show windows in company with cheap suits and decidedly loud gloves another odd circumstance is this trashy little canes hawked by sidewalk vendors generally appear with the advent of toy balloons for sale on days of big parades in jamaica long island the visitor would probably see canes in the hands only of prosperous colored gentlemen and than this fact probably nothing throws more light on the winning nature of the colored race and on the character and function of canes in san francisco but the adequate story of the sartor resartus the world as canes remains to be written this of course is the merest essay into this vast and significant subject end of prologue essay one of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay one the fish reporter 
men of genius blown by the winds of chance have been now and then mariners barkeeps schoolmasters soldiers politicians clergymen and what not and from these pursuits have they sucked the essence of yarns and in the setting of these activities found a flavor to stir and to charm hearts untold now it is a thousand pities that no man of genius has ever been a fish reporter thus has the world lost great literary treasure as it is highly probable that there is not under the sun any prospect so filled with the scents and colors of story as that presented by the commerce in fish take whale oil take the funny old buildings on front street out of paintings i declare by howard pyle where the large merchants in whale oil are take salt fish do you know the oldest salt fish house in america down by quintish slip ah you should the ghost of old long john silver i suspect smokes an occasional pipe in that old place and many are the times i've seen the slim shade of young jim hawkins come running out take labrador cod for export to the mediterranean lands or to puerto rico via new york take herrings brought to this port from iceland from holland and from scotland mackerel from ireland from the madeline islands and from cape breton crab meat from japan fish balls from scandinavia sardines from norway and from france caviar from russia shrimp which comes from florida mississippi and georgia or salmon from alaska and puget sound and the columbia river take the obituaries of fishermen in his prime it is said there was not a better skipper in the gloucester fishing fleet take disasters to schooners smacks and trawlers the crew were landed but lost all their belongings new vessels sails etc the sealing schooner tilly b whose career in the south seas is well known is reported to have been sold to a moving picture firm sponges from the caribbean sea in the gulf of mexico to most people familiar only with the sponges of the shops the animal as it comes from the sea would be rather unrecognizable why take anything you please it is such stuff as stories are and as you eat your fish from the store how little do you reck of the glamour of what you are doing however as it seems to me unlikely that a man of genius will be a fish reporter shortly i will myself do the best i can to paint the tapestry of the scenes of his calling the advertisement in the newspaper read wanted reporter for weekly trade paper many called but i was chosen though doubtless no man living knew less than i about fish the newsstands are each like a fair so laden are they with magazines in bright colors it would seem almost as if there were a different magazine for every few hundred and seven-tenth person as the statistics put these matters and yet it seems there is a vast a very vast periodical literature of which we that is magazine readers in general know nothing whatever there is for one that fine old standard publication barrel and box devoted to the subjects and the interests of the coopering industry there is too the dried fruit packer and western canner as alert a magazine as one could wish in its kind and from the home of classic american literature comes the new england tradesman and grocer and so on at the place alone where we went to press twenty-seven trade journals were printed every week from one for butchers to one for bankers the fish industries gazette ah yes for some reason not clear though it is an engaging thing i think the word gazette is the great word among the titles of trade journals there are the jeweler's gazette and the women's wear gazette and the poulterer's gazette of london and the maritime gazette of halifax and other gazettes quite without number this word gazette makes its appeal too curiously enough to those who christen country papers and trade journals have much of the intimate charm of country papers the trade in each case is a kind of neighborly community separated in its parts by space but joined in unity of sympathy personals are a vital feature of trade papers 
walter connor who for some time has conducted a bakery and fish market at hudson new york has removed to fort edward leaving his brother ed in charge of the hudson place of business the fish industries gazette as i say was one of several in its field in friendly rivalry with the oyster trade and fishermen and uh, the pacific fisheries it comprised two departments the fresh fish and oyster department and myself i was as an editorial announcement said at the beginning of my tenure of office a reorganization of our salt smoked and pickled fish department the delectable mellow spirit of the country paper so removed from the crash and whir of metropolitan journalism rested in this too that upon the gazette i did practically everything on the paper except the linotyping reporter editorial writer exchange editor make-up man proof-reader correspondent advertisement solicitor was i as exchange editor did i read all the papers in the english language in eager search of fish news and while you are about the matter just find me a finer bit of literary style evoking the romance of the vast wastes of the moving sea in stevenson defoe anywhere you please than such a news item as this captain ezra pound of the bark el nora of salem mass spoke a lonely vessel in latitude this and longitude that september eighth she proved to be the whaler wanderer and her captain said that she had been nine months at sea that all aboard were well and that he had stocked so many barrels of whale oil as exchange editor was it my business to peruse reports from eastport maine to the effect that one of the worst storms in recent years had destroyed large numbers of the sardine weirs there to seek fish recipes of such savory sound as those for broiled red snapper shrimps bordelaise and baked fish croquettes to follow fishing conditions in the north sea occasioned by the great war to hunt down jokes of piscatory humor the man who drinks like a fish does not take kindly to water exchange to find uh, other fillers in the consular reports and elsewhere fish culture in india eighteen hundred miles in a dory chinese carp for the philippines americans as fish eaters and to use a favorite term of trade papers etc etc then to paste up the winnowed fruits of this beguiling research as editorial writer to discuss the report of the commission recently sent by congress to the pribilof islands alaska to report on the condition of our national herd of fur seals to discuss the official interpretation here of the government ruling on what constitutes boneless codfish to consider the campaign in canada to promote there a more popular consumption of fish and to brightly remark apropos of this that a fish a day keeps the doctor away to review the current issue of the journal of the fishery society of japan containing leading articles on are fishing motorboats able to encourage in our country and fisherman of the late mr h yamaguchi well known to combat the prejudice against dogfish as food a prejudice like that against eels in some quarters eyed askance as calling cousins with the great sea serpent as juvenal says to call attention to the doom of one of the most picturesque monuments in the story of fish the passing of the pleasant and celebrated old trevolger hotel at greenwich near london scene of the famous ministerial whitebait dinners of the days of pitt to make a jest on an exciting idea suggested by some medical man that some of the features of a ritz carlton hotel that is baths be introduced in the forecastles of grand banks fishing vessels to keep an eye on the activities of our bureau of fisheries to him a praise to the monumental new fish pier at boston to glance at conditions in the premier fish market of the world billingsgate to herald the fish display at the canadian national exhibition at toronto and indeed etc and again etc 
as general editorial roustabout to find each week a leader a translation say from in allgemeine fischerei zweitung or economic circular number ten muscles in the tributaries of the missouri or the last biennial report of the superintendent of fisheries of wisconsin or a scientific paper on the porpoise in captivity reprinted by permission of zoologica of the new york zoological society to find each week for reprint a poem appropriate in sentiment to the feeling of the paper one of the saltwater ballads would do or john masefield singing of the whale's way or down to the white dipping sails or rupert brooke and in that heaven of all their wish there shall no more land say fish or a weather rhyme about mackerel skies when you're sure to get a fishing day or something from the new york sun about the lobster pots of maine or oliver hereford in the century to a goldfish or best of all an old song of fishing ways of other days and to compile from the new york journal of commerce better poetry than any of this tables beautiful tables of imports into new york october fifteen from bordeaux two hundred and twenty five cases of cuttlefish bone copenhagen one hundred and seventy three packages fish liverpool nine hundred and sixty nine barrels of herrings ten walrus hides two thousand bags salt la guarara six cases fish sounds belize nine barrel sponges rotterdam seven packages seaweed nine thousand kegs herrings barcelona two hundred and thirty five cases sardines bocas del toro five cases turtle shells genoa three boxes corals tampico two packages sponges halifax one case seal skins thirty five barrels cod liver oil two hundred and fifteen cases lobsters four hundred and ninety barrels codfish acurari four thousand one hundred and fifty barrels salted herrings and much more beautiful tables of exports from new york to australia cleared september one to argentina haiti jamaica guatemala scotland salvador santo domingo england and to places many more and many other gorgeous tables too fishing vessels in new york for one listing the trips brought into this port by the stranger the sarah odile the normahal a farrago of charming sounds and a valuable tale of facts as make-up man of course so to dress the papers that the markets oporto trinidad puerto rico demerara havana would be together that nova scotia notes weather conditions for curing have been more favourable since october set in would follow halifax fish market last week's arrivals were october thirteenth schooner hattie loring nine hundred and sixty quintals etc that pacific coast notes the tug tatouche will perform the service for the seattle salmon packers of towing a vessel from seattle to this port via the panama canal would follow canned salmon that shellfish matter would be in one place reports of salt fish where such should be that the weekly tale of the canned fish trade politically embraced the canned fish advertising and so on and so on finest of all as reporter to go where the fish reporter goes there the sightseeing cars never find their way the hurried commuter has not his path nor knows of these things at all and there that racy character who voicing a multitude declares that he would rather be a lamp-post on broadway than mayor of st louis goes not for to see up lower greenwich street the fish reporter goes along an eerie dark and narrow way beneath a strange thundering roof the l overhead he threads his way amid seemingly chaotic architectural piles of boxes of barrels crates casks kegs and bulging bags round about many great fetlocked draught horses frequently standing or plunging upon the sidewalk and attached to many huge trucks and wagons and much of the time in the street he is compelled to go finding the sidewalks too congested with the traffic of commerce to admit of his passing there 
you probably eat butter eggs and cheese then you would delight in greenwich street you could feast your highly creditable appetite for these excellent things for very nearly a solid mile upon the signs of wholesale dealers and commission merchants in them the letterpress as you might say of the fish reporter's walk is a noble paean to the earth's glorious yield for the joyous sustenance of man for these princely merchant signs sing of opulent stores of olive oil of sausages beans soups extracts and spices sugar spanish bermuda and havana onions fine apples teas coffee rice chocolates dried fruits and raisins and of loaves and of fishes and of fish products lo dark and dirty and thundering greenwich street is to-day's translation of the garden of eden here is a great house whose sole vocation is the importation of caviar for barter here caviar from overseas now comes when it comes at all mainly by the way of archangel recently put on the map for most of us by the war the fish reporter is told however if it be summer that there cannot be much doing in the way of caviar until fall when the spoonbills start coming in and on he goes to a great salt-fish house where many men in salt-stained garments are running about their arms laden with large flat objects of sharp and jagged edge which resemble dried and crackling hides of some animal curiously like a huge fish and numerous others of the same are trundling round wheelbarrow-like trucks likewise so laden where stacks of these hides stand on their tails against the walls and goodness knows how many big boxes are containing as those open show beautifully soft thick cream-coloured slabs which is fish and where still other men in overalls stained like a painter's palette are knocking off the heads of casks and dipping out of brine still other kinds of fish for inspection here it is said by the head of the house by the stove it is chill weather in his office like a shipmaster's cabin strong market on foreign mackerel mines hinder norway catch advices from abroad report that german resources continue to purchase all available supplies from the norwegian fishermen no irish of any account recent shipment sold on the deck at high prices fair demand from the middle west so by stages on up to turn into north moor street looking down a narrow lane between two long bristling rows of wagons pointed out from the curves to the facades of the north river docks at the bottom with the tops of the buff funnels of ocean liners and whistlerian silhouettes of derricks rising beyond hereabouts are more importers exporters and producers of fish famous in their calling beyond the celebrities of popular publicity and he that has official entree may learn by mounting dusky stairs half ladder and half stair and by passing through low-ceilinged chambers freighted with many barrels to the sanctums of the fish lords what's doing in the foreign herring way and get the current market quotations at present sky high and hear that the american shore mackerel catch is very fine stock then round about with a step into the broad vista of homely washington street and a turn through franklin street where is the man decorated by the imperial japanese government with a gold medal if he should care to wear it for having distinguished himself in the development of commerce in the marine products of japan back to hudson street an authentic railroad is one of the spectacular features of hudson street here down the middle of the way are endless trains stopping starting crashing laden to their ears with freight doubtless all to eat tourists should come from very far to view hudson street here is a spectacle as fascinating as awe-inspiring as extraordinary as any in the world from dawn until darkness falls hour after hour along hudson street slowly steadily moves a mighty procession of great trucks one would not suppose there were so many trucks on the face of the earth it is a glorious sight and any man whose soul is not dead should jump with joy to see it 
and the thunder of them all together as they bang over the stones is like the music of the spheres there is on hudson street a tall handsome building where the fish reporter goes which should be enjoyed in this way up in the lift you go to the top and then you walk down smacking your lips for all the doors in the building are brimming with poetry and the tune of it goes like this toasted cornflake company seaboard rice chili products red bloom grape juice sales office puerto rico and singapore pineapple company sunnyland foodstuffs importers of fruit pulps mementos sole agents of u s a italian salad oil raisin growers log cabin syrups jobbers in beans peas chocolate and cocoa preparations ohio evaporated milk company bernese alps and holland condensed milk company brazilian nuts company brokers pacific coast salmon california tuna company and thus on and on the fish reporter crosses the street to see the head of the sardine trust who has just thrown the market into excitement by a heavy cut in prices of last week's pack thence pausing to refresh himself by the way at a sign agency for rance champagne and moselle wines bordeaux clarets and sauternes over to broadway to interview the most august persons of all dealers in fertilizer fish scrap these mighty gentlemen live when at business in palatial suites of offices constructed of marble and fine woods and laid with rich rugs the reporter is relayed into the innermost sanctum by a succession of richly clothed attendants and he learns it may be that fishing in chesapeake bay is so poor that some of the fish factories may decide to shut down acid phosphate it is said is ruling at thirteen dollars f o b baltimore and so the fish reporter enters upon the last lap of his rounds through perhaps the narrow crooked lane of pine street he passes to come out at length upon a scene set for a sea tale here would a lad heir to vast estates in virginia be kidnapped and smuggled aboard to be sold a slave in africa this is front street a white ship lies at the foot of it cranes rise at her sides tugs belching smoke bob beyond all about are ancient warehouses redolent of the thames with steep roofs and sometimes stairs outside and with tall shutters a crescent-shaped hole in each there is a dealer in weather vanes other things dealt in hereabouts are these chronometers nautical instruments wax gums cordage and twine marine paint cotton wool and waste turpentine oils greases and rosin queer old taverns public houses are here too why do not their windows rattle with a yo ho ho there is an old old house whose business has been fish oil within the memory of men and here is another next through water street one comes in search of the last word on salt fish now the air is filled with gorgeous smell of roasting coffee tea coffee sugar rice spices bags and bagging here have their home and there are haughty bonded warehouses filled with fine liquors from his white cabin at the top of a venerable structure comes the dean of the salt fish business export trade fair he says good demand from south america end of essay one essay two of walking stick papers by robert cortis holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay two on going a journey one of the pleasantest things in the world is going a journey but few know it now it isn't every one that can go a journey no doubt one that owns an automobile cannot go the spirit of the age has got him fast begoggled and with awful squawks feverish exultant ignorant he is condemned to hoot over the earth thus the wealthy know nothing of journeys for they must own motors vain people and envious people and proud people cannot go because the wealthy do not silly people do not know enough to go 
the lazy cannot because of their laziness the busy hang themselves with business the halt nor the aged alas cannot go in fine only such as are whole any wise and pure in heart can go a journey and they are the blessed we arrive at places now but we most of us travel no more the way a journey is gone to come to the point is walking asking many folks pardon to tear through the air in an open car deafened hilariously muddled by the rush and roar of wind is to drive observation from the mind it is to be in a manner complacently intellectually unconscious is to drink an enjoyment akin to that of the shooters of the shoot or that go out on the very latest of this sort of engine of human amusement called the hulligy whiz a pleasure of the ignorant metaphorically a kind of innocence rotgut whisky the way a journey is gone which is walking is a wine a mellow claret stimulating to observation to thought to speculation to the flow of talk gradually decently warming the blood rightly taken which manner this paper attempts to set forth walking is among the pleasures of the mind it is a call-boy to wit a handmaiden to cultivation sufficiently indulged in it will make a man educated a wit a poet an ironist a philosopher a gentleman a better christian not to dwell upon improving his digestion and prolonging his life and too like true shandyism it opens the heart and the lungs whoso hath ears let him hear once and for all if the mad world did not know it the best the most exquisite automobile is a walking stick and one of the finest things in life is going a journey with it no one though this is the first article to be observed should ever go a journey with any other than him with whom one walks arm in arm in the evening the twilight and talking let us suppose of men's given names agrees that if either should have a son he shall be named after the other walking in the gathering dusk two and two since the world began there have always been young men who have time to one another plotted their troth if one is still not one of these then in the sense here used journeys are over for him what is left to him of life he may enjoy but not journeys mention should be made in passing that some have been found so ignorant of the nature of journeys as to suppose that they might be taken in company with members or a member of the other sex now one who writes of journeys would cheerfully be burned at the stake before he would knowingly underestimate women but it must be confessed that it is another season in the life of man that they fill they are too personal for the high enjoyment of going a journey they must be forever thinking about you or about themselves with them everything in the world is somehow tangled up in these matters and when you are with them you cannot help it or if you could they would not allow it you must be forever thinking about them or yourself nothing on either side can be seen detached they cannot rise to that philosophic plane of mind which is the very marrow of going a journey one reason for this is that they can never escape from the idea of society you are in their society they are in yours and the multitudinous personal ties which connect you all to that great order called society that you have for a period got away from physically are present like the business man who goes on a vacation from business and takes his business habits along with him so on a journey they would bring society along and all sort of etiquette he that goes a journey shakes off the trammels of the world he has fled all impediments and inconveniences he belongs for the moment to no time or place he is neither rich nor poor but in that which he thinks and sees there is not such another arcadia for this on earth as in going on a journey he that goes a journey escapes for a breath of air from all conventions without which though of course society would go to pot and which are the very natural instinct of women the best time for going a journey a connoisseur speaks it is some morning when it has rained well the day or night before and the soil of the road where it is not evenly packed 
is of about that substance of which the fingers can make fine tees for golfing this is the precise composition of earth and dampness underfoot most sympathetic to the spine the knee sockets the muscles tendons ligaments of limb back neck breast and abdomen and the spirit of locomotion in the ancient exercise of walking on this day the protruding stones have been washed bald in the road the lines and marks of drainage are still clearly freshly defined in the soil in the gutters light-coloured sand has risen to the surface with the dark moist soil in a grained effect not unlike marbled chocolate cake and clean sweet gravel is laid bare here and there in the wagon ruts this is the chosen time for the nerves and senses on such a day the whole world greets one cleansed and having on a fresh bib and tucker it is a conscious pleasure to have eyes it is as if one long near-sighted without knowing it had suddenly been fitted with the proper spectacles it is sweet to have olfactories whoso hath lungs let him breathe man was made to rejoice how green on such a day are the greens the distant purples how purple the stone walls are cool the great canvas of the sky has been but newly brushed in as if by some modern landscape painter the tube colours seem yet hardly dry the technique the brush marks show in the unutterably soft warm white clouds or like a puff of beaten egg white wells above that orchard hill higher up thinly touched across the blue a great sweep of downy swan breast breast feathers spreads but not one canvas is this sky ceaselessly it changes with the minutes to observe is to walk through an endless gallery of countless pictures it is alone a life study now the wind has blown it clear as blue limpidness now scattered flakes appear now it is deep blue now pale now it tinges darkly now it is a layer of cream again it breaks into shapes decorative shapes odd shapes lovely shapes shapes always fresh its innovations are unflagging inexhaustible always art its genius is infinite one must go a journey to discover how vast the sky really is and the world to mount bending forward up by a long tree-walled ascent from some valley and come upon this spectacular sight the fair globe that man inhabits lying away before one like a gigantic physical map a map in relief cunningly painted in the colours of nature laid off by woods and orchards and roads and stone walls into many decorative shapes until it melts into purple and fainter and fainter and still fainter purple japanese hills the site is some of the noble quarry the game this is the anise seed bag of him that goes a journey some glimmering of the nobility of the plan of which he is a fell erring speck comes over one as he looks this is the religious side of going a journey it is best to go a journey on a road that you do not know on a road that lures you on to peep over the crest of yonder hill that ever flees before you in a game of hide-and-seek disappearing behind great jutting rocks and turns and trees to leap out again at your approach and laughingly elusively continually slip before you a road that winds anon where some roaring brook pours near by a road that may deceive you and trick you into miles out of your way a high breeze rushes through the trees and fans the traveller's opened pores with a sudden startling whirr mounting with their hearts a bird flushes from the tangled growth at the roadside the worst roads for walking are such as are commonly called the best that is macadam a macadam pavement is a piece of masonry wholly without elasticity built for vehicles to roll over to go a journey without a walking stick much would be lost indeed it would be folly a stick is the fly-wheel of the engine something is needed to whack things with little stones wormy apples and so forth in the road 
It can be changed from one hand to the other, which is a great help. Then, if one slips a trifle on a downgrade turn, it is a lengthened arm thrown out to steady one. It is the pilgrim's staff. On the upgrades it assists climbing. It is a weapon of defense, if such ever should be needed. It is a badge of dignity, a dress sword. It is the scepter of walking. Dipping the dales, riding the swells, the automobiles come, like gigantic bugs coming after the wicked. With a sucking rush of wind and dust and an odor of gasoline, they are passed. Stray pieces of paper at the roadside arise and fly after them, then further on sink, impotent, exhausted. I have found that no exertion of the legs can bring two minds much nearer to one another. One who goes much a journeying cannot understand how Thoreau got it so completely turned around. But after the first effervescence of going a journey, of speech a time of times, has passed, and when, next, the fine novelty of open observation has begun to pale, there are still copious resources left one retires on the way, metaphorically speaking, into one's closet for meditation, for miles of silent thought, when one's stride is mechanical and is like an absent-minded drumming with the fingers, but that it is better, for it pumps the blood for freer thought than in lethargic sitting. In this rhythmic moving one thinks as to a tune. To sit thus absolutely silent, absent in thought completely, even with that friend one wears in one's heart's core, will at length become dull for one or other. Sitting thus one is tempted, too, to speech. Walking it is not so. One may talk or one may not. If both wish to think, both feel as if something sociable is being done in just walking together. If one does not care to go wool-gathering, the other does not leave him without entertainment. Walking alone is entertainment. It is assumed, of course, that one goes a journey in silence as in speech with the companion with whom one has been best seasoned. Silently walking, the movement of the mind keeps step in thought exactly with the movement of the man, so that the pace is a thermometer of the temperature at that moment of one's brain. One who has written on going a journey as well, perhaps, as the world will ever see it done, owned that he never had had a watch. Further, he intimated that the possession of one was an indication of poverty of mental resource. It was his own want, he said, to pass hours, whole days, unconscious of the flight of time. He described his father as taking out his watch to look at whenever he could think of nothing else to do. His father, our author says, was no metaphysician. It must be confessed that one now writing of journeys sometimes, somewhat unmetaphysician-like, conscious of the flight of time, has communication with a watch, and, finding the day well advanced, decides, speaking very figuratively, to lay the cloth beneath some twisted, low, gnarled apple-tree. At the next shadow, he suggests, let's wait until we get to the top of the hill first. Oh, here we are. Sweet rest, when one throws one's members down upon the turf, and there lets them lie, as if they were so many detached packages dropped. Then one feels the exquisite nerve luxury of having legs, while one rests them. One's back could lie thus prone forever. One feels, sucking all the rich pleasure of it, that one couldn't move one's arms, lift one's hands, if one had to. What are the world's rewards if this is not one? At length, in going a journey, comes a time when one tiredly shrinks from the work of speech, when observation dozes, and thought lolls like a limp sail that only idly stirs at the passing zephyrs. The legs, like piston rods, strike on. When the pleasure is like that almost of dull narcotics, one realizes only dimly that one is moving. 
at such times as these coming from one knows not whence and one feels too weak to search back to discover there flit across the mind strange fragments relevant as they seem to nothing whatever present when a journey has been made one way the trick has been done the superfluous energy which inspired it has found escape the way to return is not by walking a friend to fatigue is this that in walking back one is not on a voyage of discovery one knows the way and very much what one will see on it one knows the distance in fact the fruit has been plucked the bloom is gone to walk back would be like tedious marching with a regiment one should return resting on trains one returns from a journey whoso hath life one thinks as his journey draws to its close let him live it what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and never know his own soul end of essay two essay three of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay three going to art exhibitions there are two opposing views as to going to art exhibitions and much with a good deal of reason may be said on both sides there is one very vigorous attitude which holds that the pictures are the thing this indeed is a perfectly ponderable theory but it may be questioned whether in its ardor it does not go a little far for it affirms that people are a confounded nuisance at art exhibitions and should not be permitted to be there to distract one's attention from the peaceful contemplation of works of art and to infuriate one by their asinine remarks in the holy presence of beauty i have heard it declared with very impressive spirit and reasoned with much force that only one person or at most one person and his chosen companion should be allowed in an art gallery at a time it is debatable however whether this intellectually aristocratic idea is altogether practicable on the other hand was it not even little billy who found the people at art exhibitions frequently more interesting than the pictures anyhow persons who write about art exhibitions confine themselves exclusively to the subject of art when they gossip it is about the pictures the painters and the sculpture true of course this is their job and then these persons go on press days and so only see outside of that which is intentionally exhibited other critics now there is nothing in all the world quite like art exhibitions beyond any other sort of show they possess a spirit which to use a pet and an excellent critical expression of one of our foremost art critics is grand gloomy and peculiar you feel this charged atmosphere at once at an art exhibition you walk softly you speak low and you endeavor to become as intelligent as possible art exhibitions in short present various features indigenous to themselves which so far as i am aware have not before been adequately commented upon the principal observations which they solicit are as follows first art exhibitions are attended by two classes of people very fine-looking people and funny-looking people there is a very striking kind of a young man goes to art exhibitions that i myself never accomplish seeing anywhere else though sometimes i see pictures of him this young man is superbly patrician you may have remarked this singular phenomenon all the young men in all the advertisements in the magazine vanity fair are the same young man whether riding in a splendid motor-car elegantly attending the play or doing a little shooting of birds you know him for one thing by his exquisite moustache this fastidiously groomed exclusively tailored young man to be seen in the pages spoken of and at art exhibitions is certainly not of art nor is he of business he takes no account whatever apparently of time as men of business do and manifestly one could not work in such a moustache and such clothes without mussing them he is in fine of vanity fair 
oscar wilde was as usual wrong when he said that all beautiful things were quite useless this immaculate young man's practical function at art exhibitions as perhaps elsewhere is that of escort he is escort to groups of very handsome and very expensive-looking young ladies and these fragrant rustling groups with the waxen patrician young man in tow stroll slowly about catalogues unnoticed in hand without pause skirting the picture-hung walls they are very still and they gaze upon the art that they pass with the look of a doe contemplating the meaning of the appearance of a man the perfect escorts of these groups who would seem naturally to be rather gay young men look very serious indeed now one of them gracefully though as if careful not to make any noise bends to one of the young ladies and indicating by a solemn look one of the paintings he whispers to her apparently concerning it she silently nods it is evidently quite as he says when an art exhibition is so undertakery a thing you wouldn't think that one would come though perhaps it is that one ought at any rate there is quite a turnout to-day moving beneath the ghostly glow of the shrouded skylight ceiling half the avenue seems to be here what a play it is this highly urban throng let us sit here on this divan down the middle of the room with what a stately march the pictures go in their golden frames along the symphonious burlap walls there by that copious piece of intelligence manet's music lesson is but see what has come over our earnest group those who compose it are all quite changed they look as happy as can be all beaming with smiles their backs to the neighboring walls friends it seems have greeted them how they all bubble on all about the outside world but goodness now what is the matter suddenly one of the newcomers is struck by a startled look she sees that is it one of the pictures in an arrested voice she says oh isn't that perfectly lovely at once the happy light fades from the faces of all an awed hush falls upon them as stiffly they turn their heads in the direction of her view charming one of the young men breathes staring intently at the painting which has come upon them that it is awkward for everybody is plain but happily there is much rebound to youth one of the young ladies at length shakes herself free from the pall upon her spirits the mesmeric spell is broken and presently all are chatting again gaily oblivious to art by the way there is the proprietor of the gallery just before the three renoir pastels is there anything about art exhibitions that more enlists the imagination than the study of the dealers themselves the gentlemen who preside at art exhibitions fall rather violently into three perhaps four classes you have i dare say been repeatedly struck by the quaintly inappropriate character in appearance of those of one of these classes i mean of course those very horsey-looking men with decidedly hard faces loudly dressed and dowered with hoarse voices they would seem to be bookmakers exceedingly prosperous publicans bunco brokers militant politicians anything save of the kingdom of art are their polished bill sykes exteriors but bizarre domiciles for lofty souls i cannot tell here and there it is true you find the aesthete in effect among dealers the wired moustache the spindle-legged voice and the ardent spirit in discussing his wares with lady visitors our horsey type seems rather ponderous and phlegmatic in this matter then there is too a land of art exhibition which is very close indeed to art a kind of spirited propaganda in fact which is presided over by those of hierarchical character beings as to hair and cravat swarthy complexion and mystic gesticulation wholly from the world and mocked by the profane but to my mind the most satisfying sort of a host to observe at an art exhibition is that of the description of this admirable dealer before us 
benign frock-coated hands clasped behind him he stands symbol of gentlemanly merchantly dignity occasionally he rises upon his toes and then sinks again to his heels obviously with satisfaction but that which proclaims the perfect equity of his mind is this his nice recognition of the nuances in humankind you perceive that his bow to each of his guests that he recognizes at all is graduated according to the precise degree of that person's value to art that to some few royal patrons presumably being at an angle of forty-five degrees while a common amateur of art is acknowledged by one of five where to continue the paraphrase of a pleasant observation upon mr george brummel it is a mere question of recognizing the fact that a certain person dwells on the same planet with art a slight relaxation of the features is made to suffice so this profound bow is plainly meant for a particular tribute to one who wears the richest purple lo he advances with unclasped hands pleasure beams from his countenance without such as she art and dealers and galleries and the recorded beauty of the world would perforce pass away this entertaining personage who is the great flurry at art exhibitions is of the novelist dowager duchess type a short obese and jovial figure or dried and withered but imperious distinction as the case may be there is much crackling of fine garments a brilliant display of lorgnette and this penetrating and comprehensive royal critical dictum isn't that interesting so full of feeling two outstanding features you mark of art exhibitions everywhere are here presented is any one who doesn't know what he is talking about at art exhibitions and which of us does properly equipped for attendance there without this happy esoteric phrase full of feeling it is safe or as safe as anything can be to say about any picture it graphically indicates in the speaker delicate sensitivity and emotional responsiveness to art and most beneficently it subtly evades anything like the trying ordeal of an analysis of a work of art it is indeed invaluable the other thing is this there is no place going which is so well adapted to the exhibition of handsome fashionable or eccentric eyeglasses as an art exhibition you observe there all that is newest and classy in glasses and you are insistently invited to admiring study of the art of wearing queer glasses effectively and of taking them off letting them bound on their leash doubling them up opening them out and putting them on with a gesture the complementary type to the storied duchess at art exhibitions is represented by yonder portly blood in this case a replica of the late king edward the fruitful spectacle of art exhibitions i think presents nothing which gives one a more gratifying sense of their dignity and of the imperial character of art than the presence there of these patently highly solvent ruddy-jowled admirably tailored and impressively worldly-looking connoisseurs of painting to be seen scrutinizing the pictures at close range in a near-sighted way and rather grimly as though somewhat sceptically appraising possibly dubious merchandise hello there's mr chase and that's a fortunate thing too as no sympathetic picture of a representative american art exhibition should omit mr chase whether or not we think of him as our premier painter we should be inordinately proud of him undoubtedly he is a great artist he has wrought himself in the grand manner in person he delights the eye and satisfies the imagination with his inevitable top hat his heavy eyeglasses cord his military moustaches and upward pointing beard his powder pigeon carriage his glowing spats and his boutonniere his aroma of distinction and his ruddy consciousness of his prestige he is our great tour de force as a figure in the artistic scene he is here naturally now the target of popular interest 
the practice of having artists shown at their own exhibitions is one too little cultivated the napoleonic brow and the napoleonic forelock famous in their circle of george lux the torrential luxian mirth how would not their actual presence open the spiritual eyes of visiting school children to the humane qualities of the works of the luxian genius and why should we who procure for our better perception of their works illuminating biographies of the old masters not be permitted the intellectual stimulation of beholding the ten american painters seated along on a bench at their annual show the subject of the artists themselves however brings us around to the line between the two kinds of people having to do with art exhibitions fine-looking people and funny-looking people come let us trot along artists themselves are in a most pronounced degree of both kinds and a very singular thing is this the funnier an artist's pictures are the funnier looking is the artist that made them we'll stop in here at the advanced gallery ah how are you that just going out is one of the newest groups of painters known as the homeopathics i used to know him before he went abroad and the curious thing is that at that time he was very good-looking he was clean-shaven this strange assortment of whiskers of different fashions on various parts of his face imperial goatee burnsides he brought back with him notice as we step from the car at the gallery floor the numerous others here who also were at the show we just left and those who are thus making the rounds you perceive are not of what is called society but of the kind known in these circles doubtless as uh, interesting nearly everybody in this gallery in fact is of the interesting sort at once it is apparent that there is nothing of the perfunctory here art is vital art is earnest the atmosphere is tense the young women are clad in a manner giving much freedom to the movement of their bodies they walk with a stride their clothes are not of the mode of the avenue but they have uh, how shall i say to twist what whistler said of his model character character is what these clothes have they suggest many of these young women the type that has never got back from uh, do you know chelsea at all asked one of them of an anarchic-looking young man never got back as i was about to say from chelsea a couple of other anarchic-looking young men are viewing a painting in the manner that a painting or perhaps this particular painting is intended to be viewed that is by squinting at it first over the tops of their hands and then through their fingers they discuss it darkly in low passionate tones they advance upon it and a few inches before it one as though holding a brush in his hand sweeps eloquently with his arm following the contour of the painted figure legerdemain kind of thing painting isn't it sort of a black art when you see into the science of it well i declare here's a friend of mine there talking with a titian haired lady in the exotic gown now he is coming over to us he says he wants us to know ben gunn who is here one of the new crowd he says my friend is very keen on the new crowd everything else he declares is a passe anyhow it is a very valuable experience to talk with an exhibitor at an art exhibition your mind is impregnated until it swells dizzily in your head that would be he the illiterate-looking little creature with the uncombed and unsanitary-looking mop there i knew he would say something something that would never leave you again the same nothing is shiny in nature says mr ben gunn as though rather depressed surveying a canvas in this respect unhappily divorced from the truth nature he adds with brahminic finality is always dull mr ben gunn is greeted affectionately by a gentleman you always see at every art exhibition this is mr i forget his name it is french i know he writes on art for demos a remarkable being who apparently talks hears and sees nothing else but aestheticism 
for as there are types peculiar to art exhibitions so there are certain individuals apparently quite peculiar to art exhibitions come let us go down to see some old masters notice there in the corner the foreign-looking gentleman with the three foreign-looking children that the quiet cultivated foreign father and his children is one of the pleasantest sights frequently to be seen at art exhibitions thus he is to be seen easily and intimately discussing the pictures with his attentive followers the great point about the study of art exhibits from the point of view of the humanist is the affinity between pictures and people here for instance on madison square amid the art heritage of times past what is it that at once strikes you why that old paintings evidently are quite passe to the new crowd at these exhibitions preliminary to the big auction sales of venerable masters and of middle-aged masters and of venerable and middle-aged not quite masters there is a very attractive class of people a class of funny-looking fine-looking people a class that is of rather shabby-looking people who look as if they might be very rich of dull-looking people who look as if they might be very bright they buy huge catalogues at a dollar or so apiece which they consult continually they arrive early and remain a long time the women of this audience frequently are rather dowdy and shapen in very individual fashions the men generally are elderly beings now and then reminiscent of the period of horace greeley they are very bald or with untrimmed white not gray hair and sometimes Uncle Sam-like whiskers. They are usually very wrinkled as to trousers and overcoats. Here and there among the gentlemen of this company is to be seen one who looks strikingly like Emile Zola, or the late Mr. Pierpont Morgan, slightly gone to seed. All these charming folk make of looking at old-fashioned pictures a very busy occupation, and also in effect a rather mundane occupation, as though they were alertly considering the possibility of making a selection from among a variety of serviceable kitchen chairs. Argumenting the throng are authentic representatives of the world of fashion some who appear to be students the ever-present foreigners including the frequently present jap a number of those enigmatic beings who continually take notes at art exhibitions and a respectable quota of those ladies we always have with us at art exhibitions who in the presence of pictures and it necessary to say isn't that wonderful marvellous tone quality occasionally a decidedly quaint student of art strolls in past the imposing flunky in finery a bit faded at the door strolls in in the form of a lodger in madison square he looks at the pictures as if thoughtfully but without animation well we have now covered in an elementary way about every important species of art show except one the most human perhaps of all that held annually on fifty seventh street we should hardly have time to go up there to-day i'll tell you about it there are several reasons why this exhibition is the most human perhaps of all one is that more people go than to any other and these people taken by and large are more human too than one sees at most art exhibitions that is more like just ordinary people this may be for one thing because the pictures as a rule are more ordinary pictures and a very human touch indeed is this when you see the card sold on a painting it is fairly certain to be one of the most ordinary pictures of the lot that reminds one of museums people who are called in the world to the curious pursuit of copying pictures in museums for some reason or other which i have been unable as yet to work out apparently always copy the most bourgeois pictures there but museums with their throngs of subdued holiday-makers and their crowds of weary gaping aliens of the submerged order museums comprise a separate study at any rate i hope in our stroll i have been able to give you a new insight into the fascination of the great world of art End of essay three.
Essay four of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay four A Roundabout Paper. No reader of the Spectator will have forgotten an article which appeared there some years ago entitled As to Bears, or ever will forget it until his shall be the shut lid and the granite lip of him who has done with sunsets and skating and has turned away his face from all manner of Irish, as William Vaughn Moody says not only because it was one of the finest things ever in the spectator or anywhere else after possibly that imperishable dissertation of the great deans or was it sir william temples on a broomstick but also because it was one pure flower in our day of a kind of art little cultivated any more as to bears ah me how engaging simple gracious and at ease what perfection of literary breeding what an amused and genial wave of the finger-tips how marked by good-humoured acuteness and animated nonchalance how saturated with a distinguished humane tradition of letters that title that is just the note i would strike in the great book i have been brooding for years bums i have known it has been my felicity to have known more bums i think than any living man but i fear i shall never get that book written and this is a pity it is a pity because this book would be of great value in the years to come with our modern passion for efficiency and with efficiency rapidly becoming compulsory everywhere that colourful class of ancient lineage the bums is quickly becoming a persona non grata to our civilization and will soon be extinct to the next generation in all probability the word bum will be but an empty name i doubt whether it would be a feasible plan for dr hornaday to undertake to preserve a small number of this species in the bronx park the bum nature i fear would languish in captivity the creature would likely lose its health and worse its spirits it is a nomad a child of nature it takes no thought for the morrow as our modern prophets teach us to do i remember well an excellent bum i mean excellently conforming to type one bain who growing restive under restraint lost a position which he happened to have i asked him what he was going to do now there was something sublime about that being he had faith that the lord would provide his simple reply was well the ravens fed elijah stuffed bums in the american museum of natural history would not be any good any good that is as objects of study our children will require to know to see the past steadily and to see it whole the habits of bums their manners and customs so as i say my work would be invaluable the wastrel as they say in england has of course been celebrated in the literature of the past from time immemorial i can't at the moment put my finger on any but i have no doubt there are bums in the pages of homer that persian philosopher who found paradise now with a jug of wine and a book of verse beneath a bough falstaff richard swiveller how they flock to the mind they of the carefree kidney they are in the books of the great hebrew literature there was he that took his journey into a far country gil blas and all the early picaresque novels on into the pages of the romany rye swarm with them but what is wanting what will be needed is a richly informed picture of the last of the race those now like the indian and the buffalo fast passing away there is only one way in which such a book could be or should be written peace be with the soul of that charitable and courteous author who introduced the ingenious way of miscellaneous writing wrote lord shaftesbury in the opening paragraph of his miscellaneous reflections peace be with the souls of all those who for the delight of the anointed have practised that most debonair of all arts the ingenious way of miscellaneous writing 
now as highly successful novelists always say nowadays when interviewed for highly successful newspapers i know very little about literature but i fancy this benign way of writing had its wellspring in those preposterous days now long fled when men of reading were content to give their best thoughts first to their friends and then ten years or so afterwards to the public its period was the day of the wits those bows of the mind i guess the reason it has gone by the board is that it was what would be called literary and there is nothing we are so scared of to-day as the literary it was not those dons the critics we are told on the subway cards who made dickens immortal it was you and our foremost magazines advertise the unliterary essay literary expression that addisonian english stuff whose elegance pleasantly conceals the lack of ideas beneath is taboo in these parts what we want is writers who have something to say and who say it naturally and without any beating about the bush while the spell of miscellaneous writing for those who savor it is the author's joyous inability it would seem to get any forrader to stick to the point to carry anything with a rush see the greatest miscellaneous writer who ever lived as an admirable later miscellaneous writer the late in a literary sense honorable augustin birrell calls him the rev lawrence stern see positively the most buoyant book in all the world i mean of course the path to rome by hilaire belloc that glorious newspaper article is genius conscious of its power starts off indeed with an allusion to the subject of genius but the genius of this writer of such unsurpassed and ingratiating savagery soon turns to its true business of getting lost in the woods and we take it from william hazlitt that all in power are a lot of crooks so one born under the miscellaneous writer's star who purposed to write on say bums he had known would quite likely begin with a disquisition upon the importance of a good shape of human ear and very naturally would conclude with some warmth with a denunciation of tight trousers and he would of course wander by the way into pleasant reminiscences of his childhood how for instance the child gets his idea of what a native is from the cuts in his geography book i well remember the first time i was alluded to in my presence as a native i was very indignant i knew what natives looked like from the cuts i had pored over they were a fine spirited race very picturesquely attired mostly in bows and arrows and as creatures of romance i admired them greatly persons such as i and my parents were generally depicted in this connection as fleeing from them and it did strike me as an ignoramus kind of a thing that i should be called a native when i was reasoned with to the effect that i was a native of indiana my resentment but grew there were no natives in indiana speaking of efficiency reminds me of the real estate business i have recently come somewhat into contact with this business and i have observed certain outstanding facts about it which i have not seen commented upon before to set up in the real estate business one thing above all is necessary that is uncommon familiarity with the word imagination if you are thinking of buying a lot you will meet a tall fair man or a short dark man as the case may be but in any case as unimaginative looking a man as you could readily imagine from this person you will learn that the thing at the bottom of every great fortune was imagination if the location of the lot which you view strikes you as rather a desolate and barren looking part of the world the trouble is not with the location but with you forty-second street looked worse than that at one time thus i imagine if you have sufficient imagination you buy the lot it is a remarkable thing that the most startling spectacle in new york has never struck any one but myself 
Forty-second Street puts me in mind of this. If you were a native of the Sandwich Islands and had never before been in town, and were standing at the southeast corner of Broadway and Fulton Street at nine o'clock in the morning and were facing west, you would cry out aghast at this sight. You would see the quiet old-world graveyard of St. Paul's Chapel, the funereal stone urn upon its stone post marking the corner, and the leaning headstones beyond. There is no trumpet sound, but from a mouth at the graveyard side of the earth belches forth a host which springs quickly into the new day. It is a remarkable spectacle to contemplate, fraught with portent and symbol, though the mouth is a subway kiosk, my sandwich friend. Now, there are men who walk about London just as some men collect books. They are amateurs of London. Year by year they add precious souvenirs to their rich collections, the find of an old passageway here, there the view when the light is quite right from one precise spot, say on Waterloo Bridge. Sometimes, indeed, they write books about their hobby, more or less useful to the neophyte, as A Wayfarer's London, or A Wanderer in London, or Ghosts of Piccadilly, or some such thing, but more frequently they are of the highest type of amateur, the connoisseur who will gladly share his joy in his treasures with a cultivated friend, but has nothing of his love to sell. I doubt whether there are any such amateurs of New York, any who for thirty years and more have walked our streets as an intellectual sport with unabated zest. London, of course, has the drop on us in the matter of richness of material for this sort of collector, but there is plenty to bag at home. Not far from the corner of Broadway and Fulton Street, I recollect, is a queer place called Vandevater Street. Some twenty years or so ago you used to go to melodramas, real melodramas. There are aesthetic revivals of melodrama in Boston, I hear. There was nothing aesthetic about the ones I mean, and the enjoyment of them was untainted by the malady of thought. Come along now, we'll dive through Park Row and turn here down Frankfort Street. Few do turn down Frankfort Street, and I fear its admirable points are unappreciated. For one thing, it goes down, down, down a very steep incline, which is a spirited thing for a street to do, I think, and it is very narrow at the beginning, with sidewalks that hug the walls, and is always in shadow, so that it has a fine, wild, villainous look. Horses climbing it always come with a plunge and a grinding of sparks, and the roar from the cobblestones is deafening, very stimulating to the imagination. The atmosphere is one of type founders, leather, hides, and oyster houses. Very few people, I fancy, could tell you where there is a portcullis in New York, just like the one at a gateway in the tower. But if you snook around the arches of the Brooklyn Bridge, you'll find one with a winding stair disappearing beyond it, and mounting, presumably, to a dungeon. Newswomen, I think, are pleasanter to see than newsboys. There is a newsgirl who minds a stand here at the corner of Rose and Frankfort Streets, who is charming as a type of Ariette. She always wears an enormous hat. A fine thing for a Ariette to do, I think. Sometimes the stand is minded by her mother. I take it, it is her mother. An old body who always has her head wrapped in a knitted affair. A fine thing for an old body to do, I think. Phil May would have delighted in Frankfort Street. So would Rembrandt. Here comes an elderly person, evidently George Lux's my old pal, who is balancing a large bundle of sticks on her head. Across the way is a Whistler etching. Whistler did not happen to etch it, but it is a Whistler etching all the same. You look up a frowsy little courtyard, the walls of which are more graceful than plumb, and you see a horse's head sticking out into the etching. Also across the way, the K has dropped out of stake on the window of a chop house. The public houses down this way, many of them, are very low places. The thing to do in this world is to get as much innocent pleasure out of the spectacle as possible. Well, the streets here twist about beneath the bridge, so that you do not know what's beyond the turning. 
People going and coming through the arches are silhouettes. Overhead it is like the grumbling of a thunderstorm. Wagons going over the stones rattle tremendously, and they carry lanterns swung beneath to be lighted at night. The streets have fine names. There is Gold Street, and then Jacob Street. Frankfurt Street widens out and becomes a generous thoroughfare, all in sunlight. There is a huge gay hoarding to the right as you go down. On your left you see one of the towers of the bridge rising high in the air. Directly ahead the J.L. crosses the way. Now comes the point which I have been getting at. You dip and turn into Vandewater Street. Under the bridge at once you go, where all sounds are weird hollow sounds, and then out again. The atmosphere has been becoming more and more charged with the character of the printing business. Now may be felt the tremor and heard the sound of moving presses. Printing houses, dealers in litho inks, linotype companies, paper makers, publishers and jobbers of books, photo engraving establishments are all about. Here is a far-famed publishing house, the sight of which takes you back with a jump to your boyhood, your youthful, arrant, adventurous reading. Those were the happy days when the flavor of crime was like ginger in the mouth. Perhaps the recollection of this affects your thoughts now, and makes your mind more active than want. All the people going through Vandewater Street appear to be compositors, fine strapping romantic people, compositors smeared with ink, though there are other interests in this street besides printing. There is a big schoolhouse with every window in it broken, grand a desolate look to it. There is a delightful sign which says, Horse Collars Upstairs. There are little homes toward the end of the street, it is one block long, little old two-story brick dwelling houses in charmingly bad repair, with fire escapes, little stairs twisting up to the doors and iron railings there, and window boxes at the windows. As you turn at Pearl Street to go back again, something comes over you. It is melodrama that comes over you, the vista of this queer, cold, lonesome, hard little street down by the great city's river front was painted, or something very like it was painted, on back curtains long ago. The great gloomy pile of the bridge rises before, over all. To make it right there should be a scream. A female figure with hair streaming upward should shoot through the air to black waters below, where there is a decrepit boat with a man in a striped jersey pulling at the oars. End of Essay 4 Essay 5 of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortis Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 5. That Reviewer Cuss. There are very young, oh, absurdly young, reviewers, and there are elderly reviewers with whiskers. There are also women reviewers. Absurdly young reviewers are inclined to be youthful in their reviews, Elderly reviewers usually have missed fire with their lives, or they wouldn't still be reviewers. The best sort of a reviewer is the reviewer that is just getting slightly bald. He is not a flibberty gibbet, and still an intelligent man, if he is a good reviewer. Book reviews are in nearly all the papers. Proprietors of newspapers don't read these things. They think they are deadly stuff. Many authors don't because they regard them as ill-natured and exceedingly stupid. Book clerks don't read them much, for that would be like working overtime. Businessmen infrequently have time for such nonsense. University professors are inclined to poo-poo them as things beneath them. Still, somebody must read them, as publishers pay for them with their advertising. No publisher's advertising, no book reviews, is the policy of nearly every newspaper, and the reviews are generally in proportion to the amount of advertising. Now, publishers are sagacious men, who generally live in comfortable circumstances, and who occasionally get quite rich and mingle in important society. They set considerable store by reviews. 
they employ publicity men at good wages who continually supply reviewers with valuable information by post and telephone they are fond of quoting in large type remarks from reviewers which please them and sometimes at reviews they don't like they stir up a fuss and have literary editors removed from office yes reviews have much power they are eagerly read by multitudes of people who write very indignantly to the paper to correct and rebuke the reviewer when owing to fatigue he refers to miss mitford as having written cranford or otherwise blunders they are the wings of fame to new authors they can increase the sale of a book by saying that it should not be in the hands of the young they are tolerated by the owners of papers who are very powerful men indeed engaged in the vast modern industry of manufacturing news for the people and in constant effort to obtain control of politics reviewers are paid space rates of in some instances as much as eight dollars a column with the headlines deducted when there is no other payment they always get the book they review free for their libraries or to sell cheap to the second-hand man reviewers are spoken of as the critics by simple-minded people when their printed remarks are useful for that purpose the remarks are called leading critical opinions by advertisements and reviewers are sometimes invited to lunch by astute authors and are treated to pleasant dishes to cheer them and given good cigars to smoke occasionally somebody ups and discusses the nature of our literary journalism and what sort of a creature the reviewer is dr bliss perry was at this not long ago in the yale review editor for a couple of decades of our foremost literary journal and now a professor in one of our great universities dr perry certainly knows a good deal about various branches of the book business his highly critical review of the reviewing business has somewhat the character of a history that a great general might write of a war a man who had served in the trenches however would give a more intimate picture though of course it would not be as good history i will give an intimate picture of the american reviewer at work today the absurdly young the slightly bald and the elderly with whiskers and of his hard and picturesque trade there is an old man who had devoted a great many years to a close study of engraved gems he embodied the result of his elaborate researches in a learned volume i never had a gem of any kind in my life at the time of which i write i did not have a job a friend of mine who was a professional reviewer and at whose house i was stopping brought home one day this book on engraved gems and told me he had got it for me to review but i said i don't know anything about engraved gems and you see i was very inexperienced i can write only about things that particularly interest me you are a devil of a journalist was my friend's reply you'd better get to work on this right away you studied art didn't you i told the editor you knew all about art and he has to have the article by thursday he instructed me in certain elementary principles of the art of successful reviewing such for example as getting your information out of the book itself and he cautioned me against employing too many quotation marks as the editor did not like that my review of a couple of columns cut a bit here and there by the literary editor appeared in a prominent new york paper speaking quite impartially simply as now a trained judge of these things i will say that it was a very fair review it gave the book as the term is i discovered that i had something of a talent for this work and so it was that i entered a profession which i have followed with diverse vicissitudes for a number of years i became good friends with the literary editor and began to contribute regularly week by week to his paper he liked my style and always gave me a good position in the paper he liked me personally and always put my name to my reviews which was a thing against the rule of the paper that being that only articles by celebrated persons were to be signed 
this is a point sometimes questioned it seems to me that it is a good thing for the reviewer to have his work signed particularly for the young reviewer whose yet ardent spirit craves a place in the sun it contributes to his pleasant conception of reviewing as a fine thing to do it makes him more alive than the anonymous thing he meets people who brighten at the recollection of having read his name i know a man who was a very witty reviewer when he was young that fellow used to get love letters from ladies he had never seen just like a baseball pitcher or a tenor there was a rich man who ate meals at the century club had him there to dinner because he thought him funny he got a note from a literary adviser asking him for a book manuscript and two persons wrote him from san francisco i myself have had courteous letters thanking me from authors here and in england that fellow of whom i just spoke undoubtedly was on the threshold of a brilliant career he was full of courage and laughter though very poor then a great man offered him a position as a literary editor his name ceased to be seen i heard of him after a year and it was said of him that he was dreadfully bald and had a long beard i mean of course metaphorically speaking whether signed reviewers are conducive to honesty i am not sure there was a man i know him well wrote a book on alaska or some such place claimed he had been there there was another man his friend who was a reviewer now the alaskan said to the critic why don't you get my book from the paper i'll write the review i know more about the book than anybody else anyway and you sign it and get the money and this was done and it was an excellent review and the paper which you read every day was no wiser the literary editor who signed my reviews for me was a youth of an independent turn of mind he encouraged the expression in reviews of exactly what one thought he liked an individual note in them he had an enthusiasm for books of literary quality somewhat to the neglect of other branches of the publishing business he gathered about him a group of writers of a spirit kindred to his own and he was rapidly moulding his department of his paper into a thing perhaps a plaything of life and colour but he lacked commercial tact he wanted to make something like the english lighter literary journals he offended the powers behind the man higher up i saw him last on a wednesday he outlined his plans for the future on friday i know he made up his paper saturday i looked for him but he had gone from that place there was in it a dried man of much hard experience of newspapers who reigned in that youth's stead the wrath of authority grinds with exceeding quickness this which i have written is history as many excellent of mind know and would be put into a book for it reveals how close we came to having in this country a literary doings that could be read for pleasure i continued to learn the business sometimes reviewers are poets also i know fifteen sometimes they are irishmen sometimes both i know one who was one of those celtic poets his name had all the colour of the late irish literary movement that is after he became a man of letters before that it was bill something or other he was an earnest person without humour strange for an irishman eloquent very pronounced in his opinions and he had never read anything at all outside of columbia university before he was called to the literary profession later he went into politics and became something at washington some reviewers again are lexicographers i know about a dozen of these ranging in age from twenty-seven years to seventy when they had finished writing the dictionary they joined the army of the unemployed and became reviewers i am acquainted with one reviewer who has been everything almost under the sun a husband a father and a householder he has been successively a socialist an esthete a churchman and a roman catholic he is an eager student of the universe a prodigiously energetic journalist a lively and a humorous writer a person of marked talent he will be thirty shortly 
sometimes reviews are charmingly written by veteran literary men such as for instance mr la gallienne and mr hunnaker dr perry mentions among reviewers a group of seasoned bookmen including mr paul elmer moore and professor frank mather jr mr boynton is another sound workman on the other hand by some papers books are economically given out for review to reporters and again for the same reason to editorial writers and to various editors in america you know practically everybody connected with a newspaper is an editor the man who sits all day in his shirt sleeve smoking a corncob pipe clipping up with large scissors vast piles of newspapers is exchange editor there was a paper for which i worked from morn till dewy eve reviewing books where we used to say that we had an elevator editor and a scrub editor and a nice charwoman she was reviewers of course frequently differ widely in their conceptions of a book i said one time of a book of lady gregory's that it was a highly amusing affair and i gave numerous excerpts in support of my statement i had enjoyed the book greatly it was delightful i thought it was then a bit of a jolt to me to read a lengthy article by another reviewer of the same book who set forth that lady gregory was an extremely serious person with never a smile and who gave copious evidence of this point in quotations each of us made out a perfectly good case now suppose you read in the new york this a daily paper that such and such a book was the best thing of its kind since adam and suppose you found the same opinion to be that of the new york weekly that and of the new york weekly other notwithstanding that the new york something else declared that this was the rottenest book that ever came from the press you would be inclined to accept the conclusion of the majority of critics would you not well i'll tell you this the man who does the fiction week by week for the new york this and for the that and for the other is one and the same industrious person i know him well he has a large family to support which is continually out of shoes and his wife just presented him with a new set of twins the other day he is now trying to add the job on the something else to his list let us farther suppose that you are a magazine editor you wrote this such-and-such such book yourself you are a very disagreeable person we will imagine you rejected three of my stories about my experiences as a vagabond furthermore when i remonstrated with you about this over the telephone you told me that you were very busy when your book came out i happened to review it for three papers i tried to do it justice although i didn't think much of the book or of anything else that you ever did now reflecting upon the vast frailty of human nature and considering the power of the reviewer to exercise petty personal pique i think there is little dishonesty of this nature in reviews the prejudice is the other way round in log rolling as it is called among little cliques of friends though i have known more than one case more or less like that of a reviewer man otherwise fairly well balanced who had a rabid antipathy to the work of havelock ellis whenever he got hold of a book of havelock ellis's he became blind and livid with rage in the period when i was a freelance reviewer i used to review generally only books that i was particularly interested in books on subjects with which i was familiar books by authors whom i knew all about and in writing my reviews i used to wait now and then for an idea those were happy innocent amateur days that is when my thoughts got stalled i would throw myself on a couch for a bit or i would look out of my window or i took a turn about gramercy park for a breath of air reviews sometimes had to be in by the following day or so my editor would declare to me with much vigor over the telephone the paper would go to smash and then he would hold them in type for three weeks but they rarely had to be done within a couple of hours or less in the course of time i got down to brass tacks i took a staff position a desk job it was up to me to review everything going in a steady ceaseless grind 
I began to work at half past nine in the morning. When I was commuting, I began earlier, taking up a book on the train. Between 9.30 and a quarter to 11, I did a book, say on the extermination of the housefly. From then until lunchtime, 300 words on a very pleasant novel called, for instance, Roast Beef Medium. In the afternoon, three quarters of a column on a History of the American Negro. Winding up the day, perhaps, with a lively article about a popular book on submarine diving and lighthouses. And taking home at night the notebooks of Samuel Butler, I began the morrow very likely with an omnibus article lumping together five books on the Panama Canal. And then, as the publishers of the latest book on art had turned in a double column hundred agate line ad the week before, it was necessary to do something serious for that masterpiece. I reviewed a dictionary and a couple of cookery books. At the holiday season I polished off a jumble of Christmas and New Year's cards, a pile of picture calendars, and a table full of juveniles. Women suffrage, alcoholism, new thought, socialism, minor poetry, big game hunting, militarism, athletics, architecture, eugenics, industry, European travel, education, eroticism, red blood fiction, humor, uplift books, white slavery, nature study, aviation, bygone kings and their mistresses, statesmen, scientists, poverty, disease and crime, I had always with me. I became a slightly bald reviewer. Books of theology and of philosophy were given out to a theologian. Books concerning the dramatic art were done by the dramatic critic and those on music went to the music critic. We had an occasional letter from Paris on current French literature. In addition to writing, for I was an editor, I read the literary galley proofs, made up once a week down in the composing room late at night, compiled the feature variously called in different papers, books received, books of the week, or the newest books, and got out the correspondence of the literary department with publishers and with fools who write in about things. I also went over the foreign exchange, that is, clipped literary notes out of foreign papers. Once a month I surveyed the current magazines. I worked in the office on every holiday of the year except Christmas and New Year's, and frequently on Sundays at home. With a view to attracting the intellectual elite to a profession where this class is needed, I will tell you what I got for this. It should be understood, however, that I was with one of the great papers which paid a scale of generous salaries. Mine was forty dollars a week. That is a good deal of money for a literary man to earn regularly, but... I did, indeed, have an assistant in this office. There was a person associated with me who took the responsibility of everything in the department that was excellent. That is, I was assistant literary editor. Few newspapers can afford to employ a chief solely for each department. It is recognized that the work of the literary editor can be economically combined with that of the dramatic editor or with that of the art critic or the art critic runs the Saturday supplement, or some such thing. My chief looked in every day or so, and frequently, perhaps in striving for exact honesty, I should say regularly, contributed reviews. He directed the policy of the department, subject, of course, to criticism from downstairs. But, as I was about to say above, that regular income is very uncertain universities cultivate a sense of security in their professors in order to obtain loyal service and lofty endeavor the editorial tenure as all men know is a house of sand a summer's breeze a wash of the tide and the editor is a refugee i know the editor of literary pages that go far and wide who has held down that job now for over a year that man is troubled, none has ever stood in his shoes for much longer than that. Don't fool yourself, I heard a successful young journalist say the other day to a very conscientious young reviewer. Good work won't get you anything. Play politics. 
office politics all the while doubtless sound advice this for any gainful employment now about that prime department of the press called the business office many people firmly believe that all book reviews and dramatic criticisms and editorials are bought by the interests one of the principal librarians of new york holds this view of reviews i never knew a reviewer who was bound to tell anything but the truth as he saw it nor have i ever written in any review a word that i knew to be false and i believe that few reviewers do because however this or that publishing house was a friend of ours or because the husband of this author used to work for the paper pure sentiment or that one is a friend of the wife of the editor caution it has been suggested to me by my chief that i go easy with certain books the good reviewer does go easy with most books it is a mark of his excellence as a reviewer that he has a catholic taste that he sees that books are written to many standards and that every book almost is meat for some it is not his business to break things on the wheel but to introduce the book before him to its proper audience always recognizing of course sometimes with pleasant subtle irony its limitations it is only when a book pretends to be what it is not that he damns it all that is not business but sensible sensitive criticism to return the business office exerts not a direct but a moral influence so to put it upon the literary department business tact must be recognized a hostile review already in type and in the plan of the next issue may be killed when a large ad announcing books brought out by the publisher of this one so treated comes in for the next paper and then search is made for a book from the same publisher which may be favorably reviewed or a hostile review may be held over until a time more politic for its release say following several enthusiastic reviews and there is no sense in noticing in one issue a disproportionate number of books published by one house in concluding my discussion i will draw two portraits of professional reviewers one composite of a class the other a picture of a man who stands at the top of his profession seated at his desk is a little man with a pointed beard and a large bald spot on top of his head this man has been all his life a literary hack he has read manuscript for publishing houses he has novelized popular plays for halfpenny papers and dramatized trashy novels for cheap producers he has done routine chore writing in magazine offices made translations for pirate publishers and picked up an odd sum now and then by a sunday story he has always been an anonymous writer he has never had sufficient intellectual character to do anything well the downward side of middle age finds him afflicted with various physical ailments entirely dependent upon a precarious position at a moderate salary without influential friends completely disillusioned with a mediocre mind now much fagged devoid of high ambition and with a most unstimulating prospect before him his attitude toward the business of book reviewing is that he wishes he had gone into the tailor business or that his father had left him a grocery store he would not have succeeded however as either a tailor or a grocer as he has even less business than literary ability farther he regards himself as a gentleman and books strike him as being more gentlemanly than trade he has got along as well as he has by bluff about his extensive acquaintance with literature and his long experience in writing and publishing this type of reviewing man says that he does the thing mechanically about the new crop of juvenile books let us say he says the same thing again now that he said four years ago one idea every other paragraph is his principle and he thinks it sufficient in a review sufficient that is to get by and whatever gets by in his view pleases them just as well as anything else 
our friend of this character has a considerable number of stock remarks which may at any time be written very rapidly one of these sentences is this book furnishes capital reading another says that this book is welcome and he holds as a general principle that the reviewer who reads the book is lost occasionally very occasionally there is found among reviewers the type of old-fashioned person who used to be called a man of letters this is a wild dream but it would be a grand thing for american reviewing if every one of our young reviewers could have for an hour each week the moral benefit of the society of such a man i know one who now has been active in new york literary journalism for something like thirty years a fine intellectual figure of a man he makes his living out of this indeed but his interest is in the thing itself in literature he has all that one really needs in the world he has the esteem of the most estimable people and he follows with unceasing pleasure a delightful occupation he is as keen to-day he declares on the right way of putting three words together as he was when he began to write his mellow witty and gentlemanly style is saturated with the sounds scents and colours of literature the exercise of this cultivated judgment is not a trade but a sacred trust to look at him and to think of his admirable career is to realize the dignity of his calling discussing with authority the books of the world as they come from the press end of essay five Essay six of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cordes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay six Literary Levities in London. Now, it's a funny thing that, come to think of it, some folks have questioned whether, the other way round, it could be done in this country at all. It's a pleasant view, anyhow, that the matter presents of that curious affair, the English character there is a notion knocking about over here that considerable rigmarole is required to meet an englishman and very probably few who have tried it would dispute that it is somewhat difficult to meet an ordinary englishman to whom you are not known in a railway carriage with the big uns, however the business appears to be simple enough foolish doings do clutter up one's luggage with letters of introduction when all that is needed to board round with the most celebrated people in england is a glance at a who's who in a public library to get addresses for the purpose of convenience the writer of these souvenirs will refer to himself as i and me i was all done up in health and was advised by doctors to clear out at once so i bought a steamship ticket packed a kit bag crossed the water and took a couple of strolls about that island over there when feeling fitter i turned up in london for a look about it sort of came over me that in my haste of departure i had neglected to bring any of my friends along or to equip myself with the means of making others here i was unarmed so to say a yank in an obviously hostile country this you see was before the war before we and britain had got so genuinely sweet on one another at that time i had two acquaintances resident in london one a bostonian whose attention was quite occupied with a new addition to his family the other was the errand man stationed before my place of abode he was an amiable soul whose companionable nature worldly wisdom and topographical knowledge i much appreciated he instructed me in the culinary subject of a bubble and squeak and many other learned matters but unfortunately his social connections were limited to one class one time not a great deal while back i happened to review in succession for a new york paper several books by hilaire belloc mr belloc had written a note thanking me for these reviews i decided to write mr belloc that i was in london and to ask if he could spare a moment for me to look at him mr belloc being one of my literary passions then an ambitious idea popped into my head i determined to write the same request to all the people in england i had ever reviewed reviewing mostly anonymous had been my business for several years with other literary chores on the side 
i communicated to mr chesterton the fact that i had come over to look about told him my belief that he was one of the noblest and most interesting monuments in england and asked him if he supposed that he could be viewed by me at some street corner say at a time appointed as he rumbled past in his triumphal car writing to famous people that you don't know is somewhat like the drink habit it is easy to begin it is pleasurably stimulating it soon fastens itself upon you to the extent that it is exceedingly difficult to stop indulgence and it leads you straight to excess i wound up i think with hugh walpole i had liked that fortitude thing very much my englishized boston friend he's the worst englishman i saw over there simply threw up his hands he groaned and fell into a chair holy cat he cried or english words to that effect you can't come over here and do that way it's not done he declared you can't meet englishmen in that fashion these people will think you are a wild bounding red indian they'll all go out of town until you leave the country well i saw it was awfully bad i had disgraced the u s a that's what comes of having crude notions about meeting people i felt pretty cheap i felt sorry for my friend too because he had to stay there where he lived and try to hold his head up while i could slink off back home my friend pointed out to me that mr chesterton and the other gentlemen had only my word for it that i had any connection with literature and that as far as they were aware i might be the worst kind of crook and at the very best was in all likelihood a very great bore annie the maid in my lodgings handed me a bunch of mail mr belloc was particularly eager to see me he said he gave me an intimate two-page account of his movements for the past couple of weeks or so he had just been out to sea in his boat the nona and had only got back after a good deal of difficulty outside this he hoped would account for the delay of a day or so in his reply during the whitsundays he had to travel about england to see his children at their various schools and after that he had to go to settle again about his boat where she lay in a welsh port then he must speak at eton he would be available however at the beginning of the next week when he hoped i would take a meal with him perhaps he could be of some use in acquainting me with england it would be such a pleasure to meet me and so on very nice attitude for a man so slightly acquainted with one mr chesterton wished to thank me for my letter and to say that he would be pleased if i cared to come down to spend an afternoon with him at beaconsfield mr walpole apologized very greatly for seeming so curtly inhospitable but he was only in london for a short time and had difficulty in squeezing his engagements in this week too was infernally complicated by ascot but couldn't i come round on monday to lunch with him at his club mr chesterton is a grand man smokes excellent cigars but first as you come up the hill from the railway station toward the old part of the village and to the little house over roads you enter as like as not as i did a gate set in a pleasant hedge and you knock at a side door to the mirth later of mrs chesterton this agreeable entrance is that for tradesmen the way you should have gone in is round somewhere on another road a maid admits you to a small parlour and in a moment mrs chesterton comes in to inquire if you have an appointment with her husband she always speaks of mr chesterton as my husband it develops that the letter you sent fixing the appointment got balled up in some way it further develops that a good many things connected with mr chesterton's life and house get balled up mrs chesterton's line seems to be to keep things about a chaotic husband as straight as possible mr chesterton is a very fat man his portraits i think hardly do him sufficient honour in this respect he has a remarkably red face and a smallish moustache lightish in colour against this background his expression is extraordinarily innocent he looks like a monstrous infant a tumbled mane tops him off he sits in his parlour in a very small chair did i write him when i was coming wonder what became of the letter doesn't remember it perhaps it is in his dressing-gown has a habit of sticking things that interest him into the pocket of his dressing-gown where do you suppose is his dressing-gown ah, however no matter have a cigar do have a cigar wonder where my cigars are 
where are my cigars mrs chesterton locates them now about that poem the inn at the end of the world or some such thing he is inclined to think that he did write it but he cannot remember where it was published now he has lost his glasses ridiculously small glasses which he has been continually attempting to fix firmly upon his nose slapping yourself about the chest is an excellent way to find glasses well it is very flattering to be told that one is so well known in america but so he had heard before describes himself as a philosophical journalist did not know that there was an audience in america for his kind of writing wonders whether democracy is carried on there on such a gigantic scale can keep right on successfully admits a division between our two peoples trenches have been dug between us he declares rises to a remark about the englishman's everlasting garden he likes to have a little fringe about him he says and then tells a little story which one might say contains all the elements of his art when he first came to beaconsfield mr chesterton said the policemen used to touch their helmets to him until he told them to stop it because he said he felt that rather he should touch his hat to the policemen saluting the colours as it were he explained for he added are they not officers of the king mr chesterton apologized for being as he put it excessively talkative this was occasioned he said by worry and fatigue i declined to stay for tea as i noticed a chugging car awaiting in front of the house you must come to see me again said the grand young man of england the last i saw of him he was rolling through his garden tossing his mane the famous garden that rose up and hit him you remember at the time of his unfortunate fall fine time i had with young walpole those english certainly have the drop on us in the matter of clubs they live about in the haunts beloved of thackeray and everybody else you ever heard of pleasant place the garrick something like our players but better slick collection of old portraits fine busts there of will shakespeare found bottled up in some old passage fashionable young man walpole i can't remember exactly whether or not he had on all these things but he's the sort that if he had on nothing would look as if he had silk topper spats buttonhole bouquet asked me if i had yet been to ascot oh you must go to ascot buys his cigarettes in that english way in bulk not by the box stuff some in your pocket he said won't you have a whisky and soda difficult person to talk with as the only english he knows is the king's english i was endeavouring to explain that i had left new york rather suddenly i just beat it you know i said you uh, beat it said mr walpole yes i just up and skidooed you you, you skidooed i saw that i would have to talk like john milton sure i said i left without much preparation and then we spoke of some writer i do not care for i don't get him i said you don't get him inquired mr walpole no i said i can't see him at all you can't see him queried mr walpole more milton i perceived i quite fail i said to appreciate the gentleman's writings mr walpole got that fortitude had done him very well the idea of russia had always fascinated him he had enough money to run him for a couple of years and he was leaving shortly for russia is there any one here you would like me to help you see he asked queer way for a gentleman to treat a probable crook have you met mr james walpole was very strong with mr james it seemed read aloud a letter just received from mr james which he had been fingering to show that his informal epistolary style was identical with that of his recent autobiographical writings which we had been discussing bennett of course you you should see arnold bennett great friend of walpole's and mrs belloc landowns said mr walpole you really must know her knows as much about the writing game as any one in england i'll write those three letters to-night suddenly he asked me if i were married all americans are was his comment he had to be going some stupid affair he said for the evening we walked together around into the strand 
well good-bye said mr walpole extending his hand i've got to beat it now there was an awesome sort of place where thackeray went you remember where he was scared of the waiters this probably was not the reform club as he was very much at home there and loved the place however just the outside of this mausoleum in pell-mell scared mr hopkinson smith who had been inside a few clubs here and there and who spoke in a sketch of london of its forbidding aspect a great square sullen mass of granite frowning at you from under its heavy browed windows an aloof stately cold and unwelcome sort of place an aristocratic functionary probably a superannuated member of parliament placed me under arrest at the door and in a vast marble pillared hall i was held on suspicion to await the arrival of mr belloc a large brawny man he is with massive shoulders a prize-fighter's head a fine clean-shaven face and a bull neck somehow he suggested to me though i do not clearly remember the picture the portrait of william blake by thomas phillips r a in the national portrait gallery frequently reproduced in books he gives your hand a hearty wrench turns and strides ahead of you into another room you and small boys in buttons with cards and letters on platters to whom he pays no attention trot after him a driving forceful dominating character apparently looks at his watch frequently perpetually up and down from town he says and continually rushing about london keen on the job evidently all the while he does not know how far you are acquainted with england there is a wonderful lot of things to be seen in the island tells you all sorts of unusual places to go how somewhere in the north you can walk along a roman wall for ever so long a wonderful experience makes your head spin he knows so much that you never thought of about england discussing a tremendous meeting later on where all the literary nobility of london are to be with you he follows you down the steps when you go later forgets in the crush of his affairs all about this arrangement then sends you telegrams and baskets full of letters of apology with further invitations here you are sir all the winners one penny this had been the cry of the news lad but the week before england's a fight here you are sir britain at war suddenly they began to yell through the streets it was not an hour now i felt to trouble englishmen with my petty literary adventures also i became a refugee to some extent and well i beat it back home again this was the only way i knew as a neutral then to serve the countries at war End of Essay 6essay seven of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay seven henry james himself we have now to record an extraordinary adventure our later education was derived in some considerable measure from the writings of mr henry james this to explain our emotion we had never expected to behold himself the illustrious expatriate who had so far enlightened an unkempt mind but the night before we had been talking of him indeed it is impossible for us to fail to perceive here something of the supernatural but behold william edwards says a newspaper notice who used to drive a post stage between new york and albany died on saturday at his home he was born in albany and so and so and many were the stories he had to tell of incidents connected with the famous men who were his passengers even so we were ourselves a clerk that is for a number of years we waited on customers in a celebrated bookshop this is one of the stories we have to tell of the personages who were so to say our passengers or perhaps we are more in the nature of those unscrupulous english footmen to high society of whom we have heard who sell out their observation and information to the society press anyhow we are of a loquacious gossipy turn and we were booksellers so to speak to crowned heads we have recently heard too of another precedent to our garrulous performance the publication in rome of the memoirs of an old waiter who carefully set down the relative liberality of prominent persons whom he served 
after having served cardinals rampolla and mary de Vall, this excellent memorist entered opposite their names both no good with this we drop the defensive we noticed mr wharton sitting down his legs crossed smoking a cigar awaiting we presumed his wife a not unpicturesque figure tall rather dashing in effect ruddy visage dragoon moustache and habited in a light smartly cut sack suit of rather arresting checks conspicuous grey spats a gentleman manifesting no interest whatever in his surroundings mr brownell the critic entered through the front door and moved to the elevator there stepped from the elevator car a somewhat portly little man who joined mr wharton he wore a rather queer-looking very big derby hat oddly flat on top his shoulders were hooped up somewhat like the figure of joseph Shote, a rather funny square box-like body on little legs an english look to his clothes under his arm an odd-looking club of a walking-stick mr brownell turned quickly to this rather amusing though not undistinguished figure and said mr james brownell the quaint gentleman took off his big hat discovering to our intense curiosity a polished bald dome and began instantly to talk very earnestly steadily in a moderately pitched voice gesticulating with an even rhythmic beat with his right hand raised close to his face joined presently by mrs wharton the party bidding mr brownell adieu took a somewhat humorous departure we felt from the shop mr james with some suddenness preceding out the door moving nimbly up the avenue he was overhauled by mrs wharton under full sail who attached herself to his arm her husband by an energetic forward play around the end achieved her other wing in this formation sticks flashing skirt whipping with a somewhat spirited mien the august spectacle receded from our rapt view to be at length obliterated as a unit by the general human scene we saw mr james after this a number of times accompanied again by mrs wharton and later in the charge such was the effect of another lady who we understood drives regularly to her social chariot literary lions in something like six years observation of the human being in a bookshop we have never seen any person so thoroughly in a bookstore a magazine that is of books as mr james one can be you know it is most common indeed in a bookstore and at the same time not in a bookstore any more than if one were in a hotel lobby mr james snooked around the shop he ran his nose over the tables and inch by inch he must be very short-sighted along the walls stood on tiptoe and pulled down volumes from high places rummaged in dark corners was apparently oblivious of the presence of anything but the books he was not the slightest in a hurry he would have been we felt content and quite happy like a child with blocks to play this way by himself all day happening by our close proximity to turn to us the first time in the shop that he required attention upon each succeeding visit he sought out us to attend to his wishes the position of retail salesman on the floor is one completely exposed to every human attitude and humour against arrogance against contempt of himself as a shop person a species of counter jumper against irascibility against bigoted ignorance against an indissoluble assumption perhaps logical that he is of inferior mentality this factotum has no defence his very business is to meet all with amenity it is his daily portion included in the material with which he works it he finds injures him not essentially it ceases to particularly affect him beyond his inward appraisement of the character before him toward him one acts simply in accordance with the instincts of one's nature his status counsels no constraint invites no display has no property of stimulation thus the view of a famous man's character from the position of a retail clerk is valuable mr james's manner with mr brownell would hardly be the same as toward us 
but it was exactly there was present in his mind at the moment was quite apparent absolutely no consciousness of any distance of mind or position between him and us he sought conversation any suggestion of so equalizing a thing as conversation with a clerk is not uncommonly repressed by the important as preposterous in his own talk with us he seemed to us to be a man consciously striving with the material of words and sentences to express his thought as well as he could he was very earnest he looked up at us constantly we are a little tall with fixed concentration of gaze and moved his hand to and fro as though seeking to balance his ideas he asked questions with deference among other things he desired very much to know what percent of the novels on the fiction table was the product of writers in england i live in england myself he said very simply and i am curious to know this he expressed a little impatience at the measureless flood of mediocre fiction making a fluttering gesture conveying a sense of impotence to give it attention he barely glanced at the pile of his own book and did not mention it he did not seem at first though we believe later he changed this opinion to think highly of arnold bennett this was at the first bloom of mr bennett's vogue here nor to have read him oh yes yes he is an english journalist in a tone as though merely a journalist clear artist in fibre when he took his departure he bade us good day and lifted his hat succeeding visits caused us to suspect that mr james's ideas of the machinery of business are somewhat naive he seemed to regard us as so to say the whole works it entered our head that maybe mr james thought we received and answered all manner of correspondence editorial as well as that connected with the retail business opened up in the morning read accepted and rejected manuscript nailed up boxes for shipment swept out the shop and were acquainted perfectly with all confidential matters of the house i wrote you uh, us you know he said and he referred by the way apparently upon the assumption that the matter had been laid before us to business of which we could not possibly have cognizance and then he desired to send some books fumbling in his breast pocket he produced a letter from which he read aloud a list of his own works apparently requested of him carefully replacing his letter he said i should like to send these books to my sister-in-law with that he started out now it was not a difficult problem to assume that this could be no other than mrs william james still it is customary for purchasers to state the name of the person to whom goods are to go and many people are skeptical that the salesman has it down right even then your sister-in-law mr james is we suggested oh yes of course of course mrs william james of course of course mr james said now certainly he supposed it was evident he had got finally settled a difficult and complicated piece of business mrs william james's regular address we might reasonably infer still it might be that she was at the moment somewhere else on a visit it were better to have mr james give his order in the regular way and the address we mentioned oh, oh yes uh, yes uh, of course of course mr james said apologetically then pausing a moment to see if there was anything more in his bewildering labyrinth of details to such a complex transaction he departed taking as he drew away his hat as mrs nickleby says completely off instead of ascending directly to that regal domain which is unaware of our existence mr james with the inclination of a bow approached us one day and inquired in a manner as though the decision rested largely with us whether he could see the head of the firm the lady who was his escort swept past him oh i am sure he will see him she declared this with impressive awe is mr james had we said no right off the bat so to say like that we believe unchampioned mr james would have gently withdrawn end of essay seven essay eight of walking stick papers by robert cortez holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Essay 8. Memories of a Manuscript I was born in Indiana. That was several years ago, and I have since seen a good deal of the world. I was reading in a newspaper the other day of a new film which shows on the screen the innumerable adventures of a book in the making, from the time the manuscript is accepted to the point where the completed volume is delivered into the hands of the reader. And it struck me that the intimate life of a manuscript before it is accepted might be even more curious to a general public. The career of many an obscure manuscript, I reflected, doubtless is much more romantic than its character. I wonder why, I said, manuscripts have all been so uncommonly reticent concerning themselves. But manuscripts, one recollects, have sensitive natures, and their experiences, at least the experiences of those not born to a great name, could hardly be called flattering to their feelings. Indeed, manuscripts suffer much humiliation, doubtless little suspected of the world, and it requires a manuscript strong in the spirit of detachment to lay bare its heart. My parent, manuscripts commonly have but one parent, bore me great love. Indeed, I think he loved me beyond everything else in the world. He was a young man, apprenticed to the law, but he cared more for me, I think, than for his calling, which I suspect he decidedly neglected for my sake. I know that in his family he was held a rather disappointing young man, but his family did not know the fervor of his heart or the tenacity of purpose of which he was capable. He toiled over my upbringing for two years, and often and often into the very small hours. I think I was never altogether absent from his thoughts, even when he was abroad about his business or his pleasure. I was his first manuscript, his first, that is, that ever grew up, and though I know he was not ashamed but very proud of me, he attempted to keep my existence somewhat of a secret. I could not but feel that as I developed I was a great happiness to him, and yet at times he would give way to black discouragement about me. I know that I have passages which caused him intense pain to bring about. Throughout the time of my growth, my dear parent alternated between periods of high exultation and of keen torture. As time passed, he became more and more completely absorbed in me. When my climax came into sight, he fell to working upon me with exceeding fury, and in the construction of my climax it was plain that he wrestled with much agony, an agony, however, which seemed to be a kind of strange, mad joy. And then one night, I remember a storm raged without, my parent came to me with a wild yet happy light on his face. He pounded at me harder than ever before, and at intervals paced the floor up and down, up and down, like a man demented, throwing innumerable half-smoked cigarettes over everywhere. The wind blew, and the little frame house strained and groaned in its timbers. As he bent over me, a face enwrapped, striking the keys with a quick, nervous touch, great tears started from my dear parent's eyes. Then, it must have been near dawn, and the little room hung and swayed in a golden fog of tobacco smoke, I knew that I was finished. My parent was bending over my last page like a six-day bicycle racer over his machine, when he straightened up, raised his hands, and drove his right fist into his left palm. "'Done!' he cried, and started from his chair to pace the room in such a frenzy as I had never seen him in before. It was fully half an hour before his excitement abated, when he fell back into his chair and smoked incessantly until the light of morning paled our lamp. At length I noticed he had ceased to smoke his head gradually slipped backward, his eyes closed, and he slept. Thus I was born and brought up and grew to manuscripts estate in a little middle western town on a rented typewriter. One day shortly after this I was packed up with great care and very carefully addressed, and under my parents' arm I boarded an interurban car. We flew over the friendly-looking Hoosier landscape, and at length rolled into the interurban station of the bustling capital, the largest city I had as yet seen. 
i did not see much of it however on this first visit as we went quickly around the handsome soldiers monument to the office of the american express company on meridian street i was given over in charge of a man there who very briskly weighed me and asked my parent my value my parent seemed to be in a good deal of a dilemma as to this he hemmed and hawed and finally replied well i hardly know is its value inestimable inquired the clerk why in a way i guess you might say it is said my parent finally against the clerk's mounting impatience an estimate was effected and i was declared to be worth five hundred dollars i was cast carelessly on to a pile of other packages of various shapes and sizes and my parent giving me a farewell lingering look of love went out the door of my journey there is not much to say i arrived in new york amid a prodigious crush of packages and was delivered in company with about a dozen others which i knew to be a brother or rival manuscripts at the office of a great publishing house here i was signed for and in the course of the day unwrapped i was ticketed with a number and my title and placed in a tall cabinet where i remained in the society of several shelves full of other manuscripts for a number of days here i was delighted to find quite a coterie of fellow hoosiers but a remarkable proportion of my associates i discovered was from the south the majority of us hailed from small towns in our company were three or four of somewhat distinguished lineage as time passed and nothing happened i grew somewhat nervous as i knew with what anxiety my dear parent in indiana would be counting the days one of my new-found friends a portly manuscript a story of sponge fishers that had been out of the cabinet and had had a reading before my arrival told me in the way of gossip something of the situation at the moment in this house my friend was an old campaigner very ragged and battered in appearance and had been i was appalled to hear submitted to seventeen publishing houses before arriving here it had lost all hope of any justice in the publishing world and was very cynical heavens would i however it appeared that at this house the first reader had just been obliged to take a vacation owing to ill health occasioned by too assiduous application to her task of attempting to keep somewhere abreast of the incoming flood of manuscripts she was it seems a large elderly lady who had tried out her own talents as a novelist without marked success some twenty years ago her niece a miss of twenty or so who had a fancy for an editorial career and who had vainly been seeking a situation of this character for some time found a windfall in the instant need for a substitute first reader it was with some petulance it struck me that she yanked the door open one day she was apparently showing someone about her office all that she said waving her hand toward my case practically untouched and mountains besides i don't know how i'm going to get away with it i suppose i'll have to do a couple every night i don't know what time it was but the light was going and the young lady had got into bed when she began to read me propped up against her knees she yawned now and then and sighed repeatedly as she shifted back my pages i thought i noticed that her knees swayed just perceptibly at times then suddenly my support sank to one side i started to slide and would have plunged to the floor very nearly pulling her after me if the disturbance had not as suddenly caught the young lady back into wild consciousness and she grabbed me and her knees and the slipping bedclothes all in a lump shortly after this she turned back to see how i ended and then went to sleep comfortably lights out i did not see the report the young lady wrote of me but i had occasion to think that she declared i was rather stupid however i got another reading i was given next to a young man not so i understood a regular reader but a member of the advertising department who was frequently called on to help weed out manuscript who took me home with him and threw me onto a couch littered with books and papers here i stayed for ever so long one day i heard the young man say to his wife nodding toward me 
I ought to try to get that unfortunate thing off my hands before my vacation, but I never seem to get around to it. As a lack a day, he did not get around to me before that occasion. I went, packed in the bottom of a trunk, with the young man and his wife on their annual holiday. In my pitchy jail I had, of course, no means of calculating the flight of time. But when I next saw the light, after what seemed to me an interminable spell, I appeared to be the occasion of some excitement. The young man brought me up after several vigorous dives into the bottom of the trunk, as his wife was saying with much energy, "'Well, of course you can do as you please, but if I were you, I'd telegraph an answer right straight back that I did not propose to spend my vacation working for them. The idea! After all you do!' "'Oh, well,' was the young man's reply, "'some poor dog of an author wrote that thing, and it's only right that he should have some kind of an answer within a reasonable time. I ought to have got around to it long ago.' Whatever the kind-hearted young man may have said about me, I was given yet another chance. A very businesslike chap took a shot at me, as he expressed it, one forenoon at his desk. I was considerably distressed, however, by the confusion and the multiplicity of interruptions to which his attention to me was subject. When I thought of the sacred privacy devoted to my creation, the whole-hearted consecration of my dear parents' life-blood to my being, I felt that such a reading was little short of criminally unjust. And how could anyone be expected to savor my power and my charm in the midst of such distractions? The business-like chap sat somewhere near the middle of a vast floor ranged with desks. In his immediate neighborhood a score or more of typewriters were clicking and perhaps half as many telephones were going. The chap's own telephone rang, it seemed to me, every five or six pages, and resting me the while on his knee, he expectantly awaited the outcome of his secretary's answering conversation. At frequent intervals he was consulted by colleagues as to this and that. Covers, jackets, electros, full catalogues, what not. Nevertheless, he got through me in rather brisk order. At my conclusion, I observed no tears in his eyes, and it was evident he settled my hash, as the phrase is, at this house. I certainly felt sick at heart in that express car back to the corn belt. My poor parent, when I again met him, unwrapped me very tenderly and sat for a long time turning me through very dully. I stayed on his desk for several days, and then fared forth again on my quest, valued this trip at a hundred dollars. After the initial formalities, I fell this time first into the hands of a driving sort of fellow who had the air of being perpetually up to his neck in work, and who handed me to his wife with the remark, "'Here's another job for you tomorrow. Make a careful working synopsis of the story, and I'll dip into the manuscript here and there when I come home to get a line on the style and general character of the thing.' The next night, after rustling energetically through me, he wrote out his report, and passing it to his wife, said, "'There are no outright misstatements of fact as to the plot in that, are there?' I next fell in the way of a fashionable character just leaving for a weekend, who read me in the smoking car on his way up into the country. He burned several holes in my pages with the falling ash of his cigarettes. He read me in bits between scraps of conversation with his seat neighbor and recesses of enjoyment of the flying scenery. And he found it rather awkward, holding me balanced on his legs, crooked up against the seat in front of him. This, my precarious position, led to a grievous calamity. I toppled and fell, and my reader, making a swooping clutch at me as I went, but the more scattered my pages over the polluted floor of the car. An evil draft carried my third page underneath a seat, the third forward from my reader. It was an anguishing thing, but I could not cry out, I could not tell him. As my reader, cursing me heartily, for what I cannot admit was my fault, gathered me up, he neglected to crawl far enough under the seat before him to perceive my page three. 
but it does not fall within the scope of my present design to extend this chronicle to the length of an autobiography with what pain and labor my poor parent recovered from his memory and then very imperfectly of course my third page how he grew more melancholy of countenance at each of my successive returns to the house of my birth and formative years how i sometimes remained away for months at a time and how once an office boy misaddressed me to a lady in new jersey who very graciously herself forwarded me to my parent how my poor parent was obliged at length by the increasing dilapidation of my appearance to go to the expense of having me completely retyped by a public typist and how directly after this he entirely rewrote expanded and elaborated me at the instigation of one firm of publishers how i was read by a delightful old lady who knitted in her office as she read by a lady of cosmopolitan mien who had me together with many other manuscripts sent to her home in a box and who consumed innumerable cigarettes as she perused me by a young gentleman who i am sure had a morning hangover at his desk by a tough-looking customer who wore his hat at his desk by a young lady of futurist aspect who took me home to her studio by an old old man who seemed to see me quite and by many more all this i may merely indicate one very striking phenomenon i should by no means fail to mention and this uncanny fact may be illustrated thus if an object is blue or if it is yellow it will be recognized by all men as being blue or yellow as the case may be one will not say of it see that lurid yellow object to have another reply what that object directly before us i see nothing yellow about it it is as black as ink but i was apparently exactly like some such an impossible object i was figuratively speaking no color of my own and i was all colors one so to speak saw me as green another as white and yet another as orange while some saw quite red as they looked at me that is my character consisted altogether it seemed in the amazingly diverse reactions i inspired in my successive readers i was intolerably dull i was abundantly entertaining i was over subtle i was painfully obvious i was exceedingly humorous and i lacked all humor how at length a group of editorial gamblers succeeded in coming sufficiently into harmony about me to render a composite verdict that i should be a fair publishing risk but how the title my poor parent had given me it was unanimously held wouldn't do at all and how i got another in book committee meeting how after i was wonderful thing accepted i lay in a safe until i thought i should crumble away with age and how i was suddenly brought forth and hastily read by the manufacturing department for ideas for my cover to be and then by the advertising department for copy dope before being rushed to the composing room of these things i have not time to speak further as i am now on the press and am rapidly ceasing to be merely a manuscript End of Essay 8essay nine of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay nine you are an american lavender sweet lavender who will buy my sweet blooming lavender buy it once you'll buy it twice and make your clothes sweet and nice she was a wretched-looking creature with a great basket and it was so she sang through the street by this you know where we are for this is one of the old cries of london town for the sake of my clothes and for the noble pleasure of associating for an instant with the original of a colored print of old london types i bought a sprig of lavender thank you sir she said i saw it coming ah, yeah by now i knew she would you are an american sir she added eyeing me with interest you would think that since the american invasion first began ever so long ago some time after dicky davis discovered london 
they the british would have seen enough of us to have become accustomed to us by now but as you have found it is not so we are a strange race from over the sea you are an american sir said the barmaid she was a huge young woman who could have punched my head in and i am not so delicate either and she had a pug nose i do not so much care for american ladies she said i think they are a bit hard don't you then perhaps feeling that she may have offended me she quickly added not of course that i doubt that there are maiden-like ladies in america they are a curious people these english with their nice ideas even among barmaids of the grace of a mellow society for some time i could not understand why she was so beautiful then i perceived that it was because of her nose she looked just like the goddesses of the elgin marbles whose noses are broken you know still i doubt whether it would be a good idea for a man to break his wife's nose in order to make her more beautiful i will grave her name here on the tablet of fame so that when you go again to london you may be able to see her it is elizabeth he was a cat's meat man and on his arm he carried a basket in which was a heap of bits of horse flesh such as i have been told it is each on a sliver of stick there was a little dog playing about near by would you care to treat that dog to a halfpenny worth of meat sir asked the man i had never before treated a dog to anything though treating is an american habit so i set up the dog to a halfpenny worth of meat thank you sir said the cat's meat man i saw by the light come into his eyes that he had recognized me you are he began i know it i said i am i looked at the wretched dog would he too accuse me but he ate his meat and said never a word perhaps he was not an englishman no i think he was a tourist too like myself i was glad i had befriended him in an alien land what is the price of this i asked threepence i inquired reading a sign three pence announced the attendant very distinctly it was but his way of saying you are an american i went into an office to see a man i know how are you i said in my democratic way to the very small office boy you are looking better than when i saw you last i remarked with pleasant home humor i never saw you before sir replied the office boy he is an american i heard him apologizing for me tell the typist some considerable while after this i went to this office again i'd quite forgotten the office boy i handed him my card a bright lad he i'm feeling much better sir he said in pall mall there is a steamship office in the window of which is displayed a miniature sheet of water at opposite sides of this little ocean are small dabs of clay one labeled england the other america tiny ships ply back and forth between the two countries observers cannot make out how it is that these little boats turn about as they do apparently of their own accord and the scene has continually a number of spectators this was before the war one day i was looking in at this window very much interested in this problem standing next to me was a fine specimen of a pelmelian with his silk topper his black tail-coat his buttonhole his checked trousers his large gray spats his shining boots his stick and his glass on its ribbon apparently equally absorbed i turned to him after a bit a quite natural thing to do i thought and how the deuce do you suppose that thing works i said the tall gentleman slowly turned slowly stiffly with an aristocratic gesture he raised his arm and placed his glass in his eye for a moment i was frozen by his blank stare quite through then he lifted his eyebrow the glass dropped and bounded before him on its ribbon and he turned and walked away walked away i dare say to his frowning club to tell how he had just been set upon in the street and insulted by some strange ruffian but you see i didn't know i was an american to epsom i went in a cart to see the derby it was at epsom you know that the king's horse was thrown several seasons ago by a suffragette who lost her life in the act 
well most of the fine gentlemen of england i think were there all in splendid tall grey hats and with their field glasses slung over their shoulders and a horde of the cleverest crooks in europe also there i had my pocket cut by a pickpocket that is the way they go through you in england neatly lift your pocket out i thought this was an interesting thing so i told it about that i had had my pocket cut but i did not see any international significance in the affair the achievement however i discovered was much relished by my hearers in england i an american had come over there and had my pocket cut he the crook an englishman very probably had been cuter than i he had had me an american it is a curious thing and a fact not generally known i believe that all decayed taxicab drivers in london those who are unfortunate have fallen from a high estate each and every one of them used to drive the london to oxford coach in the days of horses i met a number of these personages fat with remarkably red faces and large honeycombed noses not at all like the alert athletic lads a type of mechanical engineer who have arisen as cabbies with the advent of taxis what do they know about horses it was such an old boy who drove me from the neighbourhood of russell square where i was stopping to chelsea where i went into lodgings he frequently had the pleasure of driving americans he remarked thank you sir he said i required to have my shoes repaired and i inquired of my landlord where might be found a good cobbler he told me that there was an excellent one in battersea in battersea i said is there none in chelsea how am i to get my shoes clear over to battersea why he replied we will send the cobbler a card and he'll send someone over for the boots and and then i suppose i said he will send us another card saying that the boots are done and so on and in the meantime i could have had the boots repaired and worn out again naturally i was for wrapping up the shoes in a piece of newspaper and setting out straight off to find the cobbler but my landlord would not hear of such a thing at all of course you are an american he said i gathered that while such a proceeding might be all right in my country it wouldn't do in england he did not want lodgers i understood going in and out of his house with parcels under their arms it would reflect on him he was a man with a lively mind and he told me a little story how do you like the new lodger asked the first housemaid of the second oh he's very nice indeed replied the second housemaid but he's not a gentleman he helped me carry the coals upstairs yesterday could you spare me a trifle sir asked the errand man in my street i haven't had tea to-day it's a funny thing that isn't it our just being all americans when we are not referred to as yankees or yanks we are never united statesians it is the american ambassador and the american consul general i have even heard dr wilson referred to as the president of america one day i saw a tourist he was an american a young man i knew in new york i found him going into the houses of parliament i was fond of going in there frequently and said i would accompany him with an easy stride at a speed i should say of about two miles an hour he walked straight through the houses of parliament through the norman porch through the king's robing room the royal or victoria gallery the prince's chamber the sumptuously decorated house of peers the peers lobby the spacious central hall the commons corridor and the house of commons glancing about him the while at art and architecture lavish magnificence and the eternal garments and symbols of history returning to the central hall we passed through st stephen's and westminster hall and arrived again at the street how long did it take us to do that said my friend questioning his watch oh about fifteen minutes i replied he said he thought he would go across the way and do the abbey next while he was in the neighbourhood i suppose i could have helped him in the matter of dispatch but i didn't think of it at the time later i heard of two americans who drove up to the abbey in a taxi leaping out one said to the other you do the outside and i'll do the inside and that way will save a lot of time the thing a man does in america of course when he gets into a railroad train is to light a cigar and begin talking to the fellow next to him 
There were two of us in the railway carriage compartment on my way down into Surrey. I made a number of amiable observations. I asked a number of pleasant questions. My object was to while away the time in human companionship. Quite so, was his reply to observations. In replying to questions, he would commit himself to nothing. He wouldn't even say that he didn't know. I shouldn't undertake to say, sir, was his answer. And then, certainly, there was no possibility of pursuing the subject further. He wasn't reading a paper. He wasn't doing anything but gaze straight in front of him. I concluded that he was sore at me. I concluded that he was a surly bear, anyway, and so an hour or so passed in utter silence. The pretty landscape whirled by. We went through a hundred tunnels, more or less. The little engine gave a shrill little squeak now and then. At old, old railway stations, that remind one agreeably of jails, rough-looking men in black shirt-sleeves and corduroy waistcoats ran out to the train to open the carriage doors, and I forgot the gentleman altogether, till at length we came to his station. When he had got out, he turned to latch the door, and putting his head in at the window, he said to me in the pleasantest manner possible, "'Good afternoon, sir.' He wasn't sore at me a bit. That was simply his fashion of travelling. In silence. I was going into the countryside to the country places where the old men have pleasant faces and the maidens quiet eyes. To fare forth upon the king's highway, to hedgerows and blossoms and the old lanes of merry England, to mount again the old red hills, bird-enchanted, and dip the valleys bright with sward, to the wind on the heath, brother to hills and the sea, to lonely downs, to hold converse with simple shepherd men, and when even fell the million tented to seek some ancient inn for warmth in the ingle-nook, and bite and drop, and where, when the last star-lamp in the valley had expired, I would rest my weary bones until the sweet choral of morning birds called me on my way. There was an ancient character going along the road. He walked with a staff, a crooked stick. His coatless habit was the color of clay. His legs were bound about just below the knee by a strap, wherein, at one side, he carried his pipe, so that his trousers flared at the bottom like a sailor's. Over his shoulder he bore a flat straw basket. Under his chin were whiskers, his eyes were merry and bright, and his cheeks just like fine rosy apples, with a great high light on each. I asked of him the way, and we trudged along together. "'You are from Merisee,' he said, with delight. He told me about himself. He was seventy-four, and he had never had a single schooling in his life. Capel was his home, a village of about twenty houses, which we were approaching, thirty miles or so from London. The last time he had been to London was when he was fifteen. He had then seen some fireworks there. No fireworks in Capel, he said, had ever been able to touch him since. He had been pushing on, he said, pushing on, pushing on all the while. You were not born in Capel then, I said. Born in Capel? Why, he had been born seven miles from Capel. The difficulty was that I had overlooked the fact that everybody goes out of London town at Whitsuntide. Village and county town I tried, and could not find where to lay my head. Everything was, as they say in England, full up. It was coming on to rain, and the night fell chill and black. Would I have to use my rucksack for a pillow and sleep in the fields? At length I found a man, it was at quaint Godalming, I think, where the famous Charterhouse School is, who could not give me a room, but offered me a bed and breakfast at half a crown. There's another fellow up there, he said, but he's a nice and quiet fellow, something like yourself, he said. I think you'll like him. You are an American, remarked my landlord. I sat with him in his little parlour behind the bar. It had a gun over the mantelpiece, a great deal of painted china, and a group of stuffed birds in a glass case. He asked me if I liked reading, because if I did, he had an old dictionary to which I was welcome at any time. At length it was the hour for bed. I followed my heavy host with his candle up difficult stairs. I think they're all asleep, he said. They're all asleep, I exclaimed. 
Who are? Why, replied my landlord, there are five of them, you know. But they are nice quiet fellows, something like yourself, he added. I think you will like them. In that shadowed, gabled room were the noises of many sunk in slumber. Well, they were, I found in the morning, rather inoffensive young fellows, all cyclists, and indeed not altogether unlike myself. It was after my bacon and eggs that I found on my way a place for a wash-and-brush-up tuppence. "'Traveller, sir?' inquired the publican, in response to my knock and peering cautiously out at his door. For it was Sunday, after three o'clock in the afternoon, and not yet six, and to obtain refreshment at a public-house at that hour one must be a traveller over three miles' journey. "'I'm a traveller, all the way from the USA,' said I. I stood my battered shilling ash-stick in a corner, and looked out again from my window over the old red roofs, and at the back of the house where he dwelt, who, when the Queen had commanded his presence, said, "'I'm an old man, ma'am, and I'll take a seat.' When Annie, the maid, had brought my shaving-water, sir, in a kind of a tin sprinkling can, and when I had used it I took up my Malacca town cane, and went out to see how old Father Thames was coming on i thought i would buy some writing paper and i went into a drug store kind of a place i see you are an american sir said the shopman this is a chemist's shop he exclaimed you get paper at the stationer's just after the turning at the top of the street hurrying for my passport i inquired as to the location of such and such a street whatever the name of it is where i understood the place was where this was to be had ah said he whom i addressed you want the american consul general end of essay nine essay ten of walking stick papers by robert cortis holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay ten why men can't read novels by women George Moore once presented the idea that the only thing of interest and value about the creative art of a woman was the feminine quality of that art. The novels of Jane Austen came readily to mind as an argument in support of this provocative idea. Quite first among their charms, every one will admit, is the indisputable fact that no man could possibly have written them they have the lightness brightness sparkle perfume flavor grace fun sensitivity of a young feminine mind no one more than miss austen has captivated the roarers among men a man admires say conrad he if he is a manly man falls in love with jane austen very well now then it is a curious and a paradoxical thing that no man of masculine character can read the novels written by women to-day unless he has to that is unless he is a book reviewer publisher's reader magazine editor proof-reader or some such thing and the reason he can't do it in view of george moore's idea and miss austen's renowned magnetism is curious indeed it is because of the peculiarly feminine attitude of mind of our present women novelists at least this is the arresting pronouncement delivered with much robust eloquence by my leonine friend colonel bludgeon the present writer a pale spectacled middle-aged young man is too conscious of the wondrous nature of women to question their ability in anything but of one of whom he stands in greater awe than of anything else in the world he is a humble friend the dictum of this my friend comes from a quite different character than myself he is a great man he has read everything seen everything known everybody exception to him could be taken only on one ground he is perfectly awful he belongs to an old school splenetic choleric he is sir anthony absolute like a critic in the spirit of the thundering days of william ernest henley his face is like a beefsteak his frame is like a mountain walking his voice johnsonian he knows more about literature than probably any other living man no sir he rumbled you cannot find to-day a cigar-smoking animal though the colonel is so erudite a man his language is terrible 
who could be lured into the pages of our women novelists without snorts snorts sir of disgust or bellows of derisive mirth why because these pages no longer contain an acute transcript of life as only a sensitive feminine mind would have the cunning to observe it and of a form of human life in itself highly feminine in its character but they now present a singularly insular travesty of man an unconscious caricature of man as he could only appear to a feminine mind bound by the romantic limitations of sex a mind that is devoid of masculine understanding unable to recognize by virtue of affiliation of instinct that which is fine in the male character and that which is false to type sir continued the colonel these pictures are colored on one hand by ludicrous prejudice against masculine qualities which the feminine nature temperamentally feels to be antagonistic or dangerous to itself and on the other hand by sentimental worship of masculine attributes conceived to be desirable compliments to the frailty of women this amusing view of man springs not only from the element of sex as i have said but from the very marrow of sex we do not get from the contemporary authoress creative literature at all that is a disinterested criticism of mankind we get in each picture of a male character her instinctive and intensely interested feeling as to whether or not he is a man whom it would be desirable and safe for a young woman to marry paradoxically enough it would seem that women have less and less knowledge of the world as they have contrived to see more of it that is as they have become more emancipated in liberty of action they have become more clannish in thought and that as the range of their opportunities has widened and their interests have multiplied their concern with the most elemental female instinct their preoccupation with their immemorial business of the chase has but intensified by word of mouth the modern woman tells us that in her practical and intellectual capacities she has advanced far beyond her sisters of an earlier day we chance to look into that pool of fiction wherein she mirrors her heart and we find her the same self-centered huntress as of yore sir cried the colonel jolting some tobacco ash off the ledge made by his abdomen which he did by pounding the side of his torso with a bulky volume of the autobiography of benvenuto cellini what is the theme of the most conspicuous portion of our fiction by feminine hands in large measure it is a peevish criticism of husbands we have the popular creator of a type of husband held up to the scorn and ridicule of the sorority of her readers remarking by way of commentary on her satirical pictures that there should be a school for husbands it is apparently this lady's complacent belief that the origin of the domestic difficulties of the world is in the inadequate training of husbands for their delicate office one of the essential requirements for marriage which men should go to school to learn she mentions as understanding wives presumably are born perfectly equipped for their function and do not require to be made at any rate as the production of fiction nowadays is so largely a feminine industry and as a dominant trait of the male even when recording his observations is his chivalrous point of view there is little or no opportunity given us on the benches as you might say to catch a glimpse alive pointing a way for us to see it steadily and see it whole the jovian colonel blew a heavy cloud of tobacco smoke from out his massive ebony beard and sat for a moment looking like some portentous smouldering volcano then continued men uh, with hair on their chests would find the most agreeable society in the pages of our women novelists to be that of the horrible or as the case may be pitiful scoundrels at whom the authors themselves are most indignant these miserable beings uh, generally amiable though rather purposeless spirits are as colonel harvey not long ago remarked of one of them of a sort that almost all men like and hardly any woman can tolerate 
men are free to enjoy their engaging qualities because men are not subject to possible misfortune by reason of the corresponding infirmities of such characters that is men are not dependent upon them for their own safety women on the other hand fear such characters because instinct tells women that they could not trust their own comfortable security to them and consequently women haughtily dislike such as these and find them villainous beings to be branded in any feminine discussion of life as enemies of the sex in the latest novel by one of our most prominent women novelists the colonel went on for months the best-selling book in the country and also undoubtedly the work of an artist sincerely interpreting the world according to her lights we are presented with a distressing scene an incident holy horror at which would make a thrilling and delicious success of any tea-party an undisciplined young pup who is the husband comes home a bit late one night and as a man would describe it somewhat lit up an earnest student of this story cannot find that this misguided youth was any worse than is ordinarily the case in such delinquencies it is intimated however that he has been this way before the horror the loathing which the humorous young scamp's weakness inspires in his wife a young woman of thoroughly feminine loftiness of character is dramatic indeed and partakes of the nature of that which so frequently is occasioned by the nervous organism of women a scene the total lack of large-hearted and intelligent understanding of human nature displayed by the conduct of the young man would send any connubial craft on to the rocks the colonel mopped his brow with a large bandana handkerchief sir he resumed obnoxious as it is to a sensible man to do so let us glance at the hero type of the most popular recent novels by women the figure which strikes admiration into the feminine soul now he roared and i declare my hair rose on end the most awful thing any nigger can call another is a nigger so we all rebel against what we feel to be the weaknesses of our own position none so quick as the vulgar to denounce no gentleman and so on thus as we see there is nothing the weaker sex so much despises in a man as weakness of character and as is consistent with all such reactions of feeling nothing which so much attracts it as a firmness and strength of will beyond itself naturally the adored figures in the popular women's fiction are always of the strong man type in feminine eyes and here we come to a most extraordinary obliquity of the feminine eye what he demanded are the marks by which you ought to know a strong man in the feminine picture a strong man of course is a man with the bark on polish is incompatible with rugged strength an exhilarating air of brusqueness breathes from all strong men they are as ignorant of manners as they are of the effete conventions of grammar they have fought their way up and no one can down them they can be depended upon absolutely as what are called good providers in short by the written confession of her heart woman's idea of a deer after several centuries more or less of civilization remains precisely the primitive conception that it was in the days when man wooed her by grabbing her by the hair and handing her one with a club the colonel was breathing heavily with the exertion of animated speech as he added in real life a man of any stability of judgment would be decidedly suspicious of the hero of a modern woman's novel if one should walk into his office or doubtless he would observe this whimsical character was something of the amusement he would find in the ludicrously false comic irishman of the vaudeville stage this irreverent flight of fancy on our part however is yanking the strong man from his appropriate and supporting setting where paste is given the glow of an authentic stone in the sympathetic pages created by feminine intuition he dominates the machine when the heroine takes into her own hands the right of the individual to a second chance for happiness the colonel declaimed with a demoniac grin 
she turns to experience with such a one perfect love as the honored wife of a splendid and prosperous man and mother of beautiful children the ethics of that engrossing theme of divorce the colonel went on lighting another corpulent and very black cigar as decided by the supreme court of our contemporary women novelists suggests that justly celebrated principle of perfect equity what's yours is mine and what's mine is my own listen he demanded listen as the author of the gentle art of making enemies was wont to introduce his lectures to the story of the unfolding of a woman's heart through marriage as it is unfolded in the recent book of a novelist whom both the million-headed crowd and shoals of reviewers of very uneven critical equipment place well forward among america's novelists a penniless young woman brought up amid the standards of very common people marries for money and comes to face the collapse of her dreams she realizes that she is tied to a man for whom she cares nothing also he is a brute a typical bad egg of a husband from the extensive though rather monotonous stock of this article dealt in by our woman novelists is it right for this young woman to throw away the chances of her whole life for happiness and so on it certainly should not seem so to readers of the book and it is natural enough as her husband has totally failed to hold her that this young woman's mind and heart too should convince her that she may make what she regards as a wiser disposition of her life the inevitable strong man whom she eventually marries seems unfortunately to have a bit of a flaw in his granite character at any rate something is wrong with him as the heroine fails to hold him altogether and matters even begun to look as though she might lose him but with her great happiness had come a new standard of honor and a distrust of divorce as the solution of any marital problem would it be right for her to lose a husband who has tired of her not by a long shot marriage is the one vow we take before god it is a contract is it not against all moral law to break a contract and all the rest of it so feminine logic disposes of what is described as one of the great problems of the day suddenly the colonel broke into a terrifying smile this novelist of whom we have been speaking he said somewhere remarked in an interview that it was too bad about poor george gissing where she picked up gissing god only knows as writing away all his life at stuff people didn't care for he was one of the tragedies of literature well gissing may be dead and gone but his work sticks on i could tell her the colonel glared as he pawed his enormous hand through his mane of a more profound tragedy of literature End of Essay 10。Essay 11 of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortez Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 11 The Desert of Life. Birds of a feather flock together. You can tell a dog by its spots. A man is known by the company he keeps, and all that sort of thing. It is quite astonishing that nobody has before been struck by what I have in my eye. People go round all the while writing about old Greenwich Village, the harbor, the ghetto, the walk up town, Coney Island, the Great White Way, the subway ride, Riverside Drive, the spectacle of Fifth Avenue, the night court, the lungs of the metropolis, the cliff dwellers, faith, hope, and charity on University Heights, a cathedral, a university, and a hospital, Lobster Palace Society, the Grand Canons of Lower Manhattan, and about every other part of and thing in New York except this most entertaining section which I am about to discuss. Now, I never lived on Mars. You know, Sunday stories in the newspapers are continually bringing a gentleman resident on Mars to marvel with his fresh vision at the wonders of this world. As I say, I never lived on Mars, but what amounts to the same thing in this case, perhaps? I did live all of my New York life, up to a short time ago, below 42nd Street. 
i gathered from reading and conversation that there were districts of the city above this where people dwelt and went about their daily affairs just i suppose as fish do at the bottom of the sea and beasts in the jungle but i knew that i could not breathe at the bottom of the ocean nor be comfortable in the jungle however it's this way the person to whom i am married declared that she could not live below forty-second street said that that was not done at all nobody lived below forty-second street so the matter was settled i moved uptown of course by stealth i continue to visit the neighborhood of gramercy park as a dog it is said will return to that which is not nice the beauties and the advantages of the region in which i now live have been pointed out to me it is quite true that everything hereabouts is new and clean here the streets are not infested by old bums as those are in that dirty old downtown here one is just between the beautiful drive on the one side and our handsome central park on the other here there is fresh air here broadway is a boulevard and further it winds about in its course like the roads as they call them there in london and does not have that awful straight look of everything in that checkerboard part of town here everybody is well dressed and even the grocers and butchers shops are quite smart all this is indisputable but all this is a description of the physical aspects of this part of town what i purpose to do is an esoteric thing through the outward aspects of this part of town its vestments the features of its physiognomy i will show as through a glass the beatings of its heart i will exhibit the soul of it interpret its spirit make plain for him that runs its inner hidden meaning the part of town that i mean may be said to begin at seventy-second street it runs along broadway and comprises the neighborhood of broadway to say a bit above one hundred and tenth street now we shall see what we shall see you remember what a celebrated irascible character said about a circulating library in a town be that as it may as you stroll along broadway up from seventy-second street you observe being a person of highly alert mind an astonishing number of circulating libraries devoted exclusively to the latest fiction and you note that all corner drug stores and all stationers shops present a window display of fifty-cent fiction ah refinement reading people are nice people they are not rough people there is you feel at once an air there is a taste how shall i say selectness about this part of town it is not as other parts of town are you perceive as you continue your stroll with a brightened and a more perfumed mind that there are no shoe stores here shoe stores booteries these are combined with hoseries countless are the smart hat shops for women that is to say the establishments of chapeau importers in the miniature parlors framed by the windows glass these chic and ravishing creations the chapeau rise in a row high upon their slim and lovely stems this one is the establishment of mademoiselle edith that of madame vigneau countless too are the terrestrial heavens devoted to gowns headless they stand these symphonies in feminine apparel side by side here in the windows of the maison la mode there of the maison estelle frequent are the places where the figure is cultivated with famous corsets the retreats of corsetrières this one before you bears the name fayette it is where the model madame pompadour is sold and numerous are shops luxuriating in waists blouses lingerie and novelties of dress conspicuous among them the dolly dimple shop the many furriers here all deal in exclusive furs and their names all end in ski and there are roses roses all the way that is to say rosaries violetteries and the like what we call florist shops you know 
spots of gorgeous color and intense fragrance heaped high with orchids violets roses gardenias or in some cases artificial flowers see the luscious wax busts in the window with their grand coiffures and their pink and yellow bosoms resplendent with gems it is a hairdresser's just as in london with a gentleman's parlor at the back structures are made here in human hair and marcel waving is done not however we may suppose for gentlemen here may be had an olive oil shampoo and a facial massage one could be manicured in the stroll you are taking every ten minutes or so if one wished and hair-cutting is done along this way by artistes from various lands there is for instance the palaqueria española service too offered at residence beauty here is held in esteem as it was among the greeks upon one side of the chemist's window toilette requisites are announced for sale the valet system is extensively advertised the industry of dry cleansing nourishes and the shoe renovator abounds and hats are renovated and blocked and ironed in places without number what a delightful tea-room is this with its woodwork its panelling and its little window lattices all in beautiful enamelled white that is not a tea-room i'm surprised at you that is a laundry a laundry shades of hop loo it is even so there are a variety of types of laundry in this part of the world but the great point of them all is their sanitary character all things are sanitary here the shaving brushes at the barber's are proclaimed sanitary sanitary tailoring is announced and the creameries of this district it would seem go beyond anything yet achieved elsewhere in the way of sanitation it might be imagined from a study of window signs that a perverse person bent upon procuring unpasteurized milk in this part of town would be frustrated of his design i was sent to what my understanding conceived to be the bakery in our immediate neighbourhood on an errand this place i found was called the queen elizabeth i was dreadfully abashed when i got inside i was afraid that there might be some bit of mud on my shoes which might soil the polished floor and i became keenly conscious that my trousers were not perfectly pressed i should of course have worn my tail-coat there were several ladies there receiving guests that afternoon i had a tete -tete with one of these who gossiped pleasantly about the cakes i was to get some cakes the nicest cakes at the queen elizabeth it seems are of two kinds maids of court and ladies in waiting our neighbourhood is rich in shops given to pastry sweets bonbons shops of charming names there is the ambrosia confection shop and the place of the patisserie et confiserie in our neighbourhood there are too a vast number of caterers and fruiterers and particularly delicatessen shops delicatessen shops in our neighbourhood are described upon the windows as places dealing in fancy and table luxuries i have heard my wife say that many people just live out of them they are certainly handsome places why you wouldn't think there was any food in them everything is so dressed up that it doesn't look at all as if it were to eat it is so attractive restaurants hereabouts are commonly named la parisienne or something like that or are called rotisseries there are some just ordinary restaurants too and many immaculate light lunch rooms afternoon tea is a frequent sign and one often sees the delicate suggestion in neat gilt sandwiches grocers in this part of town it would seem handle only select fancy and choice groceries and hothouse products there are a number of fine markets in this district very fine markets indeed in the season for game deer and bears may be seen strung up in front of them all their chickens appear to come from philadelphia their ducks are fresh killed long island ducks and they make considerable of a feature of frog's legs 
these markets are usually called the superior market or the quality market or something like that great residential hotels here bear the name of halls as brummel hall on the one hand and euripides hall on the other you will by now have begun to perceive the note the flare of my part of town its care is for the graces the things that sweeten life the refinements of civilization the embellishments of existence nothing more clearly strikingly bespeaks this than the proofs of its extraordinary fondness for art i have mentioned literature painting and sculpture music the drama and the art of interior decoration these things of the spirit have their homes without number along this stretch of broadway art shops and art galleries are on every hand in the windows of these places you will see innumerable french mirrors stacks of empty picture frames of french eighteenth-century design at an amazingly cheap figure each remarkably inexpensive reproductions in bright colors of sir joshua corot watteau chardin fragonard some italian madonnas an assortment of hunting prints and prints redolent of old english sentiment many wall texts or creeds a variety of the kind of colored pictures technically called i believe comics numerous little plaster casts of anonymous works and busts of standard authors frequently an ambitious original etching by an artist unknown to you and an occasional print of the september morn kind of thing together with many art objects and a great deal of bric-a-brac upon the windows you are informed that restoring artistic framing regilding and resilvering are done within in some places that miniatures are painted there there too a number of japanese art stores along the way containing vast stocks of japanese lilies living in japanese pans other exotic blossoming plants pink and yellow slippers from the orient and striking flowered garments like a scene from a mikado opera in this part of town photography too is made one of the fine arts you do not here have your photograph taken you have it seems your portrait made home portraiture is ingratiatingly suggested on lettered cards and further you are invited to indulge in art posing in photographs the studios of the photographers display about an equal number of portraits of children and dogs the people of this community take joy not only in the savor of art and in taking part in its professional production but they would themselves produce it as amateurs the sign kodaks is everywhere about and enlarging is done and developing and printing for amateurs every few rods so we come to the subject of music caruso melba paderewski misha elman harry lauder Sousa, liszt beethoven chopin wagner brahms grieg moskowski and the latest song hit from anywhere you please ask and you will find along this thoroughfare there are no more prosperous looking bazaars on this street than those consecrated to the sale of musical phonographs of every make and if the name of these places is not exactly legion it is something very like that besides every species of victophone and olograph the music lover may muse upon the wonders and the variety of mechanical piano players all of a deluxe tone quality as for the drama the brightest word at night in this galaxy of ultra signs is the gracious word photo playhouse deep beyond plummet sound is the interest of this part of town in the human story as revealed upon the screen grief and mirth good and evil danger and daring and the horizon from hatteras to matapan may be scanned upon the poster boards before the entrances of these showy temples of the mighty film here one is invited to witness carmen and also a drama of life tricked by a victim and also a comedy drama full of pep entitled good old pop 
productions of the premier picture corporation announcements of scenes of tornadoes the great war of paris fashions and ah yes of beauty films line the way to turn to the home the people of this part of town dwell according to their shops entirely amid period and art furniture and it would seem by the remarkable number of places in this quarter where this is displayed for sale that they dwell amid a most amazing amount of it these marts of household gods are of two kinds one of imposing size with long windows stretching far down the cross street and dealing in shining reproductions and the tiny quaint intimate delightful kind of thing where it is said on a sign on a gilded chair that artistic picture hanging by the hour is done the fascinating places are the more alluring herein rich jumbles are of tapestries clocks of all periods including a harvest of those of the grandfather era fire screens brass kettles andirons stained glass artistic lamps in endless variety the latest things in pillow cushions book racks wallpapers wall decorations and hangings draperies curtains cretons the decorators deal too in parquet floors and flourish and increase in their kind in response evidently to the volume of demand for upholstering and cabinet work and the floors of this part of town must hold rich stores of oriental rugs as importers of these are frequent on our way the higher civilizations turn naturally to refinements of religious thought what the salvation army is to fourteenth street what the rescue mission is to the bowery the christian science reading room is to this stretch of broadway and there is no trimmer place to be seen on your stroll then one of the marks of our culture to-day is the aesthetic cultivation of the primitive our neighborhood is invited on placards in windows to assemble every sunday evening to enjoy the love stories of the bible for the rest you would see on your stroll for man cannot live by taste and the spirit alone sundry places of business concerned with real estate electrical accoutrements automobile accessories toys the investment and safeguarding of treasure and so on and particularly with ales wines liquors and cigars each and all of these however are affirmed to be places of quality now the social customs of this part of town as they may be abundantly viewed on our thoroughfare are agreeable to observe at night our boulevard twinkles with lights like a fairyland the view of across the way through the gardens as they should be called down the middle of the street is enchanting all aglow are spick and span trolley cars all our trolley cars are spick and span ride down the way like floats in a nocturnal parade upon the sidewalks are happy throngs and a hum of cheery sound the throngs of our neighborhood are touched with an indescribable character of place they are not the throngs of anywhere else they are not exactly fifth avenue they are not the great white way they are nice throngs healthy throngs carefree throngs modish throngs in the modes of magazine advertisements and all their members are young you will notice as you go and come that you pass the same laughing groups in precisely the same spot hour after hour those who compose these groups seem to be calling upon one another apparently on pleasant evenings it is the form here for you to receive your guests in this way in the open air and you jest and converse and while the time amiable be away just as many people do at home well says my wife the rooms in the apartments in this part of town are so small that nobody can bring anybody into them end of essay eleven Essay twelve of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay twelve A Clerk May Look at a Celebrity. A clerk may look at a celebrity. For a number of years, we being diligent in our business, stood and waited before kings in a celebrated bookshop. 
now like casanova retired from the world of our triumphs and adventures we compose our memoirs we know from personal experience that a slight tale a string of gossip will often alter our entire conception of a personality from a contemporary book review this the high office of tittle-tattle is what we have in our eye we are walpolian peepsian these memoirs confessions recollections impressions as the title happens are extremely valuable in the pictures they contain of the time especially happy are they in the intimate glimpses they give us of the distinguished people particularly the men of letters of the day the writer was an attache of the court the writer was this the writer was that but always the writer had peculiar facilities for observing intimately and so forth so it was with the writer here we remember with a special entertainment we began the first time we saw f hopkinson smith we are ashamed to say that he was known among our confrere the salesman as hop smith he introduced himself to us by his moustache looming rapidly and breezily upon us do you know me he said swelling out his genial chest so it seemed and pointing with a militarish gesture to this decoration we looked a moment at this seagull ornament somehow not unfamiliar to us and said we do mr hopkinson smith we perceived regards this literary monument so to say as a household word to put it so in every home in the land mr smith a very robust man wore yellow sulphur-coloured gloves a high hat a flower in his buttonhole white piping to his vest a debonair figure chanticleerian fresh complexion exhaling a breeze of vigour though not short in stature he is less tall than from the air of his photographs we had been led to expect a surprise conveying a curious effect reminded one of that subconscious sensation experienced in the presence of a one-time tall chair which has been lowered a little by having had a section of its legs sawed off mr smith's conversation with book clerks we found to be confined to inquiries iterated upon each reappearance concerning the sale of his own books we appreciate that this may not be the expression of an irrestrainable vanity or obsessing greed realizing that very probably his professional insight into human character informs him that the subject of the sales of books is the range of the book clerk's mind he expressed a frank and hearty pride engaging in aspect we felt in the long-sustained life of peter which remarkably selling book survived on the front fiction table all its contemporaries and in full vigour lived on to see a new generation grow up around it there in a full-blooded sporting spirit mr smith asked us if his new book was selling faster than john fox's heartiness and geniality is his role a man built to win and to relish popularity with a breezy salute of the sulphur-gloved hand he is gone immediately we feel much less electric alas what an awful thing oliver herford with heavily dipped pen poised is about to autograph a copy of his pen and ink puppet when lo a monstrous ink blot spills upon the fair page hideous mr hereford is nonplussed the book is ruined no mr hereford is not mr hereford for nothing the book is enriched in value sesame with his pen mr hereford deftly touches the ink blot and it is a most amusing human silhouette how characteristic an autograph his delightful friend will say we were quite satisfied in the introduction given us in our sojourn as a book clerk with mr hereford that is to say our early education was received largely from the pages of st nicholas magazine and when grown to man's estate and brought to mingle with the great we might easily have suffered a sentimental disappointment in mr hereford but no he is as mad as a march hare he never we should say has any idea where he is an absolutely blank face mind far far away doesn't act as though he had any mind a smallish clean-shaven man light sack suit somewhat crumpled 
a fine shock of grayish hair, cane hooked over crooked arm, list to starboard like a postman, approaches directly towards us, we prepare to render our service, perceives something in his path, us, just in time to avert a collision, swerves to one side, takes an oblique tack, but speaks, always particular to avoid seeming to slight us, in a very friendly fashion, though gives you the impression that he thinks you are someone else. A pleasant, unaffected man to talk to. Somewhat dazed, however, in effect. Curious manner of speech, of which evidently he is unconscious, partly native English accent, partly temperamental idiosyncrasy. A very simple eccentric what in the eighteenth century was called an original, reads popular novels. It was given to us to see the launching throes of a nouveau novelist. We noticed, day after day, a well-built young man come in to gaze at the fiction table, a sturdy, spirited, comely chap. A fine snap to his eye we particularly noticed and admired. He seemed to derive much satisfaction from this occupation, and to be in an excellent frame of mind. And then, it struck us, he grew of troubled mien. He asked us one day how predestined was selling. So we had the psychology of the situation. He asked, on another, if we had sold a copy of predestined yet. A few days following, he inquired, how long does it take before a book gets started? Dejected was his mien. It took predestined some time. Then it went very well. We sold a joyous-looking Stephen French Whitman, an embodiment of gusto, there was a positive crackle to his fine black eyes, a pile of books concerning themselves with Europe, and did not see him again for some time. Then he flashed upon us a handsome new moustache. Our acquaintance with Mrs. Wharton was merely formal. "'Oh, very pleased!' exclaimed an equiline lady, patrician unmistakable, of aristocratic features which we recognized from the portraits of magazines. "'I'll take this!' She had in her hand a copy of the then quite new pocket edition, Poems of George Meredith. She was very fashionably, strikingly, gowned, somewhat conspicuously, a large pattern in the figure of the cloth. She carried a little dog. There was about her something um, difficult to denote, brilliant and hard in effect like a polished stone, and we felt the rarefied atmosphere of a wealthy, highly cultivated, rather haughty society charge to edward wharton she said very nicely bending over us as we wrote lennox mass she pronounced it not massachusetts but mass as is not infrequent in the east thank you she said she swept from us our regard was won to this incarnation of distinction by the pleasant humanity of her manners, her very gracious good morning, to the elevator man as she left. Dicky Davis we always called him behind his back, and such he looks. A man of strapping physique, younger in a general effect than probably he is, immense chest and shoulders, great meaty back constructed like we picture those gladiators borrow lyrically acclaims the noble bruisers of old england complexion to employ perhaps an excessive stylistic restraint not pale a heavy stick a fondness for stocks very becoming a vitality with an aversion apparently to wearing an overcoat in the coldest weather deeming this probably an appurtenance of the invalid funny style of trousers as if made for legs about a foot longer in the reign of high waters we had picked up the notion that mr davis was a snobbish person we found him a very friendly man gentle describes it in manner very respectful to clerks one of the other gentlemen here ordered another book for me he mentions but more a sort of camaraderie says one day that he just stepped in to dodge some people he saw coming inquires well what's going on in the book world buys travel books africa and such buys a quart of ink at a clip 
He conveyed to us further, unconsciously perhaps, a subtle impression that he was in sympathy with us, on our side, so to say. In any difficulty that would be that might arise, with the boys, in a manner of speaking, veteran globe-trotter and soldier of fortune on the earth's surface, Mr. Davis suffered a considerable shock to discover in tete -a tete that we had never been in London. London? Such a human vegetable, we saw, was hardly credible. Charge, he said, to James Hunnaker. He pronounced his name in a very eccentric fashion, the first syllable like that in Hunter. In our commerce with the world we have, with this rather important exception, invariably heard this you as in humid a substantial figure, very erect in carriage, supporting his portliness with that physical pride of portly men, moving with the dignity of bulk. A physiognomy of rodinesque modelling, his cane a trim touch to the ensemble, decidedly affable in manner to us, very nice man, comments our hasty note, one of our young gentlemen here, black eyes, black hair, describes with surprising memory of exact observation a fellow serf was to get a book for me a couple of months ago bought the mother monograph on goya referred humorously to his new book one on music said many people don't believe that one can be equally good or perhaps bad at many things spoke of arnold bennett said he was a hard-working journalist as well as a novel writer seemed to possess the greater respect, great esteem, for the character of journalist. We felt a reminiscence of that solid practicality of sentiment of another heavy man. Nobody but a blockhead, said Dr. Johnson, ever wrote except for money. Mentioned the novel then just out, predestined. He, the author, is one of our, son, men, you know, fraternal pride and affection in inflection, though he said he did not know Mr. Whitman. Thank you very much, he said, in leaving. From his carriage, moving slowly in on the arm of a Japanese boy, his servant, came one day John Lafarge. Tales of the Far East, profound erudition, skin of seer parchment, Indian philosophies, exotic culture, incalculable age, inscrutable wisdom, intellectual mystery, a dignity deep in its appeal to the imagination. Such was the connotation of his presence. Fine as that portrait by Mr. Cortezot. An oriental scholar, all right, we thought. Mr. Lafarge was in search of some abstruse art books. He did not care, he said, what language they were in, except German. He said he hated German. Well, we have to go to the German for many things, you know, we said. Yes, said Mr. Lafarge, we have to die, too, but I don't want to any sooner than I can help. But it is not famous authors only that are interesting. We were approached one day by a tall, exceedingly solemn individual who asked for a copy of a book the name of which sounded to us like the title of what the trade knows as a juvenile. "'Who wrote it?' we inquired, puzzled. In a deep, hollow voice, the unknown gentleman vibrated, "'I did!' A very light-colored new Norfolk suit with a high hat, an exceedingly neat black cutaway coat, and handsome checked trousers, a decidedly big derby hat, flat on top, an English walking coat with plaid trousers to match, the whole about a dozen checks high. "'This?' an inventory of the wardrobe of Dr. Henry Van Dyke, as it has been displayed to our appreciation. Has not the handsome wardrobe been a familiar feature in the history of literature? And does anybody like Dr. Goldsmith the less for having loved a lovely coat? A slight figure, very erect and alert, a dapper, dignified step, movement precise, an effect of a good deal of nose-glasses, black heavy rims, a wide black tape, head perpendicular, drawn back against the neck, grave scholarly face, chiseled with much refinement of technique, foiled to the studious complexion, a dark silken mustache, holding our thumbnail sketch up to the light, we see it thus. We regret that our view of this figure so prominent in our literature is perforce so entirely external. 
but for this dr van dyke has no one to blame but himself his fastidiousness in clerks ignoring as he passes our offer of service at the desk where he seats himself he removes his hat a large head we note for the figure a good deal of back as well as top head and preparing to write to fill out the order forms himself fumbles a great deal with his glasses taking off and putting on again a friend discovering him here he springs up and greets him with much vivacity his orders written out he delivers them into the hands of the manager of the shop with whom he chats a bit nature imitated art indeed when she designed william gillette remarkably fleshly incarnation of the literary figment sherlock holmes in the soul of mr gillette as on a stage we witnessed a dramatic moral conflict two natures struggled before us within him which would prevail mr gillette was much interested in rackham books bought a great many in stock at this time was a very elaborate set in several quarto volumes of alice in wonderland most ornately bound with rackham designs inlaid in leaven of various colours in the rich purple levant binding the illustrations within were a unique collected set of the celebrated drawings made by various hands for this classic the price several hundred dollars mr gillette was torn with temptation here and yet was it right for him to be so extravagant periodically he came in impelled to inquire if the set had yet been sold if somebody only would buy the set why then of course it would be all over in our contemplation of the literary we have amused ourselves with philosophic reflection we recalled that old saw of oscar wilde's as george moore says of something of wordsworth's about the artist tending always to reproduce his own type and we thought what an excellent model to the illustrator of his own married life of the frederick carrolls jesse lynch williams would have been no name itself it struck us would be happier for mr williams than frederick carroll if it were not jesse lynch williams a college chap alumnus a typical clever exceedingly likable young american husband fairly well to do it is thus we behold him slender in an english walking coat smiling agreeably one we thought you would think of as a popular figure in a younger set it is irrelevant certainly but we must acknowledge our indebtedness to a lady customer who supposed that the married life of the frederick carrolls was an historic work dealing with the domestic existence of the author of alice thomas nelson page autographing presentation copies of a coast of bohemia remarks this is one of the rewards of poetry at this task or rather pleasure mr page spent a good part of several successive days in the store a gentleman with a flavour of the south in his speech very like his well-known pictures stocky an effect of not having in length much neck light soft suit or very becoming prince albert and high hat he will wear you out whispers a colleague to us he has no idea where any of his friends live i doubt if he knows where he lives himself the junior mr weller we recollect when an in boots referred to humankind in terms natural to his calling there's a pair of hessians in thirteen he said viewing mr page with the eye of an attendant we should remark that he is a tartar but a kindly patient courteous tartar city directories telephone books social registers who's who's are all necessary to enable him to tell the address of his friends and these are inadequate he wishes to send as a token of his regard a book affectionately inscribed to his friend let us say j m d esq we learn by the agency of the machinery to which we have recourse that there reside in the city of new york four gentlemen of this identical name one on madison avenue one on ninety first street another in brooklyn the other somewhere else mr page is completely bewildered as to which is his friend well i don't know he says but this man married former senator so-and-so's daughter 
Now can we solve that somehow? Historic spirit! We cried that day, in practicality of literary men, for petty mundane details, here hast thou still thy habitat, a temple in Mr. Page. Lore, how we do run on! End of Essay 12《Essay Thirteen of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Essay Thirteen. Can't speak the language. • Whenever we go to England, we learn that we can't speak the language. We are told very frankly that we can't, and we very quickly perceive that whatever it is that we speak, it certainly is not the language. Let us consider this matter. A somewhat clever and an amusingly ill-natured English journalist, T. W. H. Crossland, not long ago wrote a book, Knocking Us, in which he says that having inherited, borrowed, or stolen a beautiful language, they, that is, we Americans, willfully and of set purpose distort and misspell it. Crossland's ignorance of all things American, ingeniously revealed in this lively bit of writing, is interesting in a person of presumably ordinary intelligence, and his credulity in the matter of what he has heard about us is apparently boundless. However, he does not much concern us. Well-behaved Englishmen would doubtless consider as impolite his manner of expression regarding the best thing imported in the Mayflower but however unamiably he does voice a feeling very general if not universal in england you never get around an englishman would say round the fact over there that we do not speak the english language well to use an americanism they the english certainly do have the drop on us in the matter of beauty Mr. Chesterton somewhere says that a thing always to be borne in mind in considering England is that it is an island, that its people are insulated. An excellent thing to remember, too, in this connection is that England is a flower garden. In ordinary times, after an Englishman is provided with a roof and four meals a day, the next thing he must have is a garden, even if it is but a flower pot. They are continually talking about loveliness over there. It is a lovely day. It is lovely on the river now. It is a lovely spot. And so there are primroses in their speech. And then they have inherited over there, or borrowed or stolen, a beautiful literary language worn soft in color like their black streaked gray stone buildings by time and as whistler's greeks did their drinking vessels they use it because perforce they have no other the humblest londoner will innocently shame you by talking perpetually like a story-book one day on an omnibus i asked the conductor where i should get off to reach a certain place oh that's the journey's end sir he replied now that is poetry it sounds like christina rossetti what would an american car conductor have said why that's the end of the line could you spare me a trifle sir asked the london beggar a pretty manner of requesting alms little boys in england are very fond of cigarette pictures little cards there reproducing old english flowers i used to save them to give to children once i gave a number to the ringleader of a group i was about to tell him to divide them up oh we'll share them sir he said at home such a boy might have said to the others Gwan, these are for me again when i inquired my way of a tiny ragged mite he directed me to go as straight as ever you can sir across the cricket field then take your first right go straight through the copse sir he called after me the copse perhaps i was thinking of the copse of new york then i understood that the urchin was speaking of a small wood of course he this small boy sang his sentence with the rising and falling inflection of the lower classes top of the street bottom of the road over the way so it goes and by the way how does an englishman know which is the top and which is the bottom of every street naturally the english can't understand us when is it that you are going home asked my friend the policeman in king's road oh some time in the fall i told him in the fall he inquired puzzled 
yes september or october oh he exclaimed in the autumn yes yes at the fall of the leaves i heard him murmur meditatively meeting him later in the company of another policeman he he said to his friend nodding at me is going back in the fall deliciously humorous to him was my speech now it may be mentioned as an interesting point that many of the words imported in the mayflower or in ships following it have been quite forgotten in england fall as in the fall of the year i think was among them quite so quite so as they say in england yes in the king's road for it is an odd thing charles scribner's sons are on fifth avenue but selfridge's is on oxford street here we meet a man on the street we kick him into it and in england it is a very different thing indeed whether you meet a lady in the street or on the street you for instance wouldn't meet a lady on the street at all in fact in england to our mind things are so turned around that it is as good as being in china just as traffic there keeps to the left curb instead of to the right curb so whereas here i call you up on the telephone there you phone me down it would be awkward wouldn't it for me to say to you that i called you down england is an island and though the british government controls one-fifth or something like that of the habitable globe england is a very small place most of the things there are small a freight car is a goods van and it certainly is a goods van and not a freight car so when you ask what little stream this is you are told that that is the river lay or the river arran as the case may be although they look indeed except that they are far more lovely like what we call cricks in our country and the englishman is fond of speaking in diminutives he calls for a drop of ale to receive a pint tankard he asks for a bite of bread when he wants half a loaf his bit of green is a bowl of cabbage he likes a bit of cheese in the way of a hearty slice now and then one overhearing him from another room might think that his copious repast was a microscopic meal about this peculiarity in the homely use of the language there was a joke in punch not long ago said the village worthy in the picture ah i used to be as fond of a drop of beer as any one but nowadays if i do take two or three gallons it do knock i over into the matter of the quaint features of the speech of the english countryside or the wonders of the cockney dialect the unlearned foreigner hardly dare venture it is sufficient for us to wonder why a railroad should be a railway when it becomes a railway we are inclined in our speculation to pass as we say over here and ale when it is isle brings to mind a pleasant story a humble londoner speaking of an oil painting of an island referred to it as a painting in isle of an oil an american friend of mine resident in london insists that where there is an english word for a thing other than the american word for it the english word is in every case better because it is shorter he points to tram for surface car and to lift for elevator still though it may be a finer word hoarding is not shorter than billboard nor is a daily breader shorter than commuter i think we break about even on that score this however would seem to be true where the same words are employed in a somewhat different way the english are usually closer to the original meaning of the word saloon bar for instance is intended to designate a rather aristocratic place above the public bar while the lowest gin mill in the united states would be called a saloon i know an american youth who has thought all the while that piccadilly circus was a show like barnum and bailey's with everything that is round in london called a circus he must have imagined it a rather hilarious place the english go on a good deal about our slang they used to be fond of quoting in superior derision in their papers our to them utterly unintelligible baseball news mr crossland to drag him in again to illustrate our abuse of the language quotes from some tenth-rate american author 
which is a way they have had in england of judging our literature with the comment that that is not the way john milton wrote not long ago mr crossland became involved in a trial in the courts in connection with oscar wilde lord alfred douglas and robert ross he defended himself with much spirit and considerable cleverness among other things he said as reported in the press what is this game this gang are trying to do me down here i am a poor man up against two hundred quid or some such amount of counsel well that wasn't the way john milton talked either the english slang for money is a pleasant thing thickens and thinnens two quid five bob tanners and coppers and they have a good body of expressive and colorful speech on the rocks is a neat and poetic way of saying down and out it is really not necessary to add the word resources to the expression on his own a tripper is a well-defined character and so is a flapper a nipper and a bounder there had to be some word for the english nut as no amount of the language of john milton would describe him and while the connotation of this word as humor is different with us the appellation of the english when you have come to see it in their light hits off the personage very crisply to say that such a one talks like a halfpenny book is as the english say a jolly good job and a hotel certainly is presented as full when it is pronounced full up a topper would be only one kind of a hat very well then it is quite possible we see to be all fed up as they say in england with english slang humorous englishmen sometimes rather fancy our slang and make naive attempts at the use of it in england for instance a man gets the sack when he is bounced from his job so i heard a lively englishman attracted by the word say that so and so should get the bounce in writing the englishman usually employs the language he has his yellow journals indeed which he calls americanized newspapers but crude and slovenly writing certainly is not a thing that sticks out on him what a gentlemanly book reviewer he is always we have here in the united states perhaps a half dozen gentlemen who review books is it not true that you would get tired counting up the young english novelists who are as accomplished writers as our few men of letters the englishman has a basketful of excellent periodicals to every one of ours and in passing it is interesting to note this when we are literary we become a little dull see our highbrow journals when we frolic we are a little well rough the englishman can be funny even hilarious and unconsciously confoundedly well-bred at the same time but he does have a rotten lot of popular illustrated magazines over there compared to ours when you return from a sojourn of several months in the land of the language you are immediately struck very forcibly by the vast number of americanisms by the richness of our popular speech by the punch it has and by the place it holds in the printed page at home in a journey from new york i turned over in the smoking car a number of papers i had not seen for some time among them the new york evening post colliers harpers puck and the indianapolis news here generally without quotation marks and frequently in the editorial pages i came across these among innumerable racy phrases nothing doing hot stuff right o strong on work some celebrations has em all skinned mad at him this got him in bad scared a skidoo beat it a peach of a place get away with a job been stung by the party got by on his bluff sore at that fact and always on the job i learned that the weatherman had put over his first frost last night that a town we passed had come across with a sixteen-year-old burglar and that a discredited politician was attempting to get out from under perhaps it is not to be wondered at that the englishman frequently fails to get us you note a change in the whole atmosphere of language a pronounced instance of this difference is found in public signs you have been seeing in english conveyances the placards in neat type 
posted about which kindly request the traveller not to expectorate upon the floor of this vehicle as to do so may cause inconvenience to other passengers or spread disease and so forth and so on over here don't spit this means you this is about the way our signs of this kind go now what about all this i used to think many persons just returned from england ridiculously affected in their speech and many of them are those who say can't when they can't do it unconsciously that is over here in britain perhaps it is just as well to make a stagger at speaking the way the britons do when you accidentally step on an englishman's toe it is better to say i'm sorry or simply sorry than to beg his pardon or ask him to excuse you this makes you less conspicuous and so more comfortable and when you stay any length of time you fall naturally into english ways then when you come back you seem to us to use one of the englishman's most delightful words to swank dreadfully and in that is the whole story mr james declares that in the work of two equally good writers you could still tell by the writing which was that of the englishman and which that of the american the assumption of course is that where they differed the american would be the inferior writer mr james prefers the english atmosphere and the englishman is inclined to regard us in our deviation as a sort of imperfect reproduction of himself what is his is ours it is true but what's ours is our own that is we have inherited a noble literature in common but we write less and less like an englishman all the while our legacy of language brought over in the mayflower has become adapted to our own environment been fused in the melting pot and quickened by our own life to-day whether for better or for worse it may be either the literary touch is rapidly going by the board in modern american writing one of the newer english writers remarks a few carefully selected american phrases can very swiftly kill a great deal of dignity and tradition why should we speak the very excellent language spoken in the tight little isle across the sea in surrey they speak of the broad sussex of their neighbours in the adjoining county is it exactly that we can't or that we just don't because we have an article more to our purpose made largely from english material but made in the united states End of essay thirteen. Essay fourteen of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cordes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay fourteen Hunting Lodgings. Some people say that it is the most awful trial, but it isn't so at all. One of the most entertaining things that can be done in the world, so full of interesting things, is to go hunting lodgings also it is one of the most enlightening things that can be done for pursued with intelligence and energy it gives one an excellent view of humankind that is of a particularly human kind of human kind it is a confoundedly christian thing to do hunting lodgings because it opens the heart to the queer ways and speech and customs of the world now i myself hunt lodgings as some men hunt wild game nothing is better when one is out of sorts somewhat run down and peevish with the world generally than to go out one fine afternoon and hunt lodgings in some remote part of town when in a foreign city especially the first thing i myself do as soon as i am comfortably settled somewhere and after of course having looked up the celebrated sites of the place the abbey the louvre grant's tomb is to put in a day or so hunting lodgings even to read in the papers of lodgings to let is refreshing and educational all lodgings are sunny in the papers they are let mainly by refined persons and are wonderfully quiet i remember last summer in london there was a small sitting to let to a young lady lodgings by the way are usually apartments in england as you know 
though indeed it is true that when a gentleman rents over there what we call a furnished room he is commonly said to go into lodgings a fine phrase that it is like to that fine old expression commencing author and that reminds me the most fascinating lodgings to hunt perhaps anywhere are called chambers these which i mean are in the old inns of court in london and the most charming of these remaining is staple inn off holborn i used frequently to hunt chambers in the fairest inn of chancery there are no modern conveniences there you draw your own water at a pump in the venerable quadrangle and you find your own light but to return there was also last summer an apartment to let to a respectable man or the announcement said it might do for friends one of the reasons why many people are bored by hunting lodgings is that they are not humble in spirit they seek proud lodgings as to apartment houses which are a very different matter the newspapers publish at various seasons of the year copious apartment house directories with innumerable half-tone illustrations of these more or less sumptuous places and these directories are competent commentaries on their subject george moore remarked with business i have nothing to do my concern is with art except that i live in one with apartment houses i have nothing to do my concern is with lodgings there is only one philosophical observation to be made upon apartment houses and that is this how can all these people afford to live in them when you go to look at apartments you are shown a place that you don't like particularly you don't think oh how i'd just love to live here if i could only afford it but you ask the rental as a matter of form and you learn that this apartment rents for a sum greater in all likelihood than your entire salary and yet there are miles and miles of apartment houses even better than that and goodness knows how many thousand people live in them people whose names you never see in the newspapers as ones important in business in society art literature or anything else obscure people very ordinary people now where do they get all that money but about lodgings i at one time went to look at lodgings in patchen place i had heard that patchen place was america's latin quarter i thought it would be well to examine it patchen place is a cul-de-sac behind jefferson market a bizarre female person admitted me to the house there it was not unreasonable to suppose that she had a certain failing she slipshod before me along a remarkably dark rough-floored and dusty hall and up a rickety stair the lodging which she had to let was interesting but not attractive the tenant it seemed who had just moved away had many faults trying to his landlady he was very delinquent for one thing in the payment of his rent and he was somewhat addicted to drink this unfortunate propensity led him to keep very late hours and caused him habitually to fall upstairs well i told her by way of making talk that i believed i was held to be a reasonably honest person and that i was frequently sober oh she said i can see that you are a gentleman in your way she added in a murmur so you see in hunting lodgings you not only see how others live but how you seem to others it is certainly curious the places in which to dwell which one is shown in hunting lodgings once i was given to view a room in which was a strange table-like affair constructed of metal you wouldn't mind i suppose said the lady of the lodging if this remained in the room oh not at all i replied but what is it why it's an operating table she explained of course you know she added that i'm a physician and she continued of course i should want to make use of it now and then but not regularly not every day to a lady with a patch over her eye with lodgings to let in broom street i one time stated by way of being communicative that i was often in my room a good deal doing some work there 
Ah, with many ogles and grimaces, she whispered hoarsely, with an effort at a sly effect, that that was all right here. She understood, she said. Perfectly safe for that, it was. The gentleman who had the room before was something of the same kind. As you know, references frequently are demanded of one hunting lodgings. To get into a really nice place, one must really be a very nice person. You know I have a daughter, sighs the really nice landlady. To obtain lodgings in Kensington, one must be very well to do, particularly if one would be on the drawing-room floor. I like these rooms very much, I said to a prim person there, and I hesitated. But I suppose they are too dear for you, she said. How careful one must be hunting lodgings in England about extras. Lodgings made in the USA are all ready to live in when you have paid your rent. But over on the other side, you recall, the rent so amazingly cheap is merely an item. Light, coals, linen, and attendance are all extra. I met an interesting person letting lodgings in Whitechapel. She was not attractive physically. Her chief drapery was an apron. This indeed was fairly adequate before, but I think she was like the ostrich who sticks his head in the sand. My sister-in-law, a highly intelligent woman, there are, by the way, people who will think anything. Some may say that I am ending this article rather abruptly. My sister-in-law, a highly intelligent woman, used to say in compositions at school, when stumped by material too much for her, that she had in her eye, so to say, things too numerous to mention. Anybody who would chronicle his adventure in hunting lodgings is confronted by incidents, humorous, wild, bizarre, queer, strange, peculiar, sentimental, touching, tragic, weird, and so on and so forth, too numerous to mention. End of Essay 14 Essay 15 of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortis Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 15, My Friend the Policeman. To the best of my knowledge and belief, as a popular phrase has it, I am the only person in the United States who corresponds with a London policeman. About all you know about the London policeman is that he is a trim and well-set-up figure and an efficient-looking officer. When you have asked him your way, he has replied somewhat thus, Straight up the road, sir, take your first turning to the right, sir, and the second left, sir, and then at the top of the street you will find it directly before you, sir. You have perhaps heard that the London police force offers something like an honourable career to a young man, that bobbies are decently paid, that they are advanced systematically, may retire early on a fair pension, and that frequently they come from the country, as their innocent English faces and fresh complexions indicate. Sometimes also you have observed that in directing you they find it necessary to consult a pocket map of the town. Your general impression, doubtless, is that they are rather nice fellows. It was in Cheney Walk that I met my policeman. I had got off the bus at Battersea Bridge and was seeking my way to Oakley Street, where I had been directed to lodgings described as excellent. He was a large fat man with a heavy black moustache, and he had a very pleasant manner. When I came out that evening for a walk along the embankment, I came across him on Albert Bridge, at the bottom, as they say over there, of my street. "'You're still here, sir,' he remarked cheerfully. I asked him how long Mr. Whistler's Battersea Bridge had been gone, and he told me I forget how many years. He had seen it and had been here all the while. In the course of time, he directed me a good deal about in Chelsea, and so it was that I came to chat with him frequently in the evenings, for he came on at six and was off some time early in the morning. I was a source of some considerable interest to him with my odd foreign ways. "'When are you going home?' he asked me one day when our friendship had ripened. 
oh sometime in the fall i replied in the fall he queried in a puzzled way why yes i said september or october oh he remarked in the autumn and i heard him murmur musingly in the fall of the leaves sometimes i met him in the company of his colleague the biggin or a baby as i learned he was familiarly called a very tall man with enormous feet clad in boots that glistened like great mirrors who rocked as he walked like a ship my friend had very bright eyes they sparkled with merriment one day when he said to the biggin nodding toward me he's gone home in the fall it was a warm evening along the side of old father thames my friend with much graceful delicacy made it known to me that a drop of ile now and then did not go bad with one tried by the cares of a policeman so we set out for the nearby king's head and eight bells when we came to this public house i discovered that it was apparently absolutely impossible for my friend to go in he instructed me then in this way i was to go in alone and order for my friend outside a pint of mull and bitter in a tankard the potman he informed me would bring it out to him the expense of this refreshment was not heavy it came to one penny halfpenny the services of the obliging potman were gratuitous i found my friend in the pathway outside with the tankard between his hearty face and the sky when he had concluded his draught he thanked me smacked his lips wiped his mouth with a large handkerchief and hurried away as he said the inspector would be along presently just why the inspector would regard isle in the open air in view of the whole world less an evil than a tankard of mull and bitter in a public-house i cannot say but it may be that as long as one is in the open one can still keep an eye on one's duty i was hailed several days after this by my friend who approached rapidly well i thought he has been very useful to me and three halfpennies are not much i have something for you said my friend somewhat heated by his haste you have i said what is it it's a rose replied my friend a what i asked a flower said my friend recognizing that we did not speak exactly the same language you know what that is oh yes i know what a flower is i said where have you got it i have secreted it in the churchyard he replied i'll fetch it directly he added and was off when he returned through the gloaming he put the flower through my buttonhole a lady dropped it out of her carriage he said and i thought of you when i picked it up he stooped and smelled it hasn't it he said a lovely scent i had lived in new york a good while and i had somehow come to think of policemen rather as men of action than as poets but then in new york we do not dwell in a flowering garden we are not filled with a love of horses dogs and blossoms and we do not all speak unconsciously a literary language my friend was very eager that i should let him hear from me upon my return to the states and he particularly desired a postcard picturing a skyscraper so he gave me his address which was w c buckington p c beat dyerson chelsea police station king's road chelsea southwest in acknowledgment of my postcard i received a letter which i think should not remain in the obscurity of my coat pocket i wish to submit it to public attention as a model of all that a letter from a good friend should be and so seldom is there is an engaging modesty in so large a man's referring to himself continually with a little letter i my correspondent tells me of himself he gives me intimate news of the place of my recent sojourn he touches with taste and feeling upon the great subject of our time he conveys to me patently sincere sentiments of his good will and he leaves me with much appreciation of his excellent nature and honest heart occasional personal peculiarities in his style deviations in unessential things from the common form give a close personal touch to his message this is my friend's letter dear friend 
it is with great pleasure for to answer your postcard that i received this morning i was very pleased to receive it and to know that you are still in the land of the living i have often thought about you and as i had not seen you i thought you had gone home i have shown the card to jenkins and the tall one and also another policeman you know and they all wish me to remember them very kindly to you they was surprised to think you had taken the trouble to write to me they said he is a good old sort not forgetting the little drops we had at the six bells and king's head p h what do you think of this terrible war it is shocking i have just got the news that a cousin of mine is wounded and he is at clacton on sea he is a sergeant in the first coldstream guards got a wife and four children i have been on the sick list this last seventeen days suffering from rheumatism but i am better london is very quiet especially at night the pubs close at eleven m and half the lights in the streets are out such lights flashing all around two on hyde park corner to lambert bridge to war office dear friend i hope i shall have the pleasure to receive a letter from you before long now i think that this is all i have to say at present so will close with my best respects to you your sincere friend william charles buckington the letter which later i sent him was returned to me by the post office and that is all that i know of my friend man of ardent nature and gentle feeling lover of flowers london policeman gone perhaps to the wars cheney walk would not be cheney walk again to me without him End of essay fifteen essay sixteen of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay sixteen help wanted male female the people who because they think they don't need to do not read the help wanted ads in the newspapers really ought to do this anyway for a week or so in every year they are the people above all others that would be most benefited by this department of journalism now there is nobody who more than myself objects in his spirit to the very common practice of this one saying to that one that he or she ought to do this or that thing nobody knows all the circumstances in which another is placed some people insist upon saying under the circumstances but that is wrong one is surrounded by circumstances one is not under them as though they were an umbrella nobody ought to say under the circumstances however this is merely by the by it's a queer thing though that mr hilaire belloc who certainly writes some of the best english going says that under the and so forth is all right certainly it is not but as i said before this is not a point about which we are talking one ought to read want ads for many reasons for instance you can thus become completely mixed up as to whether or not you are still young young man wanted you will read about sixteen years of age in an office goodness gracious it does seem that this is an age of young very young men what chance does one of your years have now on the other hand you read wanted young man about thirty-five so well this is an age too you reflect in which people remain young there are no old folks any more they are out of fashion witness boy wanted strong about eighteen they uh, want ads ought particularly to be read at times when you have a very good job it is then especially that the reading of them is best for you they do or they ought to soften your arrogance if like mr rockefeller jr i were a teacher of a sunday school class which as mr dooley used to say i am not i would say the best religious teaching is to be found in the help wanted advertisements in the newspapers we will take up this morning these columns in this morning's papers 
as a matter of fact if you are out of a job i should strongly advise against your reading advertisements for help wanted in the first place nobody ever got a job through one of these advertisements i know this as the phrase is of my own knowledge then the influence of suggestion is very powerful in these announcements if you are without a position it is depressingly plain to you that you are totally unqualified to obtain one again of any account if you have a berth paying a living wage you perceive that some mysterious good fortune attends you and you are made humble by fear for yourself and compassionate towards others for who are you in heaven's name and what the devil do you know that you should make a living in this world in this world where there is wanted highly educated man having extensive business and social connection must be fluent correspondent in arabic japanese and swedish and an expert accountant knowledge of russian and the broadsword essential acquaintance with the subject of mining engineering expected experience in the diplomatic service desired gentlemen of impressive presence required highest credentials demanded salary to begin seven dollars knowledge undoubtedly is power still one seeking a position through want ads need not altogether despair a little further down these very catholic columns you will find that any person of ordinary intelligence common school education not necessary can make a thousand dollars a week writing for newspapers by our system taught by mail only ten minutes a day before going to bed required to learn one thing stands out above all others in advertisements for help wanted this is the land of hustle tinker tailor candlestick maker lawyer merchant priest if you are not a live wire you are not help wanted cook wanted on dairy farm twelve miles from town white industrious must be a live wire one that can get results no stick in the muds need apply uplifters and governments do not deal a more telling blow at the demon rum than do want ads there is no longer any job for the drinker bartender wanted in a very low place must be strict teetotaler the student of the help wanted columns will come to regard it as a very great mystery who floats all our public houses persons whose outlook on life is restricted to the dull round of one occupation and to one class of society will find a decidedly broadening influence in the perusal of help wanted ads a liberal and a humane education in the subject of the variety and picaresque quality of humanity's manifold activities and such persons will be made aware of their dark ignorance of many matters what for instance they will say is a bushelman a great many bushelmen are continually wanted it might be well to be one so much in constant demand is a bushelman has this welcome character something to do with the delectable grocery trade no my dears for though i never saw a bushelman i'd rather see than be one he engages in the tailoring business in the sweatshop way as well as i can make out there are people wanted in help wanted ads but not in real life to do nothing but travel in pleasant and historic places as companions to wealthy refined persons in delicate health there are people wanted in want ads to share attractive homes in fashionable country places whose duties will be to smoke excellent cigars and take naps in the afternoon and there are as romantic things to be found among help wanted ads as there are in the most romantic romances now lest it may be thought that some of the help wanted ads which i have written right out of my head to illustrate the type of each are somewhat fanciful i will copy out of yesterday's paper an advertisement which robinson crusoe hasn't anything on to put it thusly here you are wanted a man or woman to live alone on an island eight miles from shore food shelter clothing furnished no work no compensation summer time box g 532 times downtown 
I knew a man once who got several replies to advertisements for help wanted. He bought ten New York papers one Sunday and a dollar's worth of two-cent stamps. At ten o'clock in the evening he went out and stuffed the ballot box, I mean the letter box. He said in his own handwriting that he was an excellent man to be manager of the upper floors of an apartment house, that he was uncommonly experienced in the moving picture business and knew the screen from A to Izzard, that he had edited trade journals from the time he could talk, that he had an admirable figure for a clothing model, that he was very successful in interviewing bankers and brokers, that he was fond of children that he would like to add a sideline of metal polisher to his list, and that he certainly knew more about Bolivera than anybody else in the world, and would be prepared to head an expedition there by half-past two the following day. That man already had a job that he had got from a want ad. He had been copying letters at home, light, genteel work for one of artistic tastes but he found that one could not make any money out of it because after one had bought the outfit necessary one discovered that it was humanly impossible to copy the bloomin letters in the somewhat eccentric fashion required he got several replies as i said to his replies to want ads this man one was a postcard which read call to-morrow morning about work room nine five four horseshoe building x y z company considering himself a gentleman and being touchy about such things he was annoyed at this manner of addressing him on a postcard however he went to the horseshoe building room nine fifty four had a great many names on the door names there stated to be those of attorneys syndicates and corporations limited among these names was that of the x y z company within one side of room 954 was partitioned off into many little alcoves an antique though youthful dressed typist by the railing near the door showed our friend to the x y z company who was seated at a bleak looking desk in one of the little alcoves the alcove contained besides the company a little whiskered man wearing his hat and overcoat and the desk an empty waste-basket and one unoccupied chair it was a demonstrator that was wanted on a commission basis for a fluid to cleanse silver this alcove it developed was merely one of many thousand branch offices of the company scattered across the country the company's factory he said was over in new jersey a very large affair Mr. Bivens, that is the name of the gentleman of whom I have just been speaking, was invited to, this time, in a letter politely beginning, My dear sir, to call at the offices of a moving picture corporation. Asking to see M. T. Cummings, who had signed the letter, he was presented to an efficient-looking person, evidently an elderly retired showgirl, who directly proved him woefully deficient in knowledge of the screen. His next experience was with a portly, prosperous-looking gentleman who had elaborate offices in a very swell skyscraper. This man wrote an excellent business-like letter. He unfolded to H.T., I always affectionately called Bivens H.T., admiration-compelling plans for large business enterprises, which included a project of taking 500 American businessmen on a trip through Europe after the war at a cost to each one of only four dollars and a half, the balance of the expenses of each to be paid for in local business cooperation. Bivens was taken right into this energetic and enterprising man's confidence. He did considerable outside work for his employer for ten days. On the eleventh day, reporting at the office, he found the promoter's secretary and office boy awaiting him in company with his office furniture outside the locked door. Bivens next answered an advertisement for a strike-breaker to light street lamps and for a person to distribute handbills at a pay of seventy-five cents a day but his luck had changed. He never got another reply to any answer to a help-wanted ad. 
he thinks this is strange because he believes and i know this is true that he writes a letter which would instantly mark him as a man of high merit among the multitude but i once knew a man who put a help wanted ad in the paper he ran a hotel and he advertised for a clerk i was stopping at his place at the time i and my three brothers and the five of us mr Svuvel, the hotel man i and my three brothers used to bring up from the village every night for a week the place was in the country the mail which consisted of replies to this help wanted advertisement we used large sacks for this purpose end of essay sixteen essay seventeen of walking stick papers by robert cortis holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay seventeen human municipal documents a literary adventurer not long since found himself by one of the exigencies incident to his precarious career turning over in the process of cataloguing a kind of literature in which up to that time he had been very little read a public collection of published municipal documents this gentleman had had a notion for a good many years that municipal documents were entirely for very serious people engaged in some useful undertakings he had never conceived of them as works of humour and objects of art but his disinclination to this department of pure literature was dissolved as most prejudices may be by acquaintance with the subject municipal documents are human documents they are the autobiographies of communities the personalities of topeka kansas of limoges france and of heidelberg germany rise before the impressionable student of municipal documents like the figures of personal autobiography like benevenuto cellini marie bakertsev benjamin franklin miss mary mclean mr george moore a very touching quality of municipal documents is their naivete that unavoidable and unconscious self-revelation which is much of the great charm and value of all autobiographies by the way do statisticians really understand municipal documents or do they think them valuable simply because they are full of statements of fact our literary gentleman at all events found his task very engaging though as a cataloguer he was much perplexed by the extraordinary informality in one respect of formal public papers a curious provinciality as he could but take it to be of municipalities a very common neglect he found in such publications is to make any mention anywhere of the relation to geography of the community chronicling its history he would read for instance that the pamphlet in his hand was the auditor's report of receipts and expenditures for the financial year ending february tenth eighteen seventy five for the town of andover where he asked with absolute certainty was the town of andover here referred to he examined the printer's imprint which was explicit personally printed by warren f draper eighteen seventy five there was something very friendly about this printers of public documents seem to be an amiable neighborly lot printed at the enterprise office one mentions casually in a large warm-hearted fashion another imprint reads auburn printed by charles ferris daily advertiser office eighteen forty eight mr ferris in his lifetime was evidently a very pleasant man but a little careless of what to him no doubt were inessential details he was thoughtless of the dark ignorance in places remote from auburn of the daily advertiser another prominent auburnian of the same craft one w s morse it may be learned from some of the products of his press flourished in eighteen eighty six but the puzzled cataloguer inquires was mr morse successor to mr ferris or was he official printer to the government of auburn maine far from the scene of mr ferris's public services possibly in auburn new york to these picayune points the breezy gentlemen make no reference 
the worker with public documents turns from the title pages to search the documents themselves are these the proceedings of the board of chosen freeholders of the city of albany missouri or of albany new hampshire a cataloguer has a faint impression that there is an albany too somewhere in the state of new york is this a copy of warrant for annual town meeting of lancaster massachusetts or new hampshire or pennsylvania impossible he thinks that there should be no internal evidence he reads on and on he notes the intimate nature of an article nineteen to see if the town will accept a gift from hannah f bigelow with conditions he peruses selectman's accounts of expenditures how there was paid on account of grammar school such or such an amount he learns the cost of hay scales the expense of fire department cemetery street lamps he peers behind the official scenes at decoration day monies paid out of the public treasury for brass band address twenty dollars flowers flags tuning piano he goes over appropriations for repairs at almshouse he sits with the trustees of memorial hall and informs himself concerning conditions at the lunatic hospital he follows with feeling municipal accessions purchase of a road scraper which we find a very useful machine and probably money judiciously expended but more and more amazed at the circumstance as he continues he is left totally in the dark as to where he is all the while sometimes the mention made necessary in connection with plans for some public improvement of a well-known river say revealed the town's location occasionally the comparative antiquity of the civilization supplied inspiration for a good guess as to its situation that it was the town of that name in new england rather than the one in oklahoma multiplied clues of identity again built up a case official ballot ran the title for precinct w attleboro tuesday november three eighteen ninety six the name william m olin was given as that of the secretary of the commonwealth of the first page that was all in heaven's name exclaimed the cataloguer what commonwealth a study of the list of candidates on this ballot giving their places of residence however fortifies one's natural supposition of worcester of lynn of haverhill of amherst of pittsfield ah of boston it is a reasonable surmise that this ballot pertains to the commonwealth of massachusetts it is not here stated that the name of its native state is never discovered in the whole of any american municipal document often in some indirect allusion somewhere in the text it may be found frequently too it is true the state seal is printed upon the title page or cover of the volume and in instances the name of the state stands out clearly enough upon the page of title but in case after case in the occupation giving rise to this paper the only expedient was recourse to a file of city directories collating names of streets in these with those mentioned in the documents another curious idiosyncrasy of one branch of public document which informs the labor of cataloguing them with something of the alluring fascination of putting together jigsaw picture puzzles spoke in the words of artemus ward sarcastic is the extraordinary variety of names that can be found by municipalities to entitle the mayor's annual eloquence this versatile character may deliver himself of an annual address message communication statement or of remarks a cataloguer was surprised to discover in an act to incorporate and vest certain powers in the freeholders and inhabitants of the village of brooklyn in the county of kings the prophetic enlightenment of the inhabitants of the village in the year eighteen sixteen 
the voice of andrew carnegie colonel roosevelt and professor brander matthews speaks in the following passage that the section of the town of brooklyn commonly known as the fire district and contained within the following bounds viz beginning at the public landing south of pierpont's distillery formerly the property of philip livingston deceased on the east river thence running along the public road leading from said landing to its intersection with red hook lane thence along red hook lane to where it intersects jamaica turnpike road thence a northeast course to the head of the wallaba mill pond thence through the centre of said mill pond to the east river and thence down the east river to the place of beginning shall continue to be known and distinguished by the name of the village of brooklyn through certainly is phonetic spelling it was the sterling character of these villages that then laid the foundation for the better half of a mighty city to come the act includes and then and there proceed to elect five discreet freeholders resident within said village to be trustees thereof so witness is borne to this vernacular quality of discretion in the twilight of brooklyn history the aesthetic consideration of municipal documents has not received much attention the format of a municipal document however is in itself a delightful essay in unconscious self-characterization those of the united states express a plain democratic people they have in fact all the commonness of the job printer printed at the journal office is indeed their physical character the municipal documents of great britain are usually bound in good english book cloth that peculiar fabric to which the connoisseur of books is so sensitive and which for some inexplicable reason it is apparently impossible to manufacture in this country or in neat boards with cloth backs or if in paper it is of an interesting colour and texture a noble heraldic device the coat of arms of the city or borough is stamped in gold above or below the title this is repeated upon the title page the topography of which is not without distinction the paper has more refinement than that used in such american publications the effect in fine is of something aristocratic the mayoral minutes of kensington is rather a handsome quarto volume an added touch of distinction is given these british volumes by the presentation card tipped in after the front cover a really exquisite little thing is this one it bears placed with great nicety its coat of arms above delicately reduced in size across the middle in beautiful sensitive type it reads with the city accountant's compliments in the lower left corner in two lines guildhall gloucester the municipal documents of germany are very german verwaltungsbericht is one of those extraordinary words which are so long that when you look at one end of the word you cannot see the other end these volumes sometimes might possibly be mistaken by a foreigner for gift books often they are bound in pronounced german taste in several strong colors in a striking combination buttressing the decorative german letters on cover and title page appears some one of various conventionalizations of the german eagle made very black and wearing a crown and carrying a sceptre in verwaltungsberichte des magistrats der königlichen haupt und residenzstadt hanover neunzehn hundert sechs und sieben the frontispiece the armorial bearings wappen der königlichen and so forth is a powerfully colored lithograph a very ornate affair of lions of egg yolk yellow armor and leaves and castles these german publications are filled with excellent photographs of public places and buildings and extensive unfolding colored maps and diagrams a gentleman with a taste for art viewed with much admiration a handsome plate of des dresdener wassenwerks 
They contain, too, these volumes, multitudes of pictures of distinguished citizens, often photogravures from official paintings. These gentlemen sometimes appear decorated with massive orders, or again decorated simply with very German expressions of countenance. The Chronique der Haupt- und Residenzstadt Stuttgart, 1902, somewhat suggests bound volumes of Jugend, with its heavy pen and ink head and tailpiece, of women marketing, of a bride and groom kneeling at the altar, and one, an excellent little drawing of a horse mounting with a heavily laden wagon a rise of ground, the driver beside him and a street lamp behind protruding from below remember this is a municipal document a quaint little duodecimo is the jahrbuch vor der stadt delft with little headpieces pictorially representing the seasons and a curiously woodcut astrologer introducing den almanac a rather square-toed kind of a little volume neatly bound in grey boards and very nicely printed having altogether an effect of housewifely cleanliness is the verslag van den tostand der gemeente harlan over et jahr eighteen ninety four door burgemeister on wetolders utbracht on den gevenstraat imprint gedruckt Pige Gerb Nobels de Arlem. The language of Great Britain's municipal documents is lofty. The Royal Borough of Kensington, minute of His Worship the Mayor, Sir H. Seymour King, K. C. I. E. M. P., for the year ending November 1901. Here is printed the design of a quartered shield containing a crown, a papal hat, and two crosses, and beneath the motto quid nobis ardui printed continues the reading by order of the council thirtieth october nineteen o one james truscott and son printer suffolk lane e c and in the following there is something of the rumble of the history of england addresses presented from the court of common council to the king on his majesty's accession to the throne and on various other occasions and his answers resolutions of the court granting the freedom of the city to several noble personages with their answers instructions at different times to the representatives of the city in parliament petitions to parliament for different purposes resolutions of the court on the memorial of the livery to request the lord mayor to call a common hall for returning thanks to lord chatham and his answer for erecting a statue in guildhall to william beckford esq late lord mayor agreed to between the twenty third october seventeen sixty and the thirteenth october seventeen seventy printed by henry fenwick printer to the honourable city of london henry fenwick esq takes himself with dignity but to turn from the pomp of state to peep for a moment at the intimate life of the people of england a couple of centuries ago few things could be better than the constable's accounts of the manor of manchester from which a few items of disbursements are cited paid expenses apprehending two felons one shilling paid expenses maintaining them two nights in the dungeon two shillings to anne duncan very ill to take her over into ireland four shillings to straw for the dungeon four shillings to bellman sundry public cries seven shillings sixpence to three pair of stockings and dying for the beadle nine shillings to wine drinking royal health the prince's birthday at his full age three pounds sixteen shillings sixpence to a distressed sailor to liverpool one shilling paid bonfire on king's coronation day six shillings sixpence gave nancy mckean a stroller sixpence paid musicians at rejoicing for good news from germany and on birth of the prince of wales two pounds seven shillings paid for a cat with nine tails three shillings to a lame stranger one shilling paid lighting lamps last dark two shillings sixpence several fortune-tellers indicted etc twelve shillings 
paid lawyer Nagave, advising Roger Blomley's case, bringing actions against the constable for putting him in the dungeon for being drunk on Sunday in time of divine service, one pound, one shilling. It is interesting to note in this connection that on August 16, 1762, was paid one Barnard Shaw maintenance of rioters and evidence, one pound, eleven shillings, sixpence a circumstance of considerable human interest too and one possibly little known is the great aversion to the sight of bears held by the inhabitants of the isle of wight at least in the year eighteen ninety one a copy of the by-laws of the administrative county of the isle of wight issued that year contains following articles relating to regulating the sale of coal and spitting this as to bears one no bear shall be taken along or allowed to be upon any highway unless such bear shall be securely confined in a vehicle closed so as to completely hide such bear from view two any person who shall offend against these by-laws shall be liable to a fine not exceeding in any case five pounds Ati del Municipale, Ati del Consiglio Communal di Siena, Bolotino degli Ati Publicati dalla Gionti Municipale di Roma. It is fitting that quartos of such titles as these, containing addresses beginning Signori Consiglieri and Onorevoli Signori, should look somewhat like Italian opera and be bound in vellum title and date stamped in gold on bright red and purple labels with sides of mottled purple boards and imprints such as bologna regia tipografia fratelli merlana and of typography the best and on genuine paper far from the wood pulp of american municipal graft contracts once indeed municipal documents were august pages some of the early italian and german are on paper that will last as long as the law and in these times the title pages of municipal documents were piranesiesque massive architectural scroll work framing stone tablets hung with garlands of fruit and grain and decorated with carved lions human heads and histrionic masks and initial letters throughout to correspond now who but france would bind her municipal documents in heavily tooled full levant morocco with grained silk inside covers end of essay seventeen essay eighteen of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay eighteen as to people it is a very pleasant thing to go about in the world and see all the people among the finest people in the world to talk with are scrub women bartenders particularly those in very low places are not without considerable merit in this respect policemen and trolley-car conductors have great social value rustic ferrymen are very attractive intellectually but for a feast of reason and a flow of soul i know of no society at all comparable to that of scrub women it is possible that you do not cultivate scrub women that is your misfortune let me tell you about my scrub woman i know only this one i regret to say but she i take it is representative her name ah what does it matter her name the thing beyond price is her mind there is stored in opulence all the ready-made language the tag-ends of expression coined by modern man but she does not use this rich dross as others do she touches nothing that she does not adorn she turns the familiar into the unexpected which is precisely what great writers do to employ her own expression she's a hot sketch all right she did not like the former occupant of my office no she told me that she could not bear a hair of his head it seems that some altercation occurred between them and whatever it was she had to say she declares that she told it to him in black and white 
this gentleman it seems was the very old boy though my scrubwoman admits that she herself is a sarcastic piece of goods by way of emphasis she invariably adds to her assertions believe me her son she has a son has much trouble with his feet his mother says that if he has gone to one shoeopodist he has gone to a dozen my scrubwoman tells me that she is the only fair one of her family her people it appears are all olive my scrubwoman is a widow she has told me a number of times of the last days of her husband it is a touching story she realized that the end was near and humored him in his idea of returning before it was too late to the old country one day when he had asked her again if she had got the tickets and then turned his face to the wall to cough she said to herself good night shirt but most of the discourse of my scrubwoman is cheerful she is a valiant figure a brave being very fond of the society of her friends of whom i hold myself to be one who works late at night and talks continually i know that if you would contrive to find favor with your scrubwoman you would often be like that person told of by mine who laughed until she thought his heart would break the most brotherly car conductors naturally are those with not over much business those on lines in remote places i remember the loss i suffered not long ago on a suburban car which results i am sorry to say in your loss also the bell signalling to stop rang and a vivaciously got-up woman with an extremely broad at the base pear-shaped torso arose and got herself carefully off the car the conductor went forward to assist her when he returned aft he came inside the car and sat on the last seat with two of us who were his passengers the restlessness was in him which betrays that a man will presently unbosom himself of something this finally culminated in his remarking as if simply for something to say to be friendly you notice that lady that just got off back there well he continued leaning forward having received a look intended to be not discouraging that's the mother of cora splits the little actress that lady's the mother of cora splits the little actress is that so exclaimed one who was his passenger not wishing to deny him the pleasure he expected of having excited astonishment a car conductor leads a hard life poor fellow and one should not begrudge him a little pleasure like that the conductor twisted away his face for an instant while he spat tobacco juice thus cleared for action he returned to the subject of his thoughts that's the mother of cora splits he repeated again she's at white plains to-night cora is cora and me he said as one that says ah me what a world it is cora and me was chums once yes sir we was chums and went to school together some valuable reminiscences of the distinguished woman dating back to days before the world dreamed of what she would become by one who played with her as a child doubtless would have been told but the conductor was interrupted a great many people got off some others got on the car just then and he went forward to collect fares from these and the thread was broken at my journey's end i recollect i went into a public-house there was a person there whose presence made a deep impression upon my memory a fine stocky lad with a great square jaw heavy beery jowls and a blue-black bearded chin in a blue striped collar he put both hands firmly on the bar rail at a good distance apart straightened his arms taut and his body at right angles with them so that he resembled a huge carpenter's square then curled his back finely in and said with a significant look at the man behind the bar give me one of them shells a thin glass of beer was set before him he relaxed straightened up and drank off its contents then apparently feeling that he was observed he looked very unconcernedly all about the room and appeared to be bored he then examined very attentively a picture on the wall and his neck seemed to be temporarily stiff 
I can see him now, I am happy to say, as plain as print. One's mind is indeed a great photograph album. How precious to one it will be when one is old and may sit all day in a house by the sea and, so to say, turn the leaves. That is why one should be going about all the while in one's vigor with an alert and an open mind. Wives are picturesque characters, too. I mind me of my friend Billy Henderson's new wife. Billy Henderson's wife looks like a balloon. She's so fat that she has busted down the arches of her feet. In order to fight flesh, she walks a great deal. She walks a mile every day and then takes a car back home. Her father comes over from Philadelphia once every week to see her because she is so homesick. For months after she was married, she just cried all the time. She was so homesick. She never goes to the movies. The movies make her cry. One time she saw at the movies a hospital scene. It horrified her for days. A friend of hers is about to be married, but she has told her friend that she cannot go to the wedding. Weddings always make her cry so. She just can't read the war news. It is too terrible. It affects her so that she can't sleep a bit. She hasn't read any of it at all, and she says she has no idea who is winning the war. She takes some kind of capsules to reduce flesh, which cost six dollars for fifty. She has taken twenty-five. The extension of the draft age being spoken of, she said to Billy, "'Dearie, I'll put you under the bed where they won't get you.' She doesn't want to vote, and she can't understand why anyone should want to go to polls and vote and all that kind of thing. Billy Henderson's wife is handsome. She is rich. She is an excellent cook. She loves Billy Henderson. End of Essay 18《Essay Nineteen of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Essay Nineteen, Humors of the Bookshop. The panorama before his view is the human mind. He panders to its diverse follies, consults its varied wisdom. He stands umbrella-less in the reign of all its idiosyncrasies. Why has he not lifted up his voice? He, the book clerk that lives among countless volumes of confessions, whose daily task is to wrestle hour by hour with a living comedie humaine, has the constant spectacle of so many books been astringent in its effect upon any latent creative impulse? Or has he been dumb in the colloquial sense, forsooth, a figure like Mr. Whistler's guard in the British Museum? sundry lettered booksellers of england have indeed given us some reminiscences of bookselling and its humours but they were the old boys they belonged to an old order and reflected another day as physicians are called the faculty and counsellors at law the profession writes boswell the booksellers of london are called the trade let us look into this trade as it is to-day we said so for a space we played we were a book clerk there are two decidedly contradictory popular conceptions of the man whose business it is to sell books one is the sentimental notion of an old gentleman in a stovepipe hat a dreamer and an idealist who keeps a second-hand stall the most delightful pictures of him are in the pages of anatole france he is a man of much erudition and books are his wife and family food and drink then there is the other idea why is it we report the remark of an important-looking gentleman in a high hat that clerks in bookstores never know anything about books or anything else was perhaps not far from his thought this gentleman it was readily perceived had an idea that he had said something rather good but it was not new this conception of the book clerk is one of the world's seven jokes brother to that of the mother-in-law the book clerk of this view is a familiar figure in the pages of humour like the talkative barber or the comic irishman of the vaudeville stage a stock character 
his illiteracy is classic his ignorant sayings irresistible he was sired by charles Keen and damned by punch phil may was his godfather and every industrious humorist employs him periodically these two ideas of the book business are perhaps reconciled by the popularly cherished sentiment that booksellers are not what they were newspapers from time to time print feature articles about the days when booksellers knew books if you ask a salesman in a modern bookshop if he has prayed you of course expect him to reply i have sir or madam but it doesn't seem to do any good well at the zoo there is humour from the inside looking out as well as from the outside looking in the book clerk is in the position to remark certain human phenomena patent to him beyond the view of any other most curious perhaps among them a pleasant hypocrisy oh pearls a sweet lady pausing to glance for the space of a second at her surroundings i think books are just fine i love to be in a bookstore rattles a vivacious young lady books have the greatest fascination for me says another a young lady waiting for friends looks out of the front door the entire time her friends express regret at having kept her waiting oh she exclaims i have been so happy here glancing quickly around at the books i should just like to be left here a couple of years there is a respectful pause by all for an instant each bringing into her face an expression of adoration for the dear things of the mind then chatting gaily the party hastens away we turn to hear oh wouldn't you love to live in a bookshop what is it that all men say in a bookshop the great say it even and the far from great each in his turn looks solemnly at his companion or at the salesman and says of the making of books there is no end then each in his turn lights into a smile he has said something pretty good there are persons esteemed on their reputation says the imitation of christ who by showing themselves destroy the opinion one had of them though one might think it would be the other way it is difficult indeed to sell a book to a friend of the author oh i know the man who wrote that is the reply i wouldn't read a book of his you see a great writer must be dead a common error of book buyers is to confuse the words edition and copy let me have a clean edition of this is frequently asked once a lady asked for something bound in gingham no one it is our belief ever sold a light book to a japanese they are the book clerk's dread terribly intelligent somewhat unintelligible in their handling of our language they always want something exceedingly difficult to find something usually on military or political science harbor construction or the most recondite form of philosophy then there are the remarkable people who keep up with the flood of fiction who say oh i've read that in a tone that implies that they are not so far behind as that have you no new novels they inquire novels get old one might suppose like eggs in a couple of days the quest of these seekers of books suggests the story of the lady in a public library who upon being told that seven new novels had come in that morning said give me please the one that came in last there are two those singular folks who appear regularly every year just before christmas buy a great quantity of books for presents and disappear again until the next year just before the holiday season what we have wondered do they do about books the rest of the time ministers are always very trying characters to book clerks beware of the gallery says a fellow serf to us there's a minister browsing around up there the official servants of the lord fall in the book clerk's mind into that class technically described by him as stickers all gentlemen wearing high hats also belong to this classification deaf customers are embarrassing for the reason that one always addresses one's next customer as though he were deaf too foreigners are invariably very polite to clerks 
they bow when they enter and take off their hats upon leaving very respectful people there said a fellow thrall come two old women in the door now if i were my ancestor i'd dance around that table with a stone club and brain them as it is they ask have you hopkinson smith's gondola days he says i think so a lady very rich and important looking wants a book without an unpleasant ending i wonder how this is looking at the last page no closing the book with a thump that won't do a gentleman orders two sets of the prayer book and hymnal to be marked upon the cover with his name the words grace church and his pew number he informs us that every year while he is away in the summer his set of these books is stolen tis a merry life the book clerks and a hard one customers two youngish women can you wait on us they want to get something do not know just what for a present oh no they say we don't want anything like so big a set as that something nicely bound a copy of cranford is near by oh when i read it i didn't think it much good poetry no i don't think she is much interested in poetry do you suppose an art book no she is not interested in art memoirs then no she would not care for that why i had no idea said one somewhat reprovingly to us that it would be as hard as this a calling which requires the practitioner to turn easily from the recondite gentleman inquiring the author of religious teachers of ancient greece to consideration of the problem no less recondite of a lady anxious to find something to entertain a child of five and a half inculcates some degree of mental agility i want said the very fashionable lady to get a book for an old man a uh, with some petulance very stupid old man i want from a serious old lady to get a book for a young man studying for the ministry i want exclaimed a very smart apparition a dashing book for a man what is the best book on russia do you know now if this is a good story there are so many poor books nowadays says a large uncommonly black lady i want spears of wheat number three discovered to be a prayer book i want the latest book please on how to bring up a baby i'd like to see what you have on physical research can you recommend a book for a young man with softening of the brain poor fellow he's in bloomingdale is there any discount to christian workers do you know a demure person an awful blank look coming over her face what i want has gone quite out of my head there is an appealing look for help something american in a patrician voice for the ladies to read going over on the boat this is american now is it new york society ah very good have you anything about the rocky mountains or that sort of thing now we see coming the man who has been directed in a letter from his wife to get a certain book about which he knows nothing and the title of which he cannot decipher here is a person asking for comfort books for the sick here is mrs so-and-so who tells us her husband is very ill unconscious she has to sit up by him all night and must have something very amusing to divert her mind here is the angry man to whom by mistake was sent a book inscribed to my good wife and true heaven help the poor book clerk when the same good wife and true comes in with her present of a naughty book with humorous remarks written in it now how do you like the job end of essay nineteen Essay twenty of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortis Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay twenty The Deceased. I think it was William Hazlitt's brother who remarked that no young man thinks he will ever die. Whoever it was, he was a mysterious person who lives for us now in that one enduring observation. This is his literary remains, his complete works 
and many a man has written a good deal more and said a good deal less than that concerning that animal man in swift's phrase who as sir thomas brown observes begins to die when he begins to live no young man i should say reads obituary notices they are hardly live news to him most of us i fancy regard these items more or less as dead matter which papers for some reason or other are obliged to carry but old people i have noticed those whose days are numbered whose autumnal friends are fast falling as if leaf by leaf from the creaking tree those regularly turn to the obituary columns which doubtless is filled with what are personals for them and yet if all but knew it there is not in the press any reading so improving as the obits to use the newspaper term none of so softening and refining a nature none so calculated to inspire one with the christian feelings of pity and charity with the sentiment of malice toward none to bring anon a smile of tender regard for one's fellow-mortals to teach that man is an admirable creature full of courage and faith withal constantly striving for the light interesting beyond measure that his destiny is divinely inscrutable that dust unto dust all men are brothers and that he man is in the words of urn burial a noble animal splendid in ashes and pompous in the tomb i doubt very much indeed whether any one could read obituaries every day for a year and remain a bad man or woman in many respects the best obituaries are to be found in country papers there in country papers none ever dies it may be because as it is said the country is nearer to god than the town but so it is that there in country papers in the fullness of time or by the fell clutch of chance one enters into his final rest or passes from his earth life or one on wednesday last peacefully accepted the summons to eternity or on thursday it may be passed to his eternal reward died is indeed a hard word it has never found admittance to hearts that love and esteem whitman was it not when he heard that carlyle was dead went out in the night and looked up at the stars and said that he did not believe it even so are not all who take their passing highly esteemed in country papers in small places doubtless death wears for the community a more tragic mien than in cities where it is more frequent and where we knew not him that lies on his bier next door but one way in the country places this man who is now no longer upright and quick was a neighbor to all and the provincial writer of obituaries follows a high authority another rustic poet deathless and known throughout the world who sang of his hoosier friend he is not dead but just away when one enters upon his last role in this world which all fill in their turn he becomes in rural journals that personage known throughout the countryside as the deceased it might be argued that alas the only thing you can do with one deceased is to bury him it might be held that you cannot educate him that he the deceased cannot enter upon the first steps of his career as a bookkeeper that he cannot marry the daughter of the governor of the state that whatever happened to him whatever he accomplished enjoyed endured in his pilgrimage through this world he experienced before he became as it is said deceased that in short he is now dead and that it should be said of him as we say in the metropolitan press as a young man mr doe did this and later that but in places simpler and so more eloquent than the metropolis the final fact of one's existence colors all the former things of his career in country obituaries all that has been done was done by the deceased in this association of ideas between the prime and the close of life is to be felt a sentiment which knits together each scene this mr someone did not merely apprentice himself to a printer at fourteen as city papers say it and marry at twenty-one 
but he that is now deceased was once full of hope and strength at fourteen and in the brave days of twenty-one did he that is now struck down plight his troth so doubtless runs the thought in that intimate phrase so dear to country papers the deceased and there are no funerals in the country that is a word funeral of too forbidding ominous a sound to be under the broad and open sky there where the neighbors gather all those who knew and loved the departed from a boy the last sad rites are read and the mortuary services are performed then from the fruitful valley where he dwelt after his fathers and their fathers he mounts again the old red hill bird enchanted he is not buried though he rests in the warm clasp of the caressing earth buried has an inhuman sound as though a man were a bone the deceased is always interred or he may be laid to rest or his interment takes place now it is in these biographical annals of small places that one finds the justest estimates of life there folks are valued for what they are as well as for what they do inner worth is held in regard equally with the flash and glitter of what the great world calls success i was reading just the other day of a late gentleman aged sixty-one whose principal concern appeared to be devotion to his family his filial feeling was indeed remarkable it was told that after the death of his parents three years ago he had resided with his sister after his attachment to his own people his chief interest apparently was in the things of the mind in literature he had never engaged in business it was said but he was a great reader he could talk intelligently on many topics which interested him and in the circles which he frequented he was admired that is it was thought that he was quite a bright man who would not feel in this sympathetic record of his goodly span something of the charm of the modest nature of this man again there was the recent intelligence concerning william jackson a colored gentleman employed as a deckhand on a pleasure craft in this harbor who met his demise in an untimely manner clothes do not make the man nor doth occupation decree the bearing this is a great and fundamental truth very clearly grasped by the country obituary and much obscured elsewhere on the other hand positively nowhere else does the heart to dare and the power to do find such generous recognition as in the obituaries of country papers the prominence of blacksmiths general storekeepers undertakers notaries public and other townspeople bright in local fame has been made a jest by urban persons of a humorous inclination who take scorn of merit because it is not vast merit pleasing to contemplate in contrast to this waspish spirit is the noble nature of the country obituary inspiration to humanism here was a man to the seeing eye of sterling stamp he attended public grammar school where he profited by his opportunities in obtaining as good an education as possible etc later in life he became well and favorably known for his conservative and sane business methods and was esteemed by his associates it is said fraternally and otherwise he was mourned by those who survived him as people are not mourned in cities that is frankly in a manner undisguised country obituaries are not afraid to be themselves and this is their appeal to the human heart they are the same in spirit identical in turn of phrase from maine to california from the gulf to the upper provinces that is one of the remarkable things about them you might expect to come across here or there a writer of country paper obituaries out of step as it were with his fellow mutes so to put it one raising his voice in a slightly off or different key a trace in short of the hand of some student of the modes of thought of the world beyond his bosky dell or rolling plain but it is not so in any paper truly of the countryside and perhaps that is well 
A type of obituary which very likely is read generally in cities is that of slow growth and released from the newspaper office morgue as occasion calls. One such timely and capable biographical account is waiting for each of us that is a vice president, king, lord of great dominions, high commander of armed forces, intellectual immortal of any kind, recognized superman in this or that. Big chief anywhere, or beloved popular idol, nicely proportioned according to our space value. Of course, if we are a very great mogul, indeed, we get a display head on the first page upon the dramatic occasion of our exit. But generally speaking, this type of matter would run somewhere between the seventh and the thirteenth or fifteenth page, according to the number of pages of the issue of the paper coinciding with the date of the ending of our day's work there if we are pretty important we should lead the column and take a two-line head with a pendant comb this altogether would announce to the passing eye that we went out as the poet edwin arlington robinson puts it in such or such a year of our age that pneumonia or what not took us that we were a member of one of the city's oldest families that a family breach was healed at the death of our sister, or the general points of whatever it is that makes us interesting to the paper's circulation. We are likely to have a date line and a brief dispatch from Rome, or Savannah, or wherever we happen to be, when we shuffle off, stating that we have done so. This is to be followed by a shirt-tail dash then begins a beautifully dispassionate and highly dignified recital of the salient facts connected with our career which may run to a couple of sticks or even did our activities command it turn the column or suppose for the sake of our discussion that your achievements have not been quite of the first rank you get a one-line head a subhead and a couple of paragraphs somebody has exclaimed concerning how much life it takes to make a little art just so how much life it takes to make a very little obituary in the great city early and late day in and day out week in and week out month in and month out in the sun's hot eye of summer through the winter's blizzard year after year for thirty-six years you have been a busy practicing physician you have lived in the thick of births and life and death for thousands of hours what you know and have lived and have seen would fill rows of volumes you are a distinguished member of many learned societies widely known as an educator you are good for about a hundred and fifty words perhaps not perhaps you were a person of rather minor importance you are uh, that is you were we will say an astronomer or you were a mineralogist or a former alderman or something like that so you call for a paragraph with a head your virtues and your vices have been many you were three times married as mr bennett says of another of like momentous history the love of life was in you three times you rose triumphant over death goodness what a novel you would make you call for a paragraph with a head all your clubs are given you are doing pretty well many of us just somebodies but nobodies in a special particular do not have a separate head at all but go in a group into the feature obituary notes our names are set in caps and we have a brisk paragraph apiece admirable pieces of composition pellucid compact nervous our stories are contained in these dry point like portraits stripped of all that was occasional accidental ephemeral leaving alone the essential facts such as for instance that we were say a civil engineer i think it would be well for each of us occasionally to visualize his obituary note this should have the effect of clarifying our outlook amid the welter of existence what is it that we are above all to do to thine own self be true you are a husband a father and a civil engineer that is all that matters in the end but after all obituaries in a great city are for the elect the great majority of us have none at all in print 
what we were is indeed graven on the hearts that knew us and told in the places where we have been but in the written word we go into the feature headed died a department similar in design to that on the literary page headed books received we are arranged alphabetically according to the first letter of our surnames we are set in small type with lines following the name line indented it is difficult for me to tell with certainty from the printed page but i think we are set without leads here again frequently the reader comes upon the breath of affection the hand of some one near to the one that is gone beloved husband of blank and he is touched by the realization that even in the rushing city somewhere unseen amid the hard glitter and the gay scene to-day warm hearts are torn and that simple grief throbs in and makes perennially poignant a bromidian phrase as this column lengthens the paragraphs shorten until is reached what seems to me the most moving obituary of all that most eloquent of the destiny of men row richard twelve seventy two west ninety sixth street december thirty aged fifty four it is like to the most moving line perhaps in modern literature for nowhere else i think is there one of such simplicity and grandeur as this from the old wives tale he had once been young and he had grown old and was now dead end of essay twenty essay twenty one of walking stick papers by robert cortes holliday this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty one a town constitutional there is certainly no more grotesque fallacy than that humorously bigoted notion so generally entertained particularly by our friends of other nations at any rate before the war that the only thing in the world for which we as a people care is success as measured by money a walk about any day will give this ridiculous idea a black eye any one with ears to his head will perceive that we scorn things which are to be had for money money what is that Pyuch! everybody has it it is mine it is yours it is nothing trash any one with a brain-pan under his hat will recognize inside of half an hour that we are anything but a nation of shopkeepers spiritually it is as plain as a pikestaff that we are a nation of perfectly rabid idealists it is sounded on every side that the things which we most fervently prize inordinately covet envy possession of and hold most proudly are precisely those things which the wealth of the indies would not procure to wit jimmy was a waiter humble but celebrated as a waiter among a circle an admirer of jimmy's a journalist continually on the lookout for copy wrote him up for a paper at space rates thence till the day broadway suffered his loss by untimely death did jimmy fold and unfold his worn clipping to exhibit with a full heart this tribute to him which was of a kind as he never failed to say which money could not buy it is reported upon occasionally reliable authority that jimmy's last words in a faint whisper were money could not have bought and then he went on his way so it was too with a tobacconist whom i knew who had an article framed which referred to his shop in such a paper too he exclaimed a hundred times a day money would not have bought it your aunt has a lot of old spavined furniture which would bring about tuppence at public sale some of it was your great aunt's all of it has been in the family from time immemorial and its peculiar and considerable value your aunt and your neighbors are agreed resides in the esoteric fact that it is the kind of thing which money couldn't buy health is a great blessing and we are repeatedly told we should prize it beyond measure as it is a thing that money will not buy his money it is commonly said of a rich man in bereavement will not bring his son back to life 
the impotency of money in the life of the spirit is notorious among us of a deceased miser we declare with satisfaction well he can't take his money with him and money the righteous well know will get none into heaven what is the moving theme that holds the multitude at the movie theatre bound in a spell what is it that answers deep unto deep between the literature vended at drug stores and the people concern for money overthrown by idealism the triumph of ethereal love over the base temptation of lucre is it not so the rich wooer in the top hat and the elegant easter parade coat is turned away and the poor lover with his flannel shirt open at the collar and a dinner pail hung upon his arm is chosen for bluebird happiness and the heart of the maligned masses is satisfied money the conviction has passed into an industrious bromidium will not buy happiness i knew a man who had a wife and he was told by sage counsellors that if he would treat her right she would give him what money could not buy but what need is there to multiply examples take a turn around the block and return with the wisdom that money cannot buy come get your stick and let us go a beneficent providence sir has caused it to be that the finest shows in this world are free of all men nature charges no admission fee the dawn and the evening are gratis in the matter of art the performance of the little men of the passing hour are to be seen in bond street on the avenue and at the academies and societies for a price but those treasure-houses of the enduring masterpieces the great museums of the world demand naught from him that hath nothing a collector of customs sitteth at the golden door of the movies but the far more delightful and far more human shows shown in the show windows are quite free for all to see and to those blessed ones whose eyes have not lost their innocence and whose hearts remain sweet and simple the costly spectacles of the world are but tawdry vanity as compared with the feasts of entertainment enacted daily in show windows one of the very best theatres in this country for entertainments of this nature is lower sixth avenue though the bowery is not to be overlooked and the passionate lover of pleasure should not neglect any business thoroughfare which presents a particularly shabby appearance the actors and actresses in these fascinating histrionic presentations are not called comedians and tragedians comedians and tragedians but demonstrators the effect of their performances thus is twofold they gratify the spectator's sense of the humorous or the curious and they demonstrate to his intelligence the value of something with whose merits possibly he is not acquainted there are not many things in life i think which you find pleasanter than this you are slightly obstructed in your perambulations in a fine afternoon by a small knot of loiterers pausing before a shop window in which an active young man of admirably mobile countenance is holding forth in dumb show your progress is slackened as you edge about the throng with the intention of proceeding on your way as it were you poise on the wing then like a warming liqueur stealing through the veins the awakening of your interest in the artful antics of this young man makes fainter and fainter your will to proceed on your course until it dies softly away what is this ridiculous thing he is doing by its magnetism it has at any rate become for you the supreme interest for the moment of the universe with a horrible grimace the young man yanks fiercely at his cravat it does not budge or at least only very slightly with still further display of energetic effort accompanied by a ferocious expression of pained and enraged exasperation he yanks again no the cravat is stuck fast behind within the collar with a gesture of hopeless despair and a face of pitiful woe the young man abandons his struggle with the ordinary kind of cravat which loops around the neck and which foolishly enough is so universally worn 
You see, so his eloquent flinging out of the hand saith, it is of no use. He shakes his fist. Then registering the extremity of disgust, he rips the loathsome cravat-clogged collar from his neck and flings it from him. What will he do now is the thought that holds his audience bound in a spell. Ah, his face breaks into light. He snatches up his collar and industriously adjusts it without a cravat. He picks up a small object, which he holds aloft between thumb and forefinger, turning it this way and that. It is the ready-made bow of a bow-tie, the bow and nothing more. Yes, there are patent prongs to it, which he deftly slips beneath the wings of his collar. So, no trouble whatever. Instantaneous. A smile of luxurious blandness spreads over the face of the young man. Thus he stands for a moment, then stoops and places in a corner of the window a large card inscribed ten cents. With a pleasing sense of curiosity satisfied, the current of your own life, as distinct from show-window shows, flows back again into your consciousness. You turn, and the great movement of the city takes you, although some souls of spacious leisure and of apparently insatiable curiosity linger on to drink in the happiness of witnessing a repetition of the fascinating exhibition. Of such shows is the freedom of the kingdom of heaven. There is the other young man in a show window a bit further on, who all day long gashes blocks of wood with a magic razor only to sharpen it to greater keenness, so that before you he continually cuts with it the finest hairs. There is the young woman, garbed as a nurse, who treats the corns on a gigantic plaster foot. In show windows cooks are cooking appetizing dishes damsels are combing magnificent patent medicine grown tresses and in show windows are spectacles of infinite variety and without number all for the delight without cost of a penny of those whose hearts are as a little child there is the trim maid who folds and unfolds a davenport couch i had a friend one time of a roving disposition alas he is now in jail who once got the amazingly enviable job of doing nothing but smoke an endless succession of cigars in a show window brother as lavengro used to say there is nothing high about the cost of pleasure but hold would you without a thought pass by here though this yon show is without its rapt throng to do it reverence it is to an ardent mind the most enticing and the most instructive of all the classic exhibitions to be seen from the pavement the one fullest of all of in the words of one quinny meat and gravy always tarry fellow man before the cheap photographers any one who has ever been enough interested in human matters to examine the sidewalk exhibitions of the cheap photographer does not need to be told that the fine old star character there a character somewhat analogous in popular appeal and his permanency as an institution to the heavy villain of melodrama a character old as the hills yet fresh as the morning is the naked baby nobody ever saw a cheap photographer's display without its naked baby just why he should be naked is not clear however there is undoubtedly inherent in the mind of the race this instinct that you should begin your photographic life naked perhaps this is in response to a sentiment for symbol naked came ye into the world perhaps it is because your face at the time of your initial photograph is as yet so uncarved by time that it is deemed more interesting to display the whole of you clothed as it were in innocence the art of painting of course from the earliest rendering of the child of the virgin down to mary cassatt has been fond of portraying infants nude the photographer may be said only to continue a very old tradition but painting has always observed the baby with ceremonious respect painting stripped him to admire him and softly caress him the broad humanity of the cheap photographer jokes him as you may say 
the most popular way of presenting the baby at the cheap photographer's seated standing on his back or on his belly stark naked or as sometimes he is found girded about the loins or as again he is seen less naked and wearing an abbreviated shirt and in various other stages of habilimentation is on a whitish hairy rug no background but the hairy rug it is background very largely one suspects that gives one the sense of a baby's value the idea occurs to a thoughtful observer of his photograph that it is to a considerable degree from background surrounding atmosphere local color that the baby derives personal identity twenty cabinet-sized naked babies each on a hairy rug one conceives how an unscrupulous photographer as may very likely commonly be the case might save money on negatives after he had a stock of a little variety by snapping babies with an unloaded camera and printing from old plates without anybody's being the wiser here indeed would be a utilitarian motive behind the babies being naked of articles of identification it is alas undermining to the pride of race to reflect that the photograph of one's cousin's fine new baby edward which reminded every one so much of the infant's mother may not impossibly have been the original likeness of some baby now long extinct history so called deals exclusively with persons of distinction fiction though more catholic sees man in a glamour with the various prejudices this way and that of a mortal eye the development of the discovery announced by daguerre in eighteen thirty nine and first applied to portraits by one draper this is the great historian the photograph business sir alone sees life steadily and sees it whole photography is the supreme sociologist master psychologist in the sidewalk display of the cheap photographer is the poor naked human story poignantly touching chastening of pride opening the heart of the responsive beholder to deeper knowledge of the inherent kinship of all humankind how does the consummate realism of the cheap photographer show its babies of yesteryear clothed now in the raiment of mature years and simple honors that appealing spectacle the girl who has performed somewhere in curiously home-made looking tights and laughing roguishly at the camera been photographed afterward from this sight what roue would not turn away his sinful eyes in shame and pity the highly satisfied young man in the very rented appearing evening clothes photographed it is apparent in the daytime the blank-looking person who for some cryptic reason is enamoured of the studious literary pose and appears in effect like a frontispiece portrait glancing up from a writing-table an obviously artificial cigar between the fingers of one hand apparently made of carbon and presumably the property of the photographer the aspiring amateur boxer in position with his sparring trunks on and an american flag around his waist or sometimes in default of trunks he is seen in his nether undergarment the jolly girl in boy's clothes who has not seen her the little child in costume performing a cute dance the colored bow a heavy swell in spats and a van bibber overcoat the gay banqueters of the so-and-so association around their festive board one man a devilish fellow holding aloft a beer bottle the young girl in confirmation attire standing awkwardly by a table her slip of a mind as she stands there very probably less upon her god than upon her common foolish dress the team of amateur comedians sad spectacle the bride and groom perennial as the naked baby standing curiously enough upon our old friend the hairy rug the family group all the figures of which have a curious waxwork effect reminiscent of the late eden musee the policeman in uniform sitting in a chair of cathedral architecture the fireman a hero perhaps though no man is a hero merely amazingly human to the cheap photographer's camera 
the youthful swains posed beside that indestructible stage property of the popular photographer the artificial tree stump the immortal woman vain of that part of her which mr mantalini referred to as outline and careful to keep her near arm from obstructing the spectator's view sometimes she is clothed sometimes simply wound in a sheet sometimes in either case she is like the dowager whose outline mr mantalini described as demmed all these and many others are the traditions of cheap photography nobody apparently is so unattractive nobody so poor nobody wears such queer clothes nobody is so old or faded or fat or skinny or short or tall or black or bow-legged or so anything at all that he or she won't pose for a photograph so that it may reasonably be said that to have lost the instinct to have one's picture taken is to have lost the love of life nobody no doubt but is interesting to somebody and as stevenson has said can any one be regarded as useless so long as he has a friend and when brother at length one has withdrawn for evermore from the tawdry stage of the cheap photographers a last view is taken of one as it were in the grave side by side at the cheap photographers with the naked baby and with the bride and groom is the floral emblem end of essay twenty one Essay twenty two of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortis Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay twenty two Reading After Thirty. Somewhere in the mass of that splendid, highly personal journalism of his, William Hazlitt declares that he was never able to read a book through after thirty that penetrating man samuel butler reflecting in his notebooks on what audience to write for says people between the ages of twenty and thirty read a good deal after thirty their reading drops off and by forty is confined to each person's special subject newspapers and magazines thirty again you see we all have friends who have been omnivorous readers persons who to our admiration and despair seem to have read everything in literature it may have struck us however as a curious thing that except possibly in rare instances such persons appear not to read much now beyond newspapers and magazines the upshot of what they are able to say when you ask them why this is true is that one simply reaches a time of life when one quits reading as one ceases to dance or cools in interest toward the latest fashions in overcoats but undoubtedly there are persons who continue to read apparently with unabated industry and zest no matter how old they may become dr johnson of course was a constant reader all his life and would cheerfully read anything whether it was readable or not though did not he somewhere confess to himself that he did not read things through mr huneker who is well on the richer side of thirty would seem to read everything printed about five minutes after it has left the press and before anybody else has had a chance to see it there are so many capital letters on the pages of his own books that it makes one dizzy to look at them whether or not he reads through all the books he mentions is of course as he is a reviewer a question and then both mr huneker and the doctor belong to the trade so to say another startlingly prodigious reader is theodore roosevelt hilariously past thirty and not exclusively identified with a literary shop he is continually discovering and vigorously recommending new poets and short-story writers whom professional critics have not yet had time to get around to it does not appear that a fundamental or organic change in the composition of the human brain which inhibits reading occurs more or less suddenly at thirty why then do so many reading animals cease at about that time to read butler does not say arnold bennett was it not has asked what's the use of his reading more he knows enough 
Hazlitt, in his own case, surmised that the keener interest of writing rather asphyxiated the impulse to read, and doubtless that generally is about the size of it. As in the cure of the drink habit, a new and more intense interest will drive out the old. The reader, of course, is a spectator, not an active participant in the world's doings. After thirty, desirable citizens of ordinary energy have little opportunity for the role of non-combatant, and the taste of action and of success, like the taste of war, makes them impatient with quieter things. Failures read more than successful men. Bachelors, no doubt, read much more than husbands, and fathers seldom are great readers. This last fact may explain the observation that even college professors do not read fanatically. When they are off a while, they play with their children. Children are great enemies everywhere to reading, who are much more real to them than study. In one of his later books, George Moore chronicles his resolve to cultivate the habit of reading, to learn to read again, and he sucks much naive pleasure from the contemplation of this prospective enterprise. But he finds it very difficult to persevere in it, and drifts away instead into reveries of what he has read. There is a thought here, however, to be hearkened to, the idea of learning to read again. What is it that happens to one in consequence of his ceasing to read? He suffers a hardening of the intellectual arteries. There are quaint old codgers one knows here and there who declare that in fiction there has been nothing since Dickens. They are delightful, of course, but one would rather see than be one. We all know many persons whose intellectual clock stopped some time ago, and there are people whose minds apparently froze at about the time when they should have begun to ripen, and which are like blocks of ice with a fish, or a volume of Huxley, inside. Nothing now can get in. At those times of earnest introspection, when one would swear off this or that, would reduce one's smoking, would adopt the principle of do it now, and so on, at those times an excellent New Year's resolution, or birthday resolution, or first day of the month resolution, would be to relearn to read, to keep, as Dr. Johnson said of his friendships, one's reading continually in good repair. End of Essay 22 Epilogue of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epilogue on Wearing a Hat There's a good deal to be said about wearing a hat, and yet this humorous custom, this rich topic of wearing a hat, has been sadly neglected, as far as I can make out, by scholars, scientists, poets, composers, and other smart people man has been variously defined as the religious animal and so on but also to the best of my knowledge and belief he is the only animal that wears a hat he has become so accustomed to the habit of wearing his hat that he does not feel that he is himself out of doors without it mr howells i think it was has told us in one of his novels of a young man who had determined upon suicide with this intent he made a mad dash for the sea but on his way there a sudden gust of wind blew off his hat. Instinctively he turned to recover it, and this action broke the current of his ideas. With his hat he recovered his reason, and went home as alive as usual. His hat has come to mean for man much more than a protection for his head. It is for him a symbol of his manhood. You cannot more greatly insult a man than by knocking off his hat as a sign of his reverence his esteem his respect a man bears his head though indeed the contentious mr chesterton somewhere argues that there is no more reason for a man's removing his hat in the presence of ladies than for his taking off his coat and waistcoat in the more complex social organisms of europe the custom of lifting the hat to other men whom one thus acknowledges as superiors is much more prevalent than in our democratic country though in america we remove our hats in elevators upon the entrance of ladies a practice which is not followed in england 
it was mrs nickleby who indicated the extreme politeness of the noble gentleman who showed her to her carriage by the celebrated remark that they took their hats completely off we express great joy by casting our hats into the air if i wish to show my contempt for you i will wear my hat in your house if i wish you to clear out of my house i say here's your hat if i am moved to admiration for you i say i take off my hat to you i greatly enjoy seeing you run after your hat in the street because you are thereby made excessively ridiculous the comic irishman of the vaudeville stage makes his character unmistakable to all by carrying his clay pipe in his hat band the english painter thomas gainsborough gave his name to a hat the seasoned newspaper man displays his cynical nature and complete disillusionment by wearing his hat at his desk a hat worn tilted well back on the head indicates an open nature and a hail-fellow well-met disposition while a hat decidedly tilted over one eye is the sign of a hard character and one not to be trifled with in the literature of alcoholism it is written that a common hallucination of the inebriate is that a voice cries after him where did you get that white hat upon assuming office the cardinal is said to take the hat when a man is conspicuously active in american political life his hat is in the ring whistler topped off his press agent eccentricity with a funny hat the most idiosyncratic hat at present in america is that which decorates the peak of mr bliss carman the hat stands in our swagger hotels make a great deal of money i know a gentleman who affirmed that a hat which had originally cost him three dollars had cost him eighteen dollars to be got back from hat checking stands cheap people evade the hat boy when the present enthusiast for the splendid subject of hats was a small boy it was the ambition of every small boy of his acquaintance to be regarded as of sufficient age to possess what we termed a dice hat what is commonly called a derby what in england they call a darby what dickens aptly referred to as a pot hat what in one highly diverting form is sometimes referred to on the other side as a billycock that singular structure for the human head the derby hat one time well nigh universally worn has now gone somewhat out of fashion and been superseded by the soft hat of smart design though there are indications i fear that the derby is coming in again when we were young the soft hat was most commonly worn by veterans of the civil war in a pattern called a slouch hat or a grand army hat though indeed such romantic beings as cowboys in popular ten-cent literature and the late buffalo bill wore sombreros and the picturesque mexican a high-peaked affair our grandfathers wore stovepipe hats and the hats of politicians were one time frequently called plug hats this male headdress even more extraordinary than the derby books of etiquette sometimes say you should not call a silk hat but a high hat in london but a few years ago no man ever went into the city with other than a top hat or topper as they say there it is said that the going out of general favor of the silk hat has been occasioned in a considerable degree by the popularity of raincoats in preference to umbrellas if you observe any great crowd in england to-day you will find in it few hats of any kind it is in the main a sea of caps the american dude and the antebellum british canute always wore silk hats gentlemen at the british race-courses and fine old clubmen of pell-mell affect a white or grey top-hat of the sort which was so becoming an ornament to the late king edward the opera hat is said to have startled many persons who had not seen it before intoxicated gentlemen in funny pictures have always smashed their silk hats some men have worn a silk hat only on the occasion of their marriage high hats are worn by small boys in england the most useful occupation to-day is that which involves the wearing of a tin hat 
the day in the autumn fixed by popular mandate when the straw hat is to be discarded for the season is hilariously celebrated in wall street by the destruction by the affronted populace of the straw hats of those who have had the temerity or the thoughtlessness to wear them colored men in livery stables however sometimes wear straw hats the year round to the habit generally of wearing a hat baldness is attributed by some and the luxuriant hair of indians and of the caveman is pointed to as illustrating the beneficent result of not wearing a hat and now and then somebody turns up with the idea in his head that he doesn't need a hat on it there is a white garbed gentleman of grecian mould who parades broadway every day without a hat it is indisputable that the hats women wear to-day are more beautiful than they have been for generations perhaps centuries yet this fact has met with little expression of appreciation this present excellence is because women's hats now are the product of intellectual design in the eighties the idea was entertained that decoration of a woman's hat was increased by attaching to it something in the way of beads or feathers wherever there was a space free a fashionable woman's hat to-day may be as simple and in its way as effective as art as a whistler symphony a single splotch of colour it may be acting as a foil against a rich mass or the hat is a replica as it were of the celebrated design of a period in history but the erudite subject of women's hats should not be touched upon without a salute to that racy model which crowns the far-famed ariette whose bank holiday attire was so delightedly caressed by the pencil of the late phil may none could forget his tenderly human drawing of the lady with the bedraggled feather over one eye who has just been ejected by the barman and who turns to him to say well the next time i goes into a public house i goes where i'm respected a hat is distinguished from a cap or bonnet by the possession of a brim the modern hat can be traced back to the patasus worn by the ancient romans when on a journey the hats were also thus used by the earlier greeks not until after the norman conquest did the use of hats begin in england a hat of beaver was worn by one of the nobles of the land met at clarendon about the middle of the twelfth century and Frosard describes hats that were worn at Edward's court in 1340, when the garter order was instituted. The use of the scarlet hat, which distinguishes cardinals, was sanctioned in the 13th century by Pope Innocent IV. The merchant in Chaucer's Canterbury Tale had on his head a Flanderish beaver hat and from this period onwards frequent mention is made of felt hats beaver hats and other like names throughout medieval times the wearing of a hat was regarded as a mark of rank and distinction during the reign of elizabeth the caprices of fashion in hats were many and various the puritans affected a steeple crown and broad-rimmed hat while the cavaliers adopted a lower crown and a broader rim ornamented with feathers in the time of charles the second still greater breadth of brim and a profusion of feathers were fashionable features of hats and the gradual expansion of brim led to the device of looping or tying up that portion hence arose various fashionable cocks in hats and ultimately by the looping up equally of three sides of the low-crowned hat the cocked hat which prevailed throughout the eighteenth century was elaborated the quaker hat plain low in crown and broad in brim originated with the sect in the middle of the seventeenth century the silk hat is an article of recent introduction though it was known in florence about a century ago its manufacture was not introduced into france till about eighteen twenty five and its development has taken place entirely since that period in all kinds of hat making the french excel in the united kingdom the felt hat trade is principally centred in the neighbourhood of manchester and in the united states the states of new york and new jersey enjoy the greater part of the industry so much for hats 
End of Epilogue End of Walking Stick Papers by Robert Cortes Holliday